Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit 2021. I'm Lily Liu, Events and Partnerships Director at RFI Group and the producer of this year's summit. I'd like to start by saying thank you for taking the time to join us today. The theme of this year's agenda is banking revival. What lies beyond the pandemic? Disruption is nothing new to financial organisations. In the last decade, traditional providers have weathered a global financial crisis, new entrants and robust regulations. However, in the road ahead, the current pandemic warrants a fresh response. While as consumers in New Zealand are optimistic about the future, the pandemic has no doubt changed the way they bank, save and interact with their financial providers. This shift is a key driver in the emerging transformation and revolution. Financial providers must now put innovation at the forefront and explore new ways to enhance relationships, delivering experiences that reassure, re-engage and remain resilient as they forge a new path for banking in the post-pandemic world. In the payments and buy now pay later space, consumer payment behaviours are changing more broadly. Over the course of 2020, we've witnessed key shifts in how Kiwis pay. E-commerce has grown and with it, buy now pay later and other online payment methods. We have also continued to see cash decline and contactless card usage soar. 83% of consumers have now made a contactless payment, up 10% from pre-pandemic levels, and one in two consumers are now using contactless weekly. According to RFI Group data, buy now pay later uptake continues to grow, albeit at a slower rate than we saw in previous years. RFI Group data indicates that 31% of consumers have used a buy now pay later service with almost 80% of consumers aware of buy now pay later. Millennials and Gen Z continue to drive this trend with one in two consumers aged under 25 reporting that they have used buy now pay later at least once. However, the greatest growth in uptake over the last six months has been among consumers aged 35 to 54. We're also seeing a lot happening in the mortgage space. House prices are skyrocketing and rates are at all-time lows. Recent RFI group data suggests that a combination of high prices and regulation around investment properties may take some of the heat out of the market, with proportion of consumers intending to take out a mortgage dropping significantly between the end of 2020 and May 2021. However, we're also seeing a significantly higher proportion of younger consumers indicating that they are saving towards a first home deposit, likely a result of increasing savings balances through 2020 and international borders remaining closed. Some other key areas we will dive into throughout the day include open banking, sustainability and rural lending. You will be hearing from a number of leading international speakers around some of these topics, so please stay tuned. The event platform we are using today is called Brella. It is designed to enable networking. Its matchmaking functions will allow you to set up your profile by selecting your areas of interest so that you can easily identify attendees with similar preferences and connect with them. Hence why we encourage you to create your Brella profile and set up your networking preferences when you first log in. If you haven't had the chance to do so, you can always click on the people button and go to you to edit your profile and select your interests. Under matches, you can engage with other attendees by clicking on the orange button that says suggest meeting. You will also see a couple of other tabs on the left-hand side of the screen. 
you can click on schedule to view the agenda and speakers of the day. You can bookmark sessions you don't want to miss. On the right side of the page, you can set availability to have meetings and sync them with your preferred calendar. Stream is where we are currently in right now. This is where all the speaking sessions will be taking place. And you're welcome to ask questions in the chat panel on the right. To see a list of all the speakers and their bios, simply click on the speakers tab. Some of them will be online today to answer questions live in the chat panel during their sessions in the main stream. Alternatively, the RFI team will take note of questions asked by the audience and provide answers to them after the event if the speakers are not available. We also encourage everyone to click on the exhibitor tab to visit the exhibition booths where you can you know, find more insightful content, you can view videos, download reports and ask for live demos when you're chatting with the exhibitors. And if you have any questions or encounter any technical issues during the day, please head over to the RFI group uh, booth and find um, our staff members who will be able to help you. Finally, I would like to thank our event partners, CoreLogic, Encino and Fintech New Zealand for their support in making this event happen. I would now like to hand over to the Chairman of the Day, Julian Wilson, Managing Director, Australian and New Zealand RFI Group. Thank you and I hope you enjoy the day. Good morning, New Zealand. Uh, my name is Julian Wilson. Uh, I am Managing Director for RFI Group for Australia and New Zealand. And welcome to the New Zealand Banking and Innovation Summit for 2021. We uh, unfortunately had to cancel last year's event um, for obvious reasons, um, but we're back uh, and we're back virtually. Uh, we wish we could be there um, enjoying all of the treats of uh, Auckland usually uh, and obviously uh, networking with all of you. Uh, but we're here virtually, uh, but hopefully next year we'll be back again in a physical format. A big thank you to our sponsors for today, CoreLogic, Encino and FinTech New Zealand who have been great partners this year. Um, and also want to make sure that everyone's aware, um, Lily obviously mentioned in, in her opening, um, but please visit our sponsors, please engage with them. They've got a lot of great and interesting things to say um, and some great experiences to sort of share with you. Uh, but also please network with your delegates. I always say when chairing these conferences, um, you can learn a lot obviously through the content, but it's always great to network uh, with the other delegates and learn from each other um, and gear yourself up with some interesting questions for the sessions. Um, now, the first two uh, sessions will be coming up very shortly, um, but just quickly, look, RFI Group's been very busy over the last uh, 12 months. I think just in the Australian New Zealand uh, area, we do over 570 presentations to our clients. So uh, we've discovered that our data and insights are, are really, really important these days. Um, and so please, you can go visit RFI as well um, and see if you want to ask us any questions on what's happening, but you'll see a lot of our content coming through today. But we're, we've really enjoyed putting together the agenda uh, this year, which is full of um, some really great industry experts. Um, some of those are, are great experts from, um, from associations or other fields of expertise, um, but also a lot of them are from our subscribing research clients as well. But you'll see a smattering of our data and insights throughout this conference, um, and I hope, uh, hope you do enjoy that. Um, and so, but also reiterating, uh, we have all of the functionality of the conference um, up here on uh, this side, uh, as well as all of the chat function on this side. So please engage with all the functionality um, and we'll be, we'll be all set to go. Um, but now, just introducing, we've got two keynotes. We've got our international keynote and our New Zealand keynote. First up, we have our international keynote um, talking about the future is green, sowing the seeds of sustainability. Uh, and with a lot of uh, ESG uh, KPIs going into, uh, into scorecards, um, ESG is even more important uh, these days to really think about when thinking about innovation. And we have Matthew Colbrook, who's the Regional Head of Wealth and Personal Banking uh, for EMEA for HSBC, uh, joining us. And then following on from Matt, uh, we have our New Zealand keynote, um, and an interesting title of the keynote, Ding Dong, Innovation As We Know It Is Dead. Um, that means we must be doing a different type of innovation. 
Uh, we've got Mohit Kalbergi, uh, who's EGM of Corporate Strategy and Customer Experience from ASB Bank, joining us. So I will see you after those two keynotes, but please uh, enjoy the two next sessions, and I will see you straight after. Thank you. A very warm welcome from Dubai. Actually, it's a very warm welcome because it's about 46 degrees here today in humidity at north of 90%. My sincere thanks to the team at RFI for inviting me. My name is Matt Colbrook and I'm the Regional Head of Wealth and Personal Banking for HSBC for the EMEA region. And I have the privilege of leading 12 countries for HSBC across Europe and the Middle East. I'm delighted to be addressing you today, albeit virtually, given the new world that we find ourselves in. Most importantly, I hope you, your family and friends are well in this unprecedented time. This past week has been absolutely extraordinary for us here in HSBC. We won six global awards from our partner Visa for service quality. We launched our first global money account in the Middle East for our international customers, a mobile first multi-currency account that allows our customers to manage, hold, send and receive 21 currencies digitally and to make payments instantly for free, five clicks. And most importantly for this presentation, we launched our first green mortgage first in the group here in the Middle East. So that neatly brings me into the presentation of what I've been asked to speak to you about today and a subject which I think is very close to all of you and indeed to my heart, and that is to answer the question of why now is the time to focus on sustainability and ESG. So let's take a moment and have a look at what sustainability means, because it's broadly defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I think it's a really beautiful statement. And I read a quote over the weekend which said, you do not inherit the earth from your parents, you borrow it from your children. So I think it's quite profound. All of us are aware that the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are a blueprint for us all to achieve a better a more sustainable future for all. And if you then add to that the Paris Agreement of 2015, which is to limit global warming to below two degrees Celsius, and we all collectively have a huge task on our hands. This generation has a huge task. So over the last two years, we've seen more and more companies and large corporations such as HSBC make pledges to transition to net zero and this is because there is a recognition that this effort is required on a big scale and cannot be achieved without working together as one community. The global pandemic in many ways has shown us or forced us to live in a very different way, to commute less, to fly less, to cook more and with many of us spending lots more time at home, the global pandemic has triggered a deep reflection about how we can change the way we live. The impact of COVID-19 has been very visible across a number of different areas, from cleaner air quality due to less pollution to the really difficult economic circumstances for so many of our vulnerable communities. We've also seen governments and companies transforming the way they behave in an effort to build back better. Now that we have experienced new ways of living and working, it would be a real shame to go back to our old habits where we came from. Instead, society is moving towards embracing a more sustainable lifestyle. Whilst COVID-19 has disordered our lives and disrupted the world's economies and financial markets, numerous reports have shown that companies with better ESG environmental, social and governance credentials as a whole have exhibited real resilience in the downturn. But we are now seeing firsthand the benefits of living sustainably, not just in our personal lives, but also for publicly limited companies and corporations. Have a look at this. You can see from the map that a number of countries have already announced net zero ambitions and others have expressed the intention to do so. Those countries that have yet to commit to a net zero target are under real pressure to make an enhanced commitment. As we begin to turn the corner in the fight against COVID-19, HSBC is calling for a green economic reboot. We are part of a coalition urging governments to use 
economic stimulus to rebuild economy sustainably. And alongside some of the world's largest organisations in energy, industry, finance and civil society, we want investment to be spent in the right way. We believe rebooting into a green economy doesn't only set the stage for renewed growth, it sets the stage for sustainable growth for the generations that will follow. In a recent survey, the IPOS SOS 2020, 65% of people across the globe said that they support a green recovery following COVID-19. But in practical terms, net zero means to negate the amount of greenhouse gases produced by human activity. And this can really only be done in two ways. Firstly, either by reducing emissions, or secondly, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. As a bank, we have pledged to help our clients transition to net zero, but we've also set our own net zero targets so that we can truly lead by example. So let's take a look at some of the data points now to back up what we've been discussing, specifically around the effects of COVID-19 and how it's impacted businesses and how they will be conducting themselves moving forward. So in a survey of consumer sustainability trends, which took place last year, 40% of issuers say that COVID-19 has made them believe even more strongly that becoming sustainable is important. A similar number said that it has made them realise that social welfare is more important than they thought before. Nearly 30% of investors said that the pandemic has made them believe even more strongly that considering ESG issues are important. And overall, more than 50% of investors said that the pandemic has made them reconsider the importance of ESG. So both investors and issuers have expressed all of these thoughts that social welfare, the real component of ESG, was more important than ever before. So I'd like to pause here and just explain a little more detail what each of the elements of ESG really stands for. So E is clearly for environmental. How companies manage the impact on the environment, which includes greenhouse gas emissions, water usage, waste management and pollution. These factors are critically important in understanding the inherent risks of companies and their long-term operating performance. S is for social, so looking at the human rights issue, the development and treatment of staff, the oversight of the supply chain, as well as human and safety considerations, the health considerations and reality. Consumers, as well as investors, have become increasingly aware of human rights abuses, child labour and working conditions of factories from the goods that they consume. In the age of communication, companies can no longer turn a blind eye to where they source their raw materials or their finished products. G is for governance, which is how companies are governed and managed. Executive pay, business ethics and culture, diversity and inclusion at board level, but also generally at all levels of the company, as well as shareholder rights. Companies that manage their ESG risks and create value for stakeholders, employees, customers, suppliers, the environment and the wider society are more likely to survive through the cycle and thrive in the long term. Investing in companies that manage ESG risks and opportunities really well could deliver long term capital growth. Consumers as well as shareholders now vote with their feet and will apply pressure through social media, campaigns and boycotts if they feel a company is not living up to the expected ESG standards. At the peak of the COVID-19 induced crisis, global equities lost almost a third of their value. They have generally recovered since even trading above the end 2019 levels by the end of 2020, a scenario very few would have thought or predicted. Global stocks with relatively high climate and ESG credentials, however, were relatively resilient through this turbulent period. According to HSBC Global Research, sustainable investment themes have led to outperformance even during periods of heightened uncertainty. There is often a misconception that investing in ESG funds or stocks means a trade-off against financial returns. 
So let's put some numbers to these concepts to give you a clearer picture of what I mean. As you can see from these graphs, it's simply not the case. The graph on the left shows the S&P 500 index in black and the S&P 500 ESG index in green for the time period 2016 through 2020. As you can clearly see, the two indices are almost perfectly aligned until the volatility of the 2020 kicks in, at which point the ESG index actually outperforms the regular one. Similarly, on the right-hand side, the green line shows the S&P Clean Energy Index versus the grey line, which is the conventional energy index. As you can see here, when the pandemic kicks in, the Clean Energy Index really takes off from April 2020 onwards. According to HSBC Global Research, since the 10th of December 2019, i.e. the early days of the virus outbreak when news was just starting to break globally, climate global stocks have outperformed the global equity index, the FTSE All World, by 20.3%, whereas stocks with a high ESG rating clocked an outperformance of 1.6%, over the same period. If we look at the COVID-19 pandemic through the ESG lens, 2020 has emerged as a breakthrough year for global climate stocks. As the global crisis seems to have changed the trajectory of ESG trends and accelerated investors' interest towards sustainable investing. As demonstrated in my two examples, the price performance of global companies with high climate and ESG credentials also just suggests that sustainable investment themes can lead to outperformance. And the pandemic seems to have heightened the importance of integrating long-term ESG factors into the investment decisions, making huge progress. This has been further collaborated by strong inflows into global ESG and SRI equity funds in 2020, whereby the ESG SRI equity funds recorded total inflows of circa 35% of total assets under management. This is in comparison to global equity funds posted a net inflow of circa 1% over the same period of total net, net assets. In fact, actually flows into ESG and SRI equity funds have outpaced global equity fund flows by a wide margin over actually the last five years. The financial services sector has an important role to play to help enable the transition of the real economy and to help countries address climate change whilst achieving prosperity and managing future climate risk. At HSBC, we seek to support our customers with between 750 billion and 1 trillion over the next 10 years in financing and investment to unlock the next generation of climate solutions. We clearly don't have all the answers, but we do believe that we have the scale and the reach to truly deliver change. We seek to work with our customers and policymakers, regulators, and the financial system as a whole to lead by example and also help with the wider economy. I believe that each of us has a part to play in this and it is only by working together that we can tackle what is arguably the biggest challenge of our generation. We need to educate our customers and support them in making the right choices and at the same time we must be transparent about our own sustainability performance. We must mobilise capital, the capital required to finance the transition of our customers and this applies equally to individuals as it does to companies. I'd like to thank you for your time today and to RFI for inviting me to address you. It's a huge topic, it's a huge topic to tackle and I hope that I've managed to do a little bit of justice in the time I've had today. I hope that you found it insightful and you've learned a little something here and given you some food for thought for the rest of the conference. So my thanks again and my very best regards from the Middle East. Take care. Kia ora everyone, I'm Lohit Kalbergi and I lead the corporate strategy and customer experience team at ASB. It's great to join you all virtually for today's event. Now over the next 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about how our approach to innovation at ASB is changing. And as we've seen recently, 
the world is rapidly changing and we need to keep up with rising expectations from customers, uh, but also the broader society in general. Um, so we believe that while Big Hero Innovation uh, will continue to have its place in our strategy, what we're really focused on dialing up now is how our people can innovate each and every day, regardless of their role or where they sit in the bank. So, you know, context is everything, and we've learned a lot over the last 18 months. Um, at ASB, as with many organizations, we probably saw 20 years of acceleration occur in just the last 12 months. Um, we've all uh, gotten used to working remotely, and at the same time, as a bank, we had a critical role to play in really helping our customers through what was probably for many of our customers the biggest financial challenge that they've faced. I was so proud of how our people came together and delivered so many great innovations for our customers. For example, we committed to no mortgagee sales for those customers who worked with us to resolve any challenges that they may have faced. And this runs to the end of the year. We also used our sponsorships in a really creative way to give Kiwi businesses a much needed boost. With Borrow the All Blacks, we loaned the All Blacks to help promote hundreds of small businesses. And with Borrow Eden Park, a Kaikoura-based family-owned fish and chip shop called Cooper's Catch enjoyed the naming rights to Eden Park for the second Bledisloe Cup test match of 2020. What we also found was we were in daily contact with the government and regulators, working with them on different ways to support the economy. While ASB has strong innovation credentials and big aspirations in this space, um, I'll speak to that shortly, um, one of the biggest takeaways for me from the past 18 months is that innovation doesn't always need to mean big tech. It can be really, really simple. Two innovations that we rolled out, for example, were our priority line in our contact center for customers aged 65 and over, and a dedicated priority hour for these customers in branches. These were two very simple tweaks to our customer service offering, yet the feedback that we've had on these has been outstanding. I'm gonna talk a lot today about simplicity. You know, our strategy at ASB is to be simple and easy every day, and really brilliant when it matters. And everything we do is in service of our purpose, which is to accelerate the financial progress for all New Zealanders. And actually, this is just as relevant now um, as we navigate our way through a global pandemic as it was when we first opened our doors in 1847. ASB has a proud history of innovation and technology adoption. Back in 1969, for example, we became the first bank in New Zealand to operate an online, real-time computer system that linked all our branches back to a central computer. And in 1997, we were the first Kiwi bank to offer online banking. But in addition to these large-scale technology innovations, we're also equally focused on dialing up the hundreds of smaller ways that our people are innovating every single day and building a culture of innovation at ASB. But first, what does innovation mean to Kiwis? ASB's research function, which sits in my team, um, we did some work recently on this question. What we found was that while number eight wire was still fundamentally underpinning our innovation mentality, Kiwis are really interested in the idea of social innovation and solving a problem uh, for all New Zealanders. Um, even if it's something, you know, quite small. And as a small nation, we love it when Kiwi innovation shines on the world stage. So you can see why local innovations such as All Birds Wool Sneakers, the Air New Zealand Economy Sky Couch, and the dish drawers from Fisher & Paykel have been so successful. At ASB, we watch the introduction of innovations across multiple industries. So the introduction of the priority hour and the dedicated phone line that I mentioned earlier so they came about because we were watching how airlines manage frequent flyer queuing, for example. Back to ASB and the shift to digital means that banks today have an ever increasing number of new technology competitors. So think big tech and fintech. So it's really important that more than ever, we continue to bolster our digital capability. So while customers moving online, of course, um, isn't a new trend, um, COVID has certainly accelerated it. So we're doubling down on our focus 
on delivering slick but simple digital experiences for all our customers. A brilliant example of this is our new digital join process where new customers um, can use our updated ASP ID app. And this allows people to verify their identity straight from the chip in their eligible e-passport, along with a selfie-style facial recognition scan. ASB is actually the first bank in Australasia to adopt this technology. And the benefit is that it saves customers valuable time because you don't have to go uh, to a branch in order to join ASB. And for our staff, it provides enormous efficiencies because our branch staff um, can save time, use that time to actually engage with customers on important conversations, but it also gives us accurate data from a single source. It was so exciting to see our very first customer, uh, who actually turned out to be an 80-year-old gentleman, uh, who digitally joined ASB in just over 10 minutes. We're also focused on using data to offer customers the most personalized experience possible. So getting to know our customers puts us in a better position to truly help them improve their financial well-being and to get ahead. We're also putting this data in the hands of our customers. So let's take an example and look at business customers. Um, information is power. So when our business customers have the right tools and the dashboards um, to make better sense of their data, they can make better, more informed business decisions. This is the rationale behind ASB's Vonto app. It's free for all small business owners in New Zealand and was developed in-house by a team who spent two years working with Kiwi business owners um, to really understand their challenges firsthand, um, which helped them to develop the right solution. So the app combines data from nine different apps, including Facebook, Xero, Google Analytics, MailChimp, and Vend, just to name a few, to really generate meaningful and actionable insights. Vonto also highlights potential trends, business opportunities in areas that may not be performing as well as they could be. A really important point, when we design digital experiences, the focus isn't on the technology itself, but rather um, what this technology enables for our people and our customers. And that's a good opportunity for me to segue into our people who are really at the heart of everything that we do. And frankly, it's our people that are the most significant drivers of our success here at ASB. So while our brand is known for innovation, it's equally associated with our people and the role that they play in the communities that we serve. We know that Kiwis place enormous trust in ASB and our corporate reputation measure is at an all-time high and we continue to work hard to protect and build that trust. So as we introduce new technology for our customers, we're clear that our strategy is not to become digital only. Our people bring our brand to life and we know that there will always be a need for human support and we're innovating for our people so that we can enable them to better support our customers as well. A great example of this is the introduction of video calling with our customers. It's particularly great when we need to meet with multiple members of a family um, or multiple owners of a business, um, or even some of our rural customers who may be further away. Honestly, it just saves time for everyone on travel. And at the same time, a video call is a much more personal experience than a traditional phone call or an email. We're also looking at how we can deliver innovative digital experiences in a really human way. So a quick example of this is our digital avatar, Josie. Josie fronts a series of how-to videos on ASB's products and services. Um, and these are shown in various places, including in some of our better banking workshops, uh, which are designed to really assist customers um, who need a helping hand with our digital and self-service banking options. Another example is our in-school financial literacy program called Get Wise, where we've recently upgraded it and introduced augmented reality content, um, which really blends the more traditional teaching methods with interactive, fun digital content uh, to get the kids engaged. A big focus at ASB is shifting our people's mindset away from these sort of large hero innovations, which still has a place in our strategy, but really to looking for simple ways to innovate each and every day. One way that we've been doing this is by instilling some overarching mindsets across the bank that apply to everyone, regardless of their team or their role. So for example, 
um, learn it all over know it all, is all about learning faster, continuously being curious and challenging ourselves to think differently and try new ways of doing things. While another one of our mindsets, pace over perfection, is about empowering people um, to get started and keep iterating. We're doing a lot of work to embed this thinking and believe that it's really going to help us um, focus our people on innovating every single day. We're also investing heavily in developing future fit skills, such as human-centered design. Now, this is all about thinking outside in, putting yourself in the shoes of the people that you're designing for by truly understanding their needs and really building empathy for who they are and what they go through on a daily basis. So we see this as a critical skill that's really relevant to all our teams, irrespective of whether they work on customer-facing initiatives or not. And in fact, our world-class design thinking training is bespoke to ASB and sees participants get immersed in solving uh, a real-life design challenge. So it's really practical. And the feedback that we've had from the hundreds of people that have taken part so far is that it's been an excellent program and it's been really exciting to see them start to apply their learnings to their day-to-day -day work. The other big part of this has been changing the way we work. So in December, we stood up what we call our PACE operating model and ways of working. So we now have tribes, which is basically groups of cross-functional team members who are all aligned to delivering specific customer needs. And the biggest benefit that we've seen is that by bringing the teams together, we're seeing a change in our conversations internally and a shift in the way in which the teams are prioritizing in order to be more focused on innovating for our customers. We're also seeing better alignment of planning across those in the PACE operating model and greater empowerment of our people, which when combined with our ways of working, means that we can make decisions much more quickly and we can innovate for our customers sooner. Well, that's just an incredibly high level overview of ASB's view on innovation and some of the areas that we're focused on at present. It's a subject that I'm hugely passionate about and frankly, um, I could talk about it all day. So you can expect to hear and see a lot more of the innovations that we're working on um, in this space as we continue uh, to innovate to help Kiwis get one step ahead and build the financial future they want. Thank you and enjoy the rest of today's summit. Um, I know I'm personally looking forward to hearing some of the discussions uh, as our industry considers where to next after a period of unprecedented disruption. Thank you. Excellent, well, thank you very much, uh, Matthew and Lohit. Um, two really great keynotes um, that are great scene setters for um, obviously understanding what's happening uh, within innovation, but also what's happening globally uh, and what's on the priority list for um, some really key global businesses and global banks, um, and obviously a very key uh, local bank. So up next, have you had your coffee? Because we're about to get into some real heavy data. Um, we've got some great presentations coming up that are just loaded with lots of data and insights. First up, we have Alan Shields, who's the COO and co-founder of RFI Group. Uh, presenting on uh, innovation at the forefront but building trust in a post-pandemic world and that's really looking into what are consumers thinking and understanding about what's being put in front of them uh, from an innovation and digital perspective and really are they trusting it and then moving on straight after we've got Nick Goodall who's head of research for CoreLogic New Zealand um, and he'll be giving us a great update on the property market so hopefully you have your pens ready uh, ready to write down some key facts and figures uh, to take back to your businesses and then after that, um, we'll be going into the morning tea break, but I will see you straight after the presentations. Thank you very much. Hi there, uh, Alan Shields here, the COO of RFI Group. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak at our New Zealand conferences. I believe this is the fifth year in a row that we've been running uh, the New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit or uh, its previous incarnation, the New Zealand Digital Banking Conference. Um, one of our favorite uh, conferences for me. There's lo always lots of insights to share, um, always lots of innovation that's going on in, uh, in the Kiwi market that's uh, you know, worth talking about and, and then worth sharing uh, around the globe as we talk to banks. 
The thing that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, where innovation meets trust as we recover from the pandemic. And, you know, throughout the, the agenda, there's lots of uh, different topics that we're going to be covering off around, you know, pure innovation, around the role of open banking um, and, you know, uh, innovation in lending in, in rural areas. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a step back from that and talk more um, generically, I guess, about the need for uh, a different type of approach to the way that we service customers uh, in a post-pandemic world. I'm going to largely dwell on three areas. One of those is the changing needs of customers. So, you know, what's happening um, with regard to confidence? What does that mean in, from a behavioural perspective? And what are we seeing shift? I'm going to look at the, the relationships that organisations in New Zealand have with customers um, and where trust fits into that. And also, you know, try and understand from the customer perspective, what it is that uh, they're looking for from their financial services providers. Uh, and then I'm gonna finish off with uh, some exploration of different ways to deliver that, um, to, to, to answer those needs uh, and to deliver that in a, in a way that's uh, exceptional from a servicing perspective. Um, and hopefully you'll find it uh, insightful. Now, just a couple of um, points before I, I do sort of kick into this. Um, I'm a big uh, nerd. I really love uh, data. I really love uh, seeing charts. So, you know, you're gonna see lots and lots of um, statistics and lots and lots of data. And my job as we go through that is to tell you a story um, that brings it all together. Uh, but I do have a very low excitement threshold. So um, just be aware of that as we go through. Um, let's start off with the meeting um, of the different needs of consumers in today's world. Uh, I think it's, you know, uh, probably a massive understatement to say that we live in a very different uh, economy and environment in uh, June 2021 than we did um, in June 2020 or, uh, you know, uh, March 2020. We've come through an awful lot um, in the last 15 months. Uh, and that's probably then no surprise that we've seen consumers reacting to that uh, and behaving uh, in slightly different ways. One of the, one of the best kind of um, indicators that I like to look at whenever I think about how consumers are changing is uh, a sort of measure of their confidence. Uh, and what you can see here is the Westpac McDermott Miller New Zealand Con Consumer Confidence Index, um, the blue line on the left-hand chart, um, which basically charts out how consumer confidence has changed uh, over the last um, 12 years or so. Uh, and effectively what it shows is that, you know, as we, as we went into 2020, um, confidence was uh, not uh, a historic high or anything, but it was um, relatively good coming into the, the, the pandemic. Um, and what we saw as we went into the pandemic was it was a very, very significant drop uh, in consumer sentiment in a very short period of time. Um, and then as we sort of moved towards the end of 2020, uh, New Zealand did pretty well um, from a pandemic perspective uh, and consumer confidence started to recover. So we're, we're in sort of this situation in 2021 where consumer confidence is um, okay um, on average um, and uh, is better than it was uh, a year ago. Um, and it, but it's certainly sort of, you know, we're in a period of flux, I believe, at the moment. Um, if we look at the uh, a sort of um, alternative view of uh, how consumers are doing, uh, unemployment on the right hand side here, you can see that basically um, the unemployment rate um, is higher than it was um, a year ago, um, but it's returning, I think it's fair to say it's returning to what we might have regarded as pre-pandemic levels. So we're in this situation where confidence on average um, is okay, um, but the unemployment rate is probably higher than when, where we would like it to be. Um, and I think both of those lines that you can see on there um, have gone up and down um, over a relatively short period of time. And that sort of uh, uncertainty, those kind of changes are never very good for consumers. Um, uncertainty is, is a bit of a killer um, from a consumer perspective. 
Um, and so when we talk to consumers about whether they've been impacted by the pandemic and whether their income specifically has changed, uh, what we see is that there are definitely pockets of the population who really have suffered. Um, so, you know, the average confidence is okay, but averages hide all manner of sins. My uh, head is in the oven and my feet are in the freezer, but on average, I'm the right temperature um, is, is probably something that we could apply. When we look at how consumers have been Im impacted from an income perspective, and we break it down by the type of work that they do, you can see on here that anybody who is self-employed, so think small business owners, anybody who's in part-time employment or seasonal employment, anybody who's, uh, you know, in student, um, uh, sorry, anybody who's a student, they're all suffering more so than your average fully employed uh, consumer within the population. And of course, what that means is that that pain of um, decreased income is felt um, by those pockets and those pockets of uh, employment tend to be skewed much more towards um, younger consumers. Um, so there's a bit of a story that starts to emerge around the youth segment. And that's kind of reinforced when you start to look at, you know, the, the, the actions that occur because of um, reductions in income. So what we might expect to see is that people start to spend or borrow or save differently. Um, and you can see that come through when we talk to uh, savers within the New Zealand market. And we ask them whether they've had to dip into their savings to fund their start lifestyle in the previous three months. And on here, you can see the percentage um, that said that they had done so um, in, our, in our last um, savings survey towards the end of 2020. Uh, and you can see here that basically 49% of all savers had had to dip into their savings to fund their lifestyle. That was up from 42% in May. So we could surmise from that that we're getting into a situation where an increasingly large proportion of savers is needing to dip into their savings in order to um, just survive really. Uh, and a lot of that money goes towards unexpected expenses, general household expenses, not the type of stuff that savers really want to be spending their money on. Um, and it's also fair to say when you look at the chart on here that the impact or the need to use that savings is much greater amongst younger consumers. So if they're under the age of 35, more than half um, are, have been dipping into their savings in a three month period to fund lifestyle. And if they're under 25, it's almost two in three in the latest data. So impacts obviously being felt uh, across the nation. Um, as a result of that, when we talk to consumers and we ask them uh, to tell us as a result of the pandemic, have their attitudes or behaviours to towards certain areas of financial services changed? And the things that we see uh, most commonly uh, when we look at this, this type of a response are that, you know, um, we've got more than 60% um, of consumers saying that they're increasingly looking for ways to save money. So, you know, a larger and larger proportion of savers being forced to use the money in their savings. Uh, an increasingly large proportion of people generally thinking about how they save. We've got a similar proportion of consumers saying that they are paying more attention to the prices that they're, they're paying when they make purchases. Um, and uh, a similar proportion saying that they're trying to shop locally in order to support smaller um, local businesses um, within the New Zealand economy. So we, we're seeing effectively then the um, results of the pandemic uh, impact on consumer attitudes um, and behaviours um, within the economy. Uh, and that sort of can be shown quite neatly with this slide here, which basically just looks at um, a nationally representative group of uh, New Zealand consumers over a, um, a year, one year period here. And we've got the proportion of consumers um, in the three charts here that say they will do more or less of spending, borrowing and saving. Uh, and effectively, um, the, there's a couple of things that sort of jump out here. One is that the proportion of consumers saying they were going to try and spend less um, had uh, increased between December 19 and November 2020 by almost 20%, 20, 20%, so it went up from 26% to 45%. At the same time, the proportion of consumers that say they're going to save more increased from 41% 
to 59%. So, you know, the, the overwhelming sentiment amongst the New Zealand population is that they want to put some money aside um, because, you know, they don't know really when they're going to need it and they want a buffer. And that's, that is uncertainty in action that we're seeing come through there. Um, the other kind of um, interesting trend that we're seeing uh, from a spending perspective is buy now, pay later. Now, I think you probably have to uh, have lived under a rock uh, in order to be unaware of buy now, pay later at the moment, um, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, where, where the category is, um, has, has, is, is a lot more mature than it is in, in some of the other markets that we deal with. Um, but you can see on here basically that almost 40% now of um, consumers, sorry, uh, almost uh, one in three uh, consumers uh, in the New Zealand population has used a buy now, pay later service of some kind. Um, and the usage of buy now, pay later skews much more towards younger consumers. So if they're under um, 35 years of age, almost one in two uh, consumers has used buy now, pay later. So, um, you know, we've, there's this, this theme of younger consumers being impacted more from a decrease in um, income perspective coming through. You've got, uh, a, younger consumers significantly more likely to have needed to dip into their savings to fund their lifestyle um, and uh, younger consumers significantly more likely to have um, used buy now pay later. Um, and buy now pay later is obviously, you know, it's now a significant enough payment mechanism within the local market that it's beginning to have an impact on more traditional payment methods. This slide here is, is quite an interesting one. Basically what it shows is that if we look at buy now, pay later users who have a credit card, um, the blue line versus um, non buy now, pay later users with a credit card, you can see that the proportion of those consumers that use their credit card in a typical month um, has changed quite significantly over a, a sort of three year period. So if we go back to April, 2017, if you're a buy now, pay later user um, who use the, um, sorry, of the buy now pay later users, 58% were using a credit card um, in a typical month, roll forward to November 2020, and that proportion had fallen to 37%. At the same time, um, you know, we're not seeing a necessarily a, a huge decline amongst the non buy now pay later users who use a credit card in a typical month. So it's not that there's necessarily this sort of um, overwhelming decline in credit card usage amongst. The, the whole population, it's definitely um, more prevalent in certain pockets. Uh, and I think what's interesting here is, A, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that buy now, pay later users are not credit card holders. Um, but B, um, we're actually seeing action there around how a new category is impacting on a more traditional um, payment category. Now, why do I talk about buy now, pay later? Why is that interesting in the context of what we've been talking about with regard to consumer uncertainty and behavior? Um, well, effectively, the reasons that consumers use buy now, pay later uh, fits in with this overwhelming sentiment of consumers in the market and their, their sort of desire to do things in a smart way. Um, so when we ask buy now, pay later users why they choose to use buy now, pay later, um, you can see here, number one response, 57% of those buy now, pay later users um, means that, you know, not having to pay for the purchase up front um, meant that they could make better use of their money. So they're using their money in a smarter way. Um, then you've got, you know, sentiment around um, it's a way of avoiding interest. You've got 45% of consumers saying it helps me budget. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of those three things fit very much into the psyche of a group of consumers who uh, is worried about their personal economy, um, is worried about what their savings are gonna be able to do for them in the future, and is looking for smarter ways to spend and to save and to borrow. Um, and that kind of, that factor, I think for buy now, pay later, means that it's the, the right um, payment mechanism at the right time from a consumer sentiment perspective. I also think, and I should say before I go off this slide, one of my one of the um, the statistics that keeps jumping out to me, it doesn't matter what market we look at buy now pay later in uh, around the world, there's a decent chunk of consumers who are using buy now pay later just to give it a try. They've seen the brand, it's there at point of sale, or it's there when they check out online, 
and they just want to give it a go. Um, and you know, if you can sit there and say that, well, one in five of my customers um, is, 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 is using my brand just to give it, just to sort of see what it's like, um, that's phenomenally powerful um, from a growth perspective. Um, so um, I've no doubt that Buy Now Pay Later um, is, is here for some time. Um, and you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of sentiment to be tapped into there from a consumer perspective. Um, so where does that leave us from a customer relationship perspective? We understand that consumers are changing the way that they think, the way that they feel, the way that they behave. Um, what does that mean from a, from a traditional financial services perspective? Um, well, I think, to be honest, when I, when I think about relationships within banking, trust is the, the, the thing that is at the forefront of those relationships. Um, and we've, done a, we've just done a, a brand new survey um, in the New Zealand market where we've looked at the trust of different providers uh, in, in, with regard to um, maintaining privacy and security of personal information. Now, that's obviously very relevant because we're talking about open banking in New Zealand. Um, and what does open banking do? Well, it basically um, enables consumers to consent to sharing their banking data with um, non-banking uh, partners. Uh, and so trust is really important. Um, and what we see at the moment is that the traditional banking model is, is in a phenomenal position when it comes to trust. So 58% um, of consumers have uh, a complete level of trust. So they, they, they'd score their trust levels an eight, nine or a 10 um, in banks um, holding and, and maintaining the privacy and security of their personal information. Um, card schemes, your visas, your MasterCards um, have a, a, a sort of secondary and second place position in there. Then comes your government agencies then telecommunications providers then tech companies um, and then a new digital only um, or FinTech um, provider. So uh, if on the face value, the, the banks have a very um, uh, privileged position um, in the market. And that, and that trust, um, uh, you know, obviously is well earned, um, but it also reaps dividends. So if I look at the impact of trust on metrics like uh, loyalty and like NPS, um, there is absolutely a definite correlation between those, those two factors. So on the left-hand side, if I ask consumers um, to what extent they trust their main financial institution, you can see on here, as we just saw in the previous slide, um, a large proportion of, of New Zealand consumers trust their a bank to maintain their, their privacy. Um, and so therefore it goes to, um, stands to reason that the average New Zealand consumer trusts their MFI. Uh, and in fact, 74% um, have complete trust. Um, in their MFI. Um, but what do we care? Does it make a difference? Um, um, if you look at the right-hand side chart here, we're looking at two uh, groups of consumers, those that have low trust in their main financial institution on the left-hand side, and those that have a high level of trust. Uh, and if we look at NPS, a measure which I'm sure is in a lot of your, your uh, executive scorecards, um, a consumer that has low trust in their MFI, um, that as a group, those, the, those consumers um, have an NPS with their MFI of minus 78. Um, if they have a high level of trust, those consumers as a group have an NPS with their MFI of plus 21. And you know, if you know how NPS is calculated, which I'm sure you will do, that's night and day. Um, but it also matters when it comes to future consideration. So we've, we've called it loyalty on here. It, effectively, it's the proportion of consumers who would consider their current um, transactional account provider for future savings needs. Uh, and you've got on here, you know, if they have low trust in, their, in that MFI, that transaction account provider, 59% would consider them for their future savings needs. If they have a high level of trust, 86% uh, would consider them. So trust matters. Trust is at the heart of the relationship and trust is at the heart of whatever comes next from an ongoing relationship perspective. Um, what does an organisation need to do then um, to uh, maintain your trust? Uh, of, uh, a question that we put to, to New Zealand consumers. Uh, and there are kind of, there, there are three things that really stand out the most. One of those is keep my money safe. Um, and obviously that, that's a big factor, right? So I care about my money, keep it safe. 
The other thing I care about is my information. So keep that safe. Um, and 65% and 63% of consumers choose those two factors in their top three factors when it comes to uh, you know, maintaining trust um, with a financial institution. The third thing on there is around fees and charges. So transparency. So you know, be clear and open with me around what it is that you're going to be charging me for different things. We've just seen why people are drawn to buy now, pay later. You know, the, the sort of no fee model um, is, is, a, is a big factor for consumers. Um, we also saw that they did it to avoid interest. So, you know, being open and upfront with consumers is, is, is going to be the best policy when it comes to um, being trustworthy. The last thing consumers want is hidden fees that kind of come and bite them um, down the track that they, that they perhaps, you know, weren't aware of um, upfront. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting on here is, um, you know, the, as you look down the list is um, being available for consumers. So if I need you, be available. Um, that, that's really important from a trust perspective. Um, tell me if there's a better product for my needs or my situation. Um, and again, you know, if you think about the situation we're in and where consumers' uh, sentiment is at with regard to the economy, uh, their personal economies, um, and the impact that's having on their change in behaviour, um, there's, there's a very big role for banks to play here in you know, making sure customers are smart about their banking and smart about their financial services and making sure that they actually feel um, like you as an organisation are helping them to do it. Because when we look at um, whether consumers have a good understanding of banking and finance generally, we actually find there's that a large proportion of consumers um, are uh, you know, fully prepared to admit that they do not have a high level of understanding of banking and finance. So, on this chart, the light blue uh, segment at the top of the columns is the proportion of consumers that have a high level of understanding of banking finance. Um, and you can see there 49% of Kiwis on the far right hand side um, believe that they've got a high level of understanding of banking finance. But of course, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in there being two sides to every statistic. And so what I see when I look at that is that more than one in two don't have a high level of understanding. And actually, for younger consumers, um, that proportion that has a, 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 a specifically a low level of understanding is almost one in five. So is there something we can be doing more to help our customers when it comes to banking and finance? That's a great sort of um, question to start off with. Uh, and when we look at whether um, consumers are happy with their um, transaction account providers, so there's which tends to be obviously their, their sort of main financial institution or their main banking organisation. There are a number of pain points that we see and that we've identified in the relationship at this point in time. Um, and those three things are there in orange. These are things that are relatively highly correlated to overall satisfaction with a primary tra transaction account provider, but that are relatively low in satisfaction. And they are alerts or tools that help me manage my money, the level of support that I'm being offered through the COVID pandemic and the tools and the information that's provided me to help me improve my financial well-being. So, you know, if that's not um, customers letting us know that there's more that we can be doing to help them, um, in particularly in, a, in an environment when they're not feeling um, particularly certain about their, their, their financial situation, then I, then I don't know what is. Um, and... You know, I think that that's kind of a good segue into the last section of this, which is around how do we meet those needs and what's on the horizon that's going to enable us to do that or enable other organisations to come in and do it for us. Um, I'll start off with this slide, which I found fascinating. I wasn't um, aware of this, but this is a, a date, piece of data that we've been tracking for um, a, couple, a couple of years now, which is around the awareness and usage of budgeting and PFM style apps and tools. Um, these are obviously, you know, relating back to that previous slide, some of the areas where they, their customers are expressing pain points um, that, that, we can, that we can help with. And the thing that jumped out at me was, was this, if you look at the orange line on here, this is a proportion of Kiwis that are using PFM apps and tools. That number's not, that proportion's hardly grown. 
we're in an environment now where consumers, you know, clearly are changing the way they're behaving. They clearly uh, want help, uh, and yet they're not taking it through these PFM apps. So there must be more. Um, there must be, you know, there must be um, opportunity for an organisation that has an existing relationship with these consumers to start to offer the value. And when you ask consumers what it is that they want, what are the types of advice or insights that they would find valuable? Um, there's a couple of things that, that really sort of jump out at me when I, when I look at this data. One of those is that, you know, overall, the average consumer wants um, to be notified about benefits to them. So if there, is there a rebate on this? Is there a concession on this that I might be eligible for? 55% of consumers in, in New Zealand want that. Um, but you'll notice that that's skewed towards an older generation. And what I've been talking about through this presentation is, is quite clearly that younger consumers are the ones who are feeling the most pain, who have the most uncertainty around finances, and who are the ones who are needing to dip into their savings to a greater extent. Uh, and what they want is personalised spending and savings insights. They want savings calculators. They want advice on how they stick to a budget and how they set a budget. They want to be able to see how they're going towards certain goals that they've got. So, that, so, so there's three ways that you can help to um, address some of the pain points that younger consumers might, might be facing. Another question that we asked consumers was around, um, you know, if we were to put an app in front of them that helped them manage their personal finances specifically, what would be the top things that they would be looking for? They got to pick three. Um, and there's, Interestingly, there's three kind of clear, clear winners. So I want to, again, I want to be able to um, uh, set up budget um, for you know, specific spend categories and want to be able to track against those things. I want to be able to use my banking history um, and, and be notified of where I could be cutting back on my spending. Think um, smart spending um, from a customer perspective. Um, and I want to be able to track my spending patterns uh, over a specific period. So, so again, there's, there's kind of clear ways as um, uh, organisations with relationships with these um, people that we can help um, to alleviate some of their pains, make them feel smarter about their finances and really kind of tap into the, to, to how they feel. Um, I've mentioned by now later a couple of times through this presentation. And one of the um, things that strikes me when I look at the by now pay later um, experience is, is the, the, the CX itself. Um, and so this chart here just shows you for a, a few of the different um, buy now, pay later brands in existence in the New Zealand market, how satisfied are customers on the left with those um, services when they've used them? And on the right-hand side, how likely are they to recommend them? Um, and you can see on here that they're, they're pretty enviable stats, right? So the, you know, we take Afterpay on the far left, 80% um, of customers that use Afterpay were extremely satisfied and another 13% satisfied. So 93% satisfaction, if you like. Um, and and it, doesn't, it doesn't really change much across any of those brands. And, and so as a consequence, consumers that are using these brands are happy. Uh, on the right-hand side, they are advocating for those brands. Um, the group of consumers that's most um, likely to be using Buy Now, Pay Later is younger consumers. Um, and so, they, so their trust in those providers is going to be building um, over time. And those, you know, those buy now, pay later providers have got a nice runway in front of them um, where there's kind of logical steps in the buy now, pay later journey, right? What are, what are the things that they could be offering um, to consumers in the market that might encourage them to use buy now, pay later more? Well, they could be offering rewards. They could be offering them um, the ability to make early repayments on their repurchases. They could be enabling, giving them a tracker to show how they're doing against um, different purchase amounts that they have outstanding. Effectively, there are ways that buy now, pay later providers could be further in um, ingratiating themselves with consumers around the sentiment that they feel around, you know, cutting back on spending, budgeting more sensibly, using my money in a smarter and smarter way. Um, you know, and if you think about that, um, you know, that position that Buy Now Pay Later is, is earning itself in the market. And you think about what's coming down the track with open banking. Um, I won't bore you too much with the text on here. You can read it on the, on the slide deck afterwards. But, you know, when we talk to consumers about 
um, the legislation, um, what it's going to mean in terms of sharing data and what some of the benefits will be around consolidated views of banking, faster applications, reliable tailored advice, um, deals on different banking products and, thing, and recommendations for more suitable products. Those things all tap into what I've been talking about. Um, and, you know, the, the consumer reaction to that, when we say to them, you know, based on that description, how would you feel about consenting to sharing your personal data with providers in order to access those benefits? Um, sure, I'm not going to sit here and say 90% of consumers say they'd be, you know, wildly enthusiastic about sharing their data. But what I can tell you is that nearly 20% are interested right off the bat. Um, about half of the population is not sure, but, you know, wants to understand more about the benefits. Um, you know, and that's a significant chunk of, of people. And the other thing, and this kind of fits with the theme that's been running through this, is that the group of consumers that's most open to sharing their data in an open banking environment will be the younger consumers. If they're under 45, the proportion of consumers willing to share their, their, their data is um, right off the bat is one in four. Um, so we, we to summarise all of that and sort of take you through the story, I think um, understatement of the century, consumers are understandably uncertain about the future. Um, that uncertainty about the future is changing the way that they think about saving, the way they think about spending, and it's also changing what they want from a financial services organisation. Um, and to me, that gives you an opportunity to service that un unmet need. Consumers want help with their finances to a degree that they've never wanted it before. And if you're a traditional player, then you've got trust on your side, um, which is you know very, very, very significant. It's, it's the, the cornerstone of the relationship with the consumer. If you're a, a non-banking, non-traditional fintech provider coming into the market. Um, you know, there are um, plenty of examples there, and I gave a few in the Bano Paleta space, where customer service, um, you know, at, at an exceptional level is going to lead to a build, a build up of trust and an environment where customers are more um, open to taking more products through you um, and to, to um, in having a more deeply entrenched relationship. And I think, you know, as a New Zealand market looks forward and we look forward to open banking as a regime, um, there are opportunities on both sides of the coin um, from a non-banking perspective and a banking perspective. Uh, and I guess the only question um, is what you plan to do with it. Thank you.
Kia ora. My name is Nick Goodall, and I am the Head of Research at CoreLogic, the property data analytics company, and we support the banking and finance, real estate, government, telco's utilities industry, really trying to get them the information and data they require to make better decisions and enable people to build better lives. So today I'm going to take you through a market update on where the market is at and where we believe things are heading to for the rest of 2021. A key focus being what have the government changes announced on the March 23rd had to the market uh, so far in the, in the few months of data that we have available to us today. In terms of what we're going to talk about, I'm um, really going to cover the recent economic and property data to sort of set the scene of where we're at at the moment, talk about, of course, regulation and everything else that we're watching that will influence the market, and then, of course, talk about what lies ahead, what we think is going to happen for the rest of this year and into next year as well. So first up, it's worth saying that the economy is, of course, performing very, very well, much better than anyone could have anticipated a little on a year ago. And, you know, the property market off the back of that certainly continues to grow. First up from economics, I suppose, you know, the key thing here is that we sort of talk about being in a potential phony economic recession. You know, we could have been much worse right now. We know that things still aren't performing 100% because the borders are still closed, but generally doing much better than anyone thought we would be. And certainly when you put us in an international context, we are doing very, very well. You can see part of this from our GDP figures, which have bounced out of that uh, negative turnaround last year. We may have also seen a second negative GDP figure come through in Q1 once we get that data. But with the bounce back we've seen in the last couple of months, when we look at the activity index, which is put together by the likes of Reserve Bank, Treasury and Stats New Zealand, it does look like things have bounced back quite well, though we do have to be cautious around this. as It's an annual measure, and comparing to this time last year, of course, it's fraught with danger given the fact that we were just coming out of lockdown, weren't performing at uh, anywhere near the levels of 100%, which you'd expect our economy to, to bear in any normal environment. When you look at other measures such as unemployment, again, when you look back just over a year ago, expectations were that unemployment could have lifted to anywhere of 10 to 12 percent. We are nowhere near that, and we've probably gone past the peak of unemployment at just over 5 percent. We've now dipped below that in the most recent read of data as well. So, very positive signs here, and according to any other. Uh, economic sort of measures as well. You can see our economy is performing very, very well. Again, especially when you put that into the economic context as well. Of course, off the back of this, we've seen a very strong property market. Um, you can see very strong sales volumes over the last six or seven months. And the latest data, you know, we're still seeing very strong sales volumes. And the interesting thing here is that sales volumes have likely even been held back further than they could have been if we had more properties available for sale. And this is certainly one of the main factors that has seen the strong rise in property prices because there's just so very few properties available for sale at the moment. And that means that with strong competition, not much supply, we're seeing prices increase at a very fast rate. We do also expect that these strong sales volumes are sort of you know, no doubt with the regulation coming up, such as loan to value ratio restrictions, we know that people probably brought their purchases forward. And that could also um, move forward into a situation where we see a sales lull later on for those sales that would have otherwise occurred and were brought forward will now not occur later. And so that dip away in sales volumes we're likely to see as we come through into the winter months, which is typical every year, could likely be exacerbated. Um, so we do expect the slowdown in sales volumes to occur as we move through these middle winter months before we get into spring at the end of the year where we may see some part of the market come back, but it'll be interesting to see where the market's at at that point where we might have had a few months of, uh, of a slowdown in terms of volumes and even from a sales values perspective as well. If we look at sales values or we look at you know, the property price index to see how things have tracked in the last wee while, look, I mean, it's pretty clear here. You can see the strong tick up in values across pretty much the whole country. This chart on the left-hand side shows us uh, the main centers, and you can see the very strong growth across every single one of them. There are times where, you know, month to month, we do see a little dip, as you can see in Tauranga's house price index here. But of course, then things took off after a very short lull, and everywhere you can see a very strong growth upwards. Uh, the chart on the right hand side does, however, show that the strong momentum that has certainly been in the market may have started to dissipate with that quarterly line, the dark blue one, starting to now show some signs of sort of faltering, I suppose you'd call it, before we're likely going to see a bit of a downturn in terms of the quarterly rate of growth. 
the annual line there, the light blue line, does show that things are continuing on up. This is what affected by what we call base effects. The fact we didn't see much growth in the market a year ago is still affecting that annual rate of change. And so it takes a while for that momentum to slow down when you're looking at an annual basis, but certainly that quarterly. And even when you look at the monthly measure, which isn't included here, and the most recent sales data that we're looking at, including unconfirmed sales data in the CoreLogic database, you know, we are starting to see the performance of uh, many areas starting to slow down on the strong performance that we've seen throughout 2021 and certainly at the end of last year as well. From this perspective as well, and when you look at who's been active in the market, um, you know, there's been no sort of secret that mortgage investors and investors have been very active in the market over the last couple of quarters. But you can see this is the light blue line on the left hand chart here. You can see that so far in Q2, we have seen a slight dip away in the activity of investors, especially those using a mortgage. Um, but we have seen the, the first home buyers had previously suffered, maybe bounced back a little in Q2 as that demand from the investors had been reduced by not just the introduction of the loan to value ratio restrictions, but also now starting to see some impact very early days, of course, of the government announcement on March 23, particularly the announcement of the uh, removal of the interest deductibility option for investors to be able to write off their interest costs at the end of the year. So we may have seen a little bit of a sit back here from those investors who are sitting back and taking stock and seeing what the market does before they continue to either add to their portfolio or for new investors to go out there and buy a property as an investment. When we look at those types of investors as well, the chart on the right hand side breaks down all investors by how many properties they own after their most recent purchase. And you can see the strength most recently has certainly come from those smaller investors, I suppose you'd call them, those with only two properties after their most recent purchase. So those would be, you know, what we might term our mum and dad investors who have been taking to the property market as an investment option and they've seen their wealth increase and they've looked to the future and say, what am I going to do for my retirement? Property market's been very solid, of course. And we've seen many people continue and buy uh, investment properties because of this. Um, the one thing we are looking at in the most recent quarter of data, Q2, which isn't, isn't complete yet, of course, is uh, the little dip away in that green line. And those that green line is those investors who own three to four properties after the most recent sale. So still potentially relatively inexperienced, have had one investment property and have recently decided to add to that portfolio. That group of buyers who are potentially going to be mostly indebted, highly leveraged, they are the ones that will be most impacted by all the changes, both the loan to value ratio restriction limit and also the announced changes from the government. We have seen a slight dip away in the activity of these type of investors who who may have you know, been affected by these changes and so have pulled back their activity either while they wait and see what happens or they've just been unable to continue to add to their portfolio because they are restricted by those, uh, those, those the, the fact that you need a bit more equity in the market right now because the loan to value ratio restriction requires a 40% deposit or the fact that you don't want to have such high interest costs because that would that affect your profit margins at the end of the year. So we've certainly seen a minor dip in this group as well as the slightly bigger group, the five to nine properties. But again, it is only one sort of quarter um, and, only, and only a part quarter at that of data. So we don't want to call it too early, but certainly there's signs of a change in terms of who is active in the market right now. Um, and as I said, you can sort of see that from the lift in first home buyers coming back so far in this quarter as well and be intriguing to see how this plays out when we get a month or two's more data to really see what's happening from an activity perspective anyway. In terms of first home buyers, look, we most recently uh, released the CoreLogic first home buyer report. In this, the big addition that we um, we included this time around was some joint data with Equifax to understand the age of first home buyers. And the one really interesting thing here was that the age has actually remained quite steady at 34 years old for the last couple of years. And this is a bit of a surprise to us, mainly because we thought with unaffordability so difficult and getting harder for people, that we might see people having to save for a little bit longer before they can get in the market. And we expected that to impact the average age of those buyers, but hasn't really turned out when you look at the data. And I suppose the key thing here is the fact that Kiwi server balances have been getting larger and larger. More people have available greater funds available to them in those Kiwi server pots. And that's enabling them to sort of keep up with those prices for now, or they had done previously. Um, but also the fact that we've seen many first-time buyers compromise on the location of the property they buy, the types of properties, switching more to those townhouses, 
um, as opposed to those nice single unit standalone properties. And that's also enabling those first home buyers to mostly keep up with the market, but they are having to adjust their expectations as well. Um, and we also need to note that there are the um, speed limits outside of the requirements for the loan to value ratio restrictions, where not all first home buyers require that 20% deposit. There is a, a a certain amount of all owner occupiers, 20% of all owner occupiers can be outside that speed limit. And we certainly see first home buyers take advantage of this more than anyone else um, to continue to buy properties, especially um, you know, using it to buy new properties as well, where you, you only need typically a 10% deposit, for instance. So we've certainly seen that activity keep up, keep pace with the market. And uh, those first home buyers age staying at 34. One of the other key things that was really intriguing from this report, and this is the second time we've released this one, was to see the average price or the median price paid by these first-home buyers. And typically, it's, it's generally pretty accepted that first-home buyers buy properties at the lower end of the market, you know, typically around what's called the lower quartile price. But our data sort of says otherwise. It says actually first-home buyers manage to stick pretty close to the median price paid by all other buyers, showing that they really do act across the, the value range of all properties here. And that's seen from the chart on the right-hand side here, where you can see the median price paid by first-home buyers in red is very close to that median price paid by all buyers in blue. So much closer to the median than it is to the lower quartile, showing that first-home buyers don't necessarily you know, buy their first property at the lower end of the market, hold that property for a while before they work into the market and maybe choose to upgrade later on. They do try and stretch as far as they can to go further and buy that better property um, if they can uh, before holding that for a little bit longer maybe as they pay off some debt. So it's only a bit of myth busting done with that data and intriguing to see exactly how that plays out in the future um, if we do see continued growth in the market. But so far, while they are willing to you know, adjust their expectations and compromise on some things, they're still you know, borrowing as much as they're allowed to from the banks. And we know with low interest rates, they're enabled to borrow a lot of money and just have to pass those serviceability tests. They're certainly pushing that as far as they can, which is meaning they're heavily in debt and something we'll talk about shortly and something that needs to be considered when we're looking in the future, especially at the prospect of increasing interest rates, which will you know, start to affect the bottom line of those first home buyers who are stretching as far as they can just to get into the market. But of course, we need to talk about today the fact that regulation has obviously got tighter across the board. And the government has sort of not been ashamed to say that they want to slow down the market. They don't want to necessarily see prices drop. And they do want to see um, the balance switch more from investors to certainly to first home buyers. And so we've now got a couple of months since that big date of March 23, when the government brought out a pretty bold policy in terms of not allowing investors to write off their interest costs at the end of the year. Um, so now that we've got a little bit of data here, it's not, of course, fully complete and we're still getting much more sales information to understand the impact of the market. We've got enough data through different sources to see if we have seen any sort of change in behavior of those investors uh, or across the market as well. So firstly, you know, why do we sort of get to this point? I think it's pretty clear that affordability was such strong growth in the market and incomes not being able to keep pace that it's got worse for many people. Relatively comfortable for those that already own property, and this is where inequality starts to be talked about. Anyone with assets, and we've seen asset prices grow, have been okay and continue to hold those properties fine. But anyone that's trying to get into the market, those would-be buyers, have been finding it tougher and tougher over the last few years. That's shown by this chart on the left-hand side from the CoreLogic Housing Affordability Report, where you can see the years to save a deposit has just been increasing upwards of nine years now to save that typical deposit to get into the market if you require 20%, of course, whereas the share of income required for your repayments, if you've already got a mortgage, has mostly been dropping over the last four or five years. And that's really showing that divide between current owners and would-be buyers trying to get into the market. If we look across the main centres, you can see some of the differences that have occurred um, by our main centres. The key thing probably here to point out is you know, somewhere like Tauranga now, which is more or less affordable, sorry, and more unaffordable to get into the market now with the high prices there, especially compared to local incomes, which is the orange line, now actually overtaking Auckland for the last few years and still drifting upwards. And also somewhere like Dunedin, which is the darker line here, you can see it's actually overtaken not just Christchurch in terms of affordability because prices are so expensive compared to incomes there, but also overtaking them somewhere like Wellington and also now upwards of Hamilton as well. So it's actually much less affordable to buy your first home or get into the market if you're trying to save for that deposit in Dunedin than it is in those other four main centres now. So that's a pretty interesting change that's happened only over the last two years or so. 
A big part of, I suppose, why we look at that does show why this year's got so political, the fact that we're seeing increasing inequality, the fact we are seeing the property market become more unaffordable for more people, really leads to the fact that there's the government had to feel like they had to weigh in, and many people will have the argument either way about whether they the option was the right one or not, but the point is they sort of felt like they had to get in there and do something, and do something they did. And I think when we start to evaluate the uh, the impact, the potential impact of that change, uh, particularly as they extended the Brightline test, but particularly around the um, the change around interest deductibility, it was seen as being pretty bold. But we do think that the fact that this is going to be phased in over a number of years for existing investors does temper somewhat the short term impact of this, especially when you add in the fact that the Brightline test exists. And even if you owned or bought prior to March 23rd this year, if you sell within that five year period, you're going to have to pay tax on those gains and that's likely to cause or um, encourage those investors to actually hold on a little bit longer because any increased tax bill you're going to have at the end of the year um, from from these interest changes will be nothing in comparison to the capital gains tax you'll have to pay um, based on any gain that you've made in that period you've owned that property so we do expect those investors to hold on longer Another factor is that we did some, I suppose, you know, testing of what likely impact this would have to the bottom line for those investors. And when you look at the actual sums of those people that bought in the last year, um, and we've just picked out some typical numbers here. And if you look at an investor who might have taken on a mortgage the size of about five hundred and seventy thousand dollars, which is pretty typical for sort of two, yeah, the year two thousand and twenty, the increased tax bill in the first year or the first year after March twenty third. It's likely to be about $500. And so we don't think that that sort of increased bill is likely to cause someone to think I'm going to have to sell out very quickly. Um, and certainly not going to, you know, especially when they're comparing against the option of uh, whether they pay a capital gains tax as well because of that bright line test. Yes, this increased tax bill will um, get bigger and bigger over the next few years to the point where by 2025, that same person with that same size mortgage will in 2025 potentially have an increase of about $5,000. To their tax bill. And that's, that's going to be something that's probably going to weigh a little bit more on their decision to sell that property, to continue to own that property, and certainly will weigh on anyone that's trying to buy an existing property today, because you will have that increased tax bill straight away, um, because of course the changes apply to anyone buying an existing property after March 27, and that your increased tax bill, when, what it would be prior to that, will almost instantly be that $5,000 amount. So that might impact demand, but not necessarily lead to investors who already owned property selling off at a great rate of knots. And we certainly haven't seen that in terms of listings either. So if we look at the new listings coming to the market, we can see it's pretty seasonally typical over the last few weeks. Can't really compare to last year, 2020, of course, that light blue line where we saw the massive drop away in new listings coming to market because we were in lockdown. So no one started to list their property over that period of time. But if you look even compared to the year before, we do start to see this drop away as we get closer to winter. Um, we're starting to see that you know seasonally normal. We certainly haven't seen a spike in new listings coming to market from investors who are who are you know reducing their exposure to the market or trying to raise some funds to raise some capital to cover for their extra tax bill that they're likely to get at the end of the year. So we certainly haven't seen any reaction from a supply perspective, um, not yet anyway. And we so we start to look at, you know, for those existing properties, we know the tax bill will, will immediately be impacted. Can we see any change in demand? And we can't really get too much from sales data just yet. Um, you can sort of see anecdotal. But one of the things we do measure here at CoreLogic is where any of the banks, when they order a, a valuation to support mortgage lending decisions, they might, depending on the bank, it goes through CoreLogic uh, portals um, or panels volumes and so we can see the number of orders for valuations going through the banks and it's a really good preliminary measure for what mortgages are going to occur and of course what sales will occur later as well so good measure of demand for people they want to go and get a mortgage so expose increase their debt um, and that's going to likely flow through to sales as well so if we saw a massive reduction in this we might say yes we've seen investors really pull back and maybe even other types of buyers what we have seen is that yes we saw massive strength over that sort of six month period, three months before Christmas, three months afterwards, if you take the average of that, the dotted black line here, you can see it's relatively high in uh, historical context. But what we have seen is that through the last couple of months, of course, we've seen some holiday periods, Easter, Anzac weekend, so we do see a dip away in volumes. But what we did see throughout May was essentially the bounce back from Anzac weekend, and then it's really plateaued at a 
I'd say a pretty normal level um, other than the last six months. So yes, things aren't quite as fervent. There aren't as many people going in the banks asking for a mortgage as we saw in that really hot time as the market was going a bit crazy over that period. But what it has done is only dropped about 13% or so. And you'd probably expect that to be pretty seasonally typical as we start to see demand reduce um, over the over the autumn period. But it hasn't reduced as far as anyone maybe expected, given some of the coverage that the market or that we were getting about the market uh, following that big announcement on March 23. So it's a yes, a reduction in demand, but perhaps not quite as significant as we might have otherwise been led to believe or we could have expected if we did see investors really spooked. I think what we've really seen is many people take a back seat and probably some investors who are unable to now afford the mortgages to continue to buy because their, their costs don't quite add up. Um, and one of the things we saw was ANZ come out saying that they will use less of the rent to cover your serviceability checks um, if you're buying an existing property from now on. And that will affect some investors who now won't be able to get those mortgages um, anymore. And also the fact that we saw the loan to value ratio restrictions be tightened this year from the 1st of March, of course, at 30% deposit requirement, and then the 1st of May at a 40% deposit requirement. So we're also probably seeing the impact of those changes and not just those changes from the government as well. So aside from that, we've seen a reduction in demand, but not massively so. And so we don't expect to see a significant turnaround um, in, those, in those values, essentially, of what's being paid. And I think we're seeing that in some of the preliminary data we're looking at, where yes, demand might have been reduced. We know we've got very short supply, and the other thing we've got is through that very strong time, many would-be buyers who couldn't buy previously, there's this overflow, there's this strong pipeline of other buyers in the market, and they're essentially making up for much of that demand, which has been reduced. So we're still seeing some level of competition for properties, which means those prices are still increasing, even if it's not quite at the rate that we'd seen um, earlier this year and late last year. In terms of whether there'll be a flow through to increase in rents, so those landlords that might say, yep, there's an increase on the cost on my side, so I'm going to pass that on and increase rents to cover those costs. We don't expect that to be the case necessarily, especially because of these phased introduction of these changes. Um, and certainly when we've seen big changes in the market in the, part, in the past where landlords costs might have increased, you know, depreciation changed about 10 years ago. Uh, we have seen healthy homes come into um, the market as well, and that would increase those landlord costs. Um, we've also seen the ring fencing of uh, tax losses as well, and the potential for that to flow through to lower profits or those landlords passing on some of those increased costs through their rents. We certainly haven't seen that in the past. And this is Stats New Zealand data. The blue line is essentially the increase in rent per year. And it's pretty consistent. You know, and even when there's a change in the market, we don't see a significant change in, in tenancies or the rent charged on those properties over time. It hovers around about 3% quite consistently, aside from when you go back a bit further and look at the changes through the GFC, where actually there wasn't much rental growth in the GFC, but prior to that, there was a lot stronger growth. So aside from that, pretty consistent. Consistent. Um, and even from new tenancies that go to market, so often landlords use the opportunity when their property goes to market to lift the rent. You know, that's the red line here, pretty volatile. Um, you do see that jump up and down each month. And yes, we saw a bit of a, a no growth last year as there was a rental freeze on um, through COVID and, and people weren't allowed to lift their rents. We've seen that start to bounce back, but it's still sitting at a, what would be a long-term average again, around about that 3% so far. Um, but you certainly, when you look back in the history and you see big changes, you don't see that necessarily flow through to a lift in rents. Um, so we don't expect that necessarily happen this time either. Um, we will wait and see. There's potential for this to you know be a greater change than any of those ones that have talked about in the past but I think the fact that it's phased actually reduces that 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 feeling initially that we would see a significant impact from these changes and so we don't expect to see this pass through in rents in the short term. There are some things that we're going to be considerate of the fact that there is always going to be some unintended consequences of lots of these changes we do know that these introductability changes uh, only apply to existing properties. So if you build a new property, you can still continue to write off your interest costs at the end of the year. One thing that might happen now, we might see actually more competition for those new properties. And one of the trends we've seen over the last few years has been this increase in the share of sales of new builds go to first home buyers. And that's the red line here where you can see in the most recent quarter of data, you can see first home buyer basically with their greatest share of these new build sales. And it's certainly been an option. You can, you, you don't have, to, you have the same limits or the same loan to value ratio restrictions on you if you're buying, building a new property. And so we've seen first home buyers favor those new properties at the expense of some other investors. The fact that investors now are incentivized to continue to build and buy those properties, which is obviously a good thing to see the increase in supply of stock, um, we may see more increased competition. And so those first home buyers that have been enjoying 
um, that option to go to their those new properties may see increased competition there, and they may have to start to switch their um, option back to those existing properties as well. So there could be a bit of a change to the market coming as a as a as a result of these changes. Whether it's necessarily a bad thing, if we see that lift in supply, then it's probably an okay uh, result of this. But of course, first home buyers may not see the same share of sales going to them um, in the next couple of years as they see increased competition from those investors coming to that market as opposed to those existing properties, which potentially leaves those existing properties open for those first home buyers to go and buy instead. We do expect in terms of what other changes might come. Uh, right now, it's being talked about the fact that debt to income ratios may be applied or, or restrictions may be applied. The Reserve Bank have now provided their advice to the Minister of Finance on this, and we're awaiting the Minister of Finance's decision, essentially, whether he will allow the Reserve Bank to have debt to income restrictions as part of their toolkit. Given um, the, the government, the Reserve Bank, sorry, the government, the Minister of Finance's previous points on this, we expect him to allow them to have this, um, but they won't necessarily have any need or the ability or want to put any restrictions on immediately anyway. They say that even if they do get the ability to do this, they usually go through a consultation period and it would take about six months before they implemented something. So we're not going to see any change here until at least November. And our expectation is that we will see a slowdown in the market by then. So the expectation or the requirement or the need for the Reserve Bank to actually implement any limits will be reduced by that point anyway. But the key point will be that if in future they feel the need to put any restrictions on debt to income ratios, um, they will have the ability to do that in future, which they've never able, been able to do so in the past. Um, so that's an interesting change for the market, especially when you look at the data here. And Reserve Bank recently put out some data on how many people, how many buyers were over um, five times their income in terms of the debt they were taking on to secure that purchase of the property. And this is the chart on the right-hand side here, where you can see, especially for investors, which is what the Minister of Finance talked about, potentially putting restrictions on, you can see the levels they've been at um, up around you know, 60 70% of investors have been taking on debt five times their income. So any limits here would certainly um, be impacting the market and those investors that have been buying may not be able to do so at that same level that they have been in the past. Um, and even for first home buyers, we have seen a lift in that as well. Minister of Finance has been very clear, he doesn't want the limits to apply to first home buyers. So there could be the use of speed limits like we see for the LVRs when they do apply something like this as well. The left-hand chart, just before we move on, shows the amount of investor lending that was done above a 70% LVR, so less than a 30% deposit in the last year without those restrictions. We can see they certainly made hay while the sun shone, but that's been restricted back right down below that speed limit now that the LVRs have been re-implemented by the Reserve Bank. And so we expect their, um, their continued or their future activity to be limited because they don't have the ability to go outside these limits anymore. Very quickly, just wanted to look at the state of the market in Australia. There's been a lot of discussion around New Zealand's comparison to Australia. Will we see a flood of people move over there because affordability is better? Well, some of the headline data does show that property values in New Zealand are worse comparable to Australia. That's the chart on the left-hand side in terms of the average value in New Zealand compared to Australia. And the home ownership rate is greater in Australia as well. And you can see that change on the top right-hand chart as well. The occupancy rate is also much um, higher in New Zealand, showing that you know, not only do we see lower home ownership, but we also put more people into those homes. But I think the chart of most interest for me is the chart on the bottom right here, which basically shows that we need to account for the fact that our stock is very different across the two different countries, especially when you look at it city by city, where you can see somewhere like Sydney may have a lower average value than Auckland, but you're typically getting a much larger share of units, or mostly apartments in this case, where 40% of units or, or dwellings in Australia and Sydney are actually units or apartments compared to Auckland, which is only 24% are those smaller type units, apartments, townhouses, terraced housing, things like that. And there's a similar trend when you compare cities like Melbourne and Wellington, Brisbane and Christchurch as well. Looking ahead then, and there's been um, a few forecasts published most recently from the Reserve Bank and, and, and Treasury. Um, you know, we're expecting a slowdown to occur in the second half of 2021, mostly due to the loan to value ratio restrictions coming back even before we saw the announcement from the government. Now that's even more likely that slowdown because of that change, just causing some investors and some buyers to sit back and take stock, but also the fact that the profitability won't quite be as strong for those type of buyers as well. So here's a couple of those forecasts uh, from the Reserve Bank here on the left-hand side. You can see 
the projection for that quarterly rate of growth to slow quite considerably from their monthly uh, their monetary policy statement, which came out in May. Um, we do expect a similar slowdown, but probably not quite the rate that they've, they've put in these um, charts or these forecasts, but something pretty similar to this. The fact that the last time we saw the loan to value ratio restrictions require a 40% deposit from investors, we did see a quite sharp rate of growth drop in that quarterly rate of growth back in September 2016. So we're expecting the same impact this time around. Add on the fact that we've got these changes from a tax perspective, and we do expect that slowdown to occur as we move throughout 2021. We do now, of course, when we're looking a little bit further ahead, have to consider the impact of the increasing interest rates. And in the most recent uh, monetary policy statement from the Reserve Bank, we can now see the OCR forecast, the official cash rate forecast, come back once again. And now the next move is likely to be up as opposed to be down, which it had been you know, so much over the last year or so, where there was consideration for the OCR actually moving into negative territory. Um, now that's not really the case expectations are for those interest rates to increase. So we do need to factor this in. And many people who you know, have bought since 2010 have only seen interest rates drop mostly. And so those people who have seen their mortgage payments drop away now need to start to consider the fact that what will they do? How can they afford to hold that property if interest rates start to increase and their payments start to increase as well? So we do need to factor this in in terms of the tempering of those expectations of continued growth in the market if people are expecting those interest rates to start to increase. And we're seeing this expectation now flow through to longer term interest rates by the banks. Those three and five year rates have already started to inch up. Um, and so we're already starting to see this flow through to the market where expectations expectations are changing on what they were even three or four months ago. So really just to summarise this, this, uh, this presentation today, we really do feel this has been the year of property politics. We've seen so much intervention from the government and Reserve Bank, but we do feel like now with all these changes, we're at or close to um, a turning point in terms of sales volumes and price growth as well. We're not saying price growth is going to stop completely or drop away in the short term, mostly because we've got such short short-term supply on the market, also long-term, of course, from building uh, not enough over the last decade or two, um, but we don't expect prices to drop away because of that. So we'll see a slowdown as opposed to a drop. In terms of our forecast of sales volumes, we are expecting sales volumes to drop away this year compared to last year and potentially even see a slowdown further into 2022 as the interest rates start to affect the market and we um, and we still see this continued burden of the fact we don't have um, our, our borders open for migration and also for tourism, which, which will slow our GDP rather than where it could have been previous to that as well. So, um, you know, we need to consider that longer term effect, of course, and um, we don't expect those borders to be open anytime soon, especially until we see the sort of vaccine rollout really ramp up, which we don't expect to happen until the latter half of the year. And expectations of that happening by the end of 2021 are probably a little bit optimistic, probably going to see that occur through to 2022. So, um, you know, certainly we're expecting the slowdown, not quite the rate that we've seen from the official forecasts, um, but we're not going to we're not expecting prices to drop in the short or medium term either, just because we're seeing uh, demand relatively hold up quite well, and we don't we haven't seen this, this supply um, any change in that. We don't expect any change in supply to come anytime soon either. It's a very slow moving beast, and so that's really going to see some kind of competition for property, which means those prices will at the very least hold up over that short term. So that wraps me up for today. Look, thanks very much for your time. Um, I know we don't have opportunity for questions today, but certainly um, very happy to you know, pick up questions at any stage following today's presentation. Available certainly via email, uh, on LinkedIn, feel free to LinkedIn as well, and available on Twitter. So, And we'll, we'll send these slides around for digestion at your uh, own, own leisure. And do feel free to get in touch with us. Also, don't really miss an opportunity to plug our podcast. Uh, our, my CoreLogic Economist and I, we have a weekly podcast where every Monday we get together and we chat about the most recent data that's come out and the impact it might have on the market so anyone sort of involved in the market professionally um, certainly pays to be attention pay attention to that and see what's going on so if you're a podcast listener please do go check us out uh, we call the new zealand property market podcast um, and we appreciate to hear your thoughts on uh, any feedback you got on that as well so look thank you to say thanks once again for um for paying attention today and uh, feel free to get in touch following today's presentation otherwise i will leave it there and say thank you very much and we'll see you again sometime soon bye Excellent. Well, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Nick. Uh, two great presentations full of some really interesting and important data and insights. Um, we're off to morning tea now. Uh, it's time to go and network with our sponsors and network with the delegates. Um, so please go and uh, explore the, the platform, but obviously have your break, have your coffee, have your tea. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back here at 1045.
Um, and so don't forget, go visit our sponsors, uh, go network with the delegates, um, and also please remember the hashtag NZBIS2021. So that's NZBIS2021 um, if you're posting anything. But uh, we look forward to seeing you back here at 10.45 for the next session. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back from morning tea, and we're into our next session. And uh, to kick things off, we have our first panel of the day, uh, getting into the world of digital transformation. Um, but we're really focusing on an interesting niche, and probably a niche that uh, faces uh, interesting challenges uh, in process, so digital transformation is uh, very important. Uh, and we're focusing on rural lending. Um, so really interested to hear uh, this panel uh, and waiting, really interested to hear what sort of solutions that exist for, for such a specialised area. Um, just a quick reminder, please click on the stream um, side of things so you can actually uh, see the chat occur through the sessions. I know that we are a few people who are watching the stream um, in the sort of main lobby area, but um, in that way you would have missed out on the chat functions. But um, yes, yeah, so please click on the stream so you can see all of the functionality. Um, but yes, looking forward to this uh, next session. Um, a great panel hosted by Mark Bernardi, uh, who's GM of APAC for Encino. We've got Judy Slim, who's Regional Vice President uh, for Farm Credit Systems from Encino. Uh, and we have Robert Poole, partner in consumer and retail uh, in national lead for KPMG Australia. So looking forward to this panel. Thanks, and uh, so right now. Good morning, and thank you for joining us uh, today to discuss digital transformation in rural lending. Um, access to capital in the agricultural sector is more important than it's ever been before. If there's any sector that stands to benefit from the advances in digital engagement, it would be the farmers um, and getting the ease at which they can engage with their lenders. 2020 presented further challenges as they were forced to operate under COVID-19. And looking forward, there seems to be more change to come, whether it's change from risk and environmental compliance, changes in geopolitical pressures, or changes in land and commodity prices, there's a role for lenders to play in supporting the farmers in both New Zealand and Australia. Before we get into the conversation though, I would like to just share our safe harbor statement. There will be some forward looking statements in this uh, presentation and I would encourage you to read through this um, so that you can be fully informed um, around some of the risks and uncertainties that relate to some of these forward looking statements. I'm pleased to welcome Robert Poole um, and Judy Slim, who will be joining me in the conversation. Robert is a, a partner for the consumer and retail sector at KPMG, where he's been there since 2017. Robert comes from a, a farming family uh, in country Victoria and has been uh, extensively involved in agribusiness and food supply chain. He has used this experience to successfully build an incredible um, food and agribusiness practice at KPMG from scratch uh, to be now the number one, well, KPMG is now the number one professional services firm in the Australian food and agribusiness sector. Um, I'm also joined by Judy Slim, um, a colleague of mine from uh, Encina in the Americas. Uh, Judy has over 25 years of experience in the financial services industry and has spent over the last past decade working with US Farm Credit. So thank you for joining me, uh, Robert and Judy, and looking forward to the conversation. So Robert, well, let's start straight into it. I think before we kind of talk about, uh, you know, technology and uh, Encino, um, I'd love to, you know, welcome you to share some of the experiences and observations that you've made about the agri sector in Australia and New Zealand. Hey, thanks, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a really uh, interesting time for agriculture, food and fibre production. Uh, we're looking at a period of of growth. We're looking at a period of global population growth, middle class income growth. And I think from a farmer's point of view, it's been one of the best periods of being a farmer for, for many, many years. Yes, we have, we have challenges, but um, just a general sense of excitement around farming and agriculture, I think is um, as strong as it's been for some time. Um, so, however, on the flip side, that comes, as I say, with challenges that we've got to overcome. And uh, we've seen uh, geopolitical trade challenges emerge in, in the last uh, 12 to 24 months. 
uh, there's pressure on us to farm more sustainably than we ever have before. And that, that's true in both Australia and New Zealand, where there's, there's pressure on us to use natural resources and protect the environment um, in, in more ways than ever before. Uh, access to labour, Mark, is a, is a significant issue. COVID has really heightened that, particularly in industries like horticulture, where uh, you know, even getting the crop off has been a challenge. So we'll need to continue to look at not only the physical number of people that we have access to, but also the skills they have. Uh, and the one that we could perhaps talk about um, the most today is, is access to capital, because our, our growth aspirations as sectors in, in the two countries is got to be reliant on, on capital flows into the sector. Um, I think the New Zealand industry has probably done that better than the Australian sector to some extent, but um, you know, we've got to have ways where both the banking sector and the capital markets are, are attracted to agriculture. They're servicing it in, an, in a new way as agriculture changes. Um, to some extent from the traditional family farm into corporate families and corporate agriculture, but also keeping an eye on the fact that the traditional family farm will still underpin a lot of production out of the sector. So we wrote this report, Mark, um, talking 2030 um, for the Australian industry. Um, it's something we're very proud of because I think what it did was change the narrative uh, in Australian agriculture from a sector that was maybe um, not seen to be a modern sector and seen to be a sector under pressure, turned it into, into a sector that was had a, had a true growth ambition. And I know working with my um, colleague Ian Proudfoot in, in KPMG in New Zealand, he does, a, he does a very similar thing. In fact, he does a better job of it than me probably in terms of setting the vision um, for agriculture in New Zealand and setting the, the challenges and issues um, that uh, we have to address to be part of that. So if you just flick to the next one, Mark, I think uh, credit to the ANZ, they did a piece of work um, called Greener Pastures back in 2012. And what it, this figure of $600 billion of capital required to not only transition from the baby boomers into the new into the next generation of agriculture, but also to grow it to this 100 billion, um, it just shows that you know there's huge amounts of capital required either through the traditional lending system um, or through the uh, you know through the new flows of capital through through the wealth sector and um, the pension fund superannuation sector. Um, but you know, I think I said to you in preparing for today that you know maybe if you said Robert, what is the most important thing for growth in agriculture, uh, then it probably is access to, access to capital. So you know, th this just cannot be underestimated as a absolute critical feature to, to us achieving the growth ambitions that we have for the farm sector. Uh, so you know, maybe, maybe the, the final point to say is that, you know, how, do the, how does the banking sector prepare for this? Um, how do they make sure that all those key moments that farmers have when they're dealing with them are as efficient as possible? Um, how can they grasp the power of the data uh, that they're gonna have for the benefit of their customer uh, and for their, for their own management as well? I think they're really big issues for the banking sector to deal with over the next sort of uh, few years. And, and Robert, I think, you know, when we were chatting uh, previously, um, what really um, stood out to me is, I, I guess, your, your background of actually being from a family and running a farm. Um, you know, what's your personal experience been when it comes to actually trying to access loans or apply for facilities? You know, like, what does it feel like to be the person on the ground looking for that support? Yeah, and as you know, I was also a, a rural banker myself for a while, so I've, <laughs> I've sat on both, both sides. sides. I've sat on both sides of the fence as, as a lender and, and, and as a customer. Um, yeah, you know, I describe the, the, the moments of truth. Um, everyday banking is, is the most, uh, you know, is the thing you feel most with your bank. And, you know, I talk about the example of internet banking. I, I think it's one of the most good, perfect examples of productivity savings. As you know, I used to lick the stamps and 
write the checks every month for our family farm businesses, which took me several hours, probably took me three, three hours, something like that on a monthly basis to pay the bills. Uh, I think internet banking took that down to maybe 30, 40 minutes of effort. So, you know, internet banking, just as a simple digital example, gave me back two, two and a half hours a month. Um, so what's that? You know, that's 30, 30 hours a year. Uh, mm. that I got back um, of my life to do something else with. So, you know, I, I think it's been an amazing tool and just a very simple example of where we took physical processes and, and digitised them. And that flows into then your, you know, your monthly accounts and your, uh, your tax management of your tax position, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the other major points of, of touch points is when you want to do something like purchase the farm next door, uh, you know, transition from from uh, you know generation to generation, or when you're in under pressure, and we've had some severe shocks in uh, in Australia with drought. But yeah. uh, we we you, I think as a farmer, you just want those moments to be as simple as possible. Uh, you don't want to just keep reinventing data that you'd expect that the bank should already have. Um, you know, you don't want to get frustrated at that process. Uh, I think they're all things that. If, if for, for farmers being so busy that if that frustration exists, that can that could cause a fracture between the bank and the customer. So that you know, there's no doubt that you know DocuSign, um, you know, dig, digital uh, digital forms moving into the cloud, all those things that I know you you talk about, uh, they are coming slowly into the banking sector now, and. and they need to keep going with that kind of thing because mm -hmm. otherwise they will risk a frustration with a client at one of those, with a customer at one of those moments of truth, as I call them, where they just need to be there for their, mm -hmm. for their, for their customer. And, and, and before I switch to Judy, there's one other um, topic I wanted to get your thoughts on because, um, you know, having listened to you and, and, and looked at some of the success stories we've also had with Judo Bank in the SME sector, and I see lots of similarities between small businesses and the needs they have and farmers operating um, in the agricultural sector, um, is a sense of having bankers as part of the community, right? Like it's that um, sort of empowered relationship banker that actually is there to be engaged with and accessible. Um, is that something that resonates in that sector? Uh, I believe so. I mean, I think there's a, you know, as you as we move into more and more digital systems, there's a bit of a catch-22 there, I think, because, you know, we still want um, that person who understands our business, but we also want the super efficiencies um, that uh, digitization brings. So I think that's something that all the banks grapple with is how to how to keep connection to the community, but, you know, but still provide that super, super efficiency. Uh, I, I think the, my impression, you know, speaking, I'm not a typical farmer, so I need to be careful, but I think every farmer I know, and I know thousands of them, uh, they've really changed, I think, in the last five years too, and including COVID, um, you know, the capacity to work using the mobile phone, um, to use using the internet, the capacity to, to do things online um, has just dramatic, dramatically improved. And I know there's some, some people in, Australia and New Zealand who don't have great connectivity, for example, but uh, you know the majority of the huge majority of um, farm business owners now uh, are ready, willing, and able. I think to work, uh, you know, very much online compared to ten years ago. And remember, the iPhone is the iPhone, which we all have within reach, of course, Mark, where it is <laughs> is is only what now thirteen years old. Yeah. So you know, it, it's a, what this has done to our lives is both incredibly scary, but incredibly um, exciting. And yeah. you know, the capacity to collect data and provide data uh, into the into your lender, um, there's no doubt we can do that now. It's just a matter of how you want to design the system to do it, what mm -hmm. data you want to collect and what you're going to do with it. So, you know, making sure that that's trusted and it's there for the right reasons. Yeah. But um, certainly every human being on the planet now is ready to participate. Yeah in their lives and businesses through through something like a mobile phone. 100% agree. And I, look, I definitely think that, um, you know, bankers still have a role to play. They just need to change the nature of that relationship, right? From much like you shared the story about rather than becoming data uh, manufacturers or retailers to actually um, spending more time having relationship-based discussions. So that's a great segue, um, I think, uh, to, to Judy. So 
Um, we, you know, we've heard, I've certainly heard about the US farm credit system, but really has only a result of being at Encino. Um, for our audience in uh, New Zealand and Australia, it'd be great to just learn a little bit more about what is the US farm credit system. And, and, and maybe also a little bit about what Encino has been doing uh, in this system. Certainly, thank you, Mark, happy to share. Uh, as you can see from the statistics, uh, the US farm credit system is kind of this hidden banking system within the United States that has a tremendous number of assets and employees. Uh, as you can see from the org structure, there are four farm credit banks uh, and they do the funding for what they call their associations. Uh, you could think of them as kind of subsidiaries, if you will, or bank holding companies. And uh, those associations, there's 68 of them um, across all 50 states, Washington, DC and Puerto Rico. And they are the ones that have the direct relationship with the farmers. However, the banks, in addition to being the funding mechanism for the associations, um, also participate in a lot of um, capital market type activities uh, where for those larger uh, loans, they're either the lead underwriter or they participate in uh, these very large syndications. Um, so Encino um, has been very fortunate um, over the past few years uh, to break into this system. And another wonderful thing about the US farm credit system is they view themselves as sister organizations. So uh, they speak to each other, they will share successes, they'll share failures. And when they find um, a vendor where they're having a lot of success, uh, they like to share those secrets. Um, and so at this point, uh, Encino is fortunate enough to have the majority of the farm credit system as our customers. And we have about 13 right now live on Encino and then the vast majority are still in project. But even though they're still in project uh, with the world changing so rapidly in the last few years, uh, even those that are in project found ways to really maximize their investments in Encino. And one great success we had is in the United States, I'm sure you heard about our PPP government funding program um, to try to stimulate uh, the economy. And so all of a sudden there, there's this massive rush on traditional banks as well as farm credit banks uh, to take this money available by the government and to put it in the hands of their customers. It was specific to small business. And Encino was able to uh, what we call spin up a solution in a matter of a week uh, and bring that to our banking customers. Five of our farm credit customers utilize that and were able to rapidly uh, put through these loans. And in the United States, that was super important because it was just a finite amount of money. So it was first come first serve. And so obviously to all these businesses and farmers, it was super important. The other thing that we saw with COVID in the United States is, as Robert was alluding to earlier, this massive push uh, to digitally uh, communicate with your customers. And so another success we had this past year is uh, one of our uh, farm credit associations or banks, as, as you might think of them, uh, was able in 15 weeks from start to finish Excuse me, though, that was 17 weeks, not 15. I wrote it down and I misspoke. 17 weeks, start to finish, um, was able to utilize our online application process to uh, allow their customers to apply for loans, uh, to exchange documents with the customers, whether it be tax forms, as Robert was saying, that's often important. Uh, when uh, looking at loans and structures. Uh, so they were able to start to finish, spin that up, and then they had 540 employees within the bank using that so that they can analyze and communicate back and forth with their customers. Um, and, and now they're moving forward with the rest of the whole loan origination rollout journey of Encino. There's a classic case of the crisis driving the necessary change um, of, of card adoption and, and hopefully that's going to continue to deliver benefits um, for, for the lenders in that system.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, digital is here to stay. A couple other successes as we were talking and preparing for today um, is just speed of getting innovation. So um, I know in the New Zealand banking market, unlike the United States, we have you know thousands of banks and in your marketplace, it's just several very, very large institutions. So there's a finite number of customers. So it's how do you get to that customer and gain their wallet share. That's the same dilemma that the farm credit system has. And uh, so that's another area where just speed of being able to implement. One of our customers was able to um, improve their speed of innovation by 87% um, from idea to implementation. It went from one year down to sometimes several weeks, um, again, through the use of automation and Encino. And I think the next slide has um, a really good quote from one of our customers, Texas Farm Credit. As you know, Texas is a very large state in the United States. Uh, this is another awesome success story. They just have been juicy with stats. And one of them was uh, they had 97% user adoption 90 days after go live. And they were able to do that, um, not just because of the ease of use of Encino, but also because senior management uh, at this bank really embraced this thought a notion of change. And they pushed through all kinds of great programs to get their customers and their employees excited about what was coming. Because as you know, sometimes when you go through a uh, a massive change, it, it takes some time before people actually see the results. And so by getting everyone super excited about this new technology, they were able to get tremendous user adoption. Uh, they also saw 94% reduction in administrate, administrative training. So just to get their employees up to speed on a new system or their processes at Texas Farm Credit, it went down from 12 months to three weeks. And if you notice everyone, I'm actually looking at a sheet of paper because I wanna make sure that I'm stating these facts correct because these numbers are just tremendous. Um, and of course with stories and success like that, that's really helped us through the farm credit system. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, look, it, 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 you know, often we think about the customer experience and it's important for us to think about the customer experience because I think as we were discussing with Robert, the farmers are looking for ways in which they can save time submit documents digitally, but we often forget about the banker experience, right? Because there's always two sides to that relationship. And um, I know as a banker, you know, when you come in there those first days, uh, you're just trying to work out the 15 systems you have to interact with uh, to pull this information together. Um, and I, I do see a lot of value in, in the discussions I've had of what we call this time to competency. Like how quickly can I bring in someone new into my organization and start to be efficient at delivering a service. Um, and that's where I think you can't um, overstate the value of providing tools that are intuitive, right, to your bankers so that they can learn quickly because we don't want to go and see someone and then go, you know, give me, give me a couple of weeks to work out <laughs> what exactly I need to ask from you whether I've got the right stuff and then come back two weeks later and say, by the way, um, we need to actually get that additional document. I didn't, I didn't realize. So, um, I, I do agree. I've, I've looked at the uh, video on Texas Farm Credit, and I think the, the, their compelling story about really enabling their, their team um, is, is pretty powerful. Um, that's, that's exciting. And I think uh, the, last, the last thing people want when they're working in the banking sector, like I used to do as a farm lender, is to have, you know, cranky, cranky customers. You know, you, if you've got someone who's having a seamless experience and you're making it as easy as possible, then your point's 100% right, Mark, that that's a much more, um, you, you don't mind going to work every day in that, if that's the experience. But, you know, I think through COVID in particular, we've, we've all felt sorry for some of the staff that have had to, had to do work in really difficult circumstances and, you know, the public potentially um, getting upset about delays and stuff like that. So, you know, I think your point's well made. And, and indeed, when we design things like digital transformation sort of systems and tools, not just in banking, but in any sector, um, looking after the staff and, and their well-being and their experience is actually a big part of what we try and think about. 
So, um, the, the, I, well, I forgot about this other stat. Um, I don't know if this is one that you said already. <laughs> well, and you know, actually that feeds in so nicely to what you were saying, because now we're talking specifically about the customer's experience. So, um, there's nothing more frustrating than going online and applying for a loan and wondering, A, did the bank get my documents? B, am I going to get the loan? How much am I going to get? And how long will it take to fund? And um, so this is, uh, again, a real life stat uh, from auto decisioning. They went from one and a half days uh, to get to yes down to less than seven minutes. Um, and, you know, Robert stated earlier about integrations and how important that is with DocuSign. And certainly uh, that is one of the key vendors that we work with at Encino so that when we do get to yes, we can also present and this bank can present to their customers the loan documents and then they can enable the digital signature as well. And I think, I think DocuSign is a, a, a good example of, I think, a broader kind of drive of ag tech and fintech and reg tech. Um, one of the things, you know, we, the value we bring in terms of bringing in Sina and localizing it in our market, we've got a team of um, 45 now um, here in Australia, is actually working with all of these innovative firms and working out how we can integrate that service to bring even more kind of frictionless, um, faster decision times. Um, it's, it's, pretty impressive kind of the, the innovation that's taking place in New Zealand and Australia um, around the space. Um, and I think there's a lot of exciting things still to come. Um, I don't know if Robert, you, you've you seen some of that um, happening in the market. Uh, in terms of ag tech and, yeah. and fintech? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I think the great thing about that is that um, you know, a lot of that, a lot of those um, developments occur overseas, including in the Bay Area, Judy, where you're sitting in San Francisco. But, um, uh, you know, our job is to try and then um, rapidly adopt them into, in, into Australian and New Zealand conditions. Um, that's, I, I don't think we're going to originate a lot of that, but there's so much, you know, exciting stuff coming out of those sectors that, um, you know, that that's what's going to hit our marketplace. And, and as I said, I think the the farm sector is now ready, willing, and able to to start to use that because we've got the tools in our hand every day, and we're starting to improve connectivity. And uh, the generation of farmers coming through are, are no different to anyone else in the community. They're 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 ready to adopt tech. I think that's a it's a good segue into kind of the the next observation because as we think about the experience. We think about efficiency. Um, a lot of it is is unlocked with data, um, and um, you know I think big data has been a topic that's been been around for for many many years. Um, but I think it'd be fair to say that no one's really successfully, especially in the lending um, part of the business, um, capitalised on all of that data. Um, and certainly one of the value propositions we we offer from Encino is is looking for ways to unlock that value. Um, I know Robert, you you and I were talking, and I think kind of related to the sort of ag tech and reg tech, um, just in terms of the opportunity for lenders. Now, if we put ourselves in the position of lenders, mm. understanding your portfolio, understanding your security, understanding your exposure um, is, is more important than ever before. And it's not just from a risk mitigation, but in terms of just helping better serve your customers. I, what, what are some of the observations you're making, um, you know, in terms of the lending space around identifying the value attached to that? Yeah, look, and I think my view, uh, what I said to you in prepping for today is that, you know, we don't want to patronise anyone here. It, you know, usually when you go into corporations like like the banks, the, the efficiency argument is, is the best place to start because everyone's under pressure and cost margin is under pressure. So, you know, I think when, again, when we're talking digital transformation more broadly, usually usually efficiency and productivity is the place to start. And I think that's good about what you're presenting is that at its heart, it's got a time-saving efficiency, quality, service, service, customer service uh, advantage. So that's good. I always like starting there. But then as, as I say, you know, what's the spin-off? What's the gift with purchase of getting better data and building this massive, um, you know, capacity to, to manage big data? And I think what, what I'd be saying to, to 
banks and, and other uh, clients we have is start preparing those data systems because the, the, the drive and the power that you get out of that, yes, that to some extent that's still emerging, whether that's sustainability services or as you say, internal risk um, assessment, know your customer better, um, you start to, uh, you start to uh, predict and sell and service your customer uh, you know, in terms of ahead of time rather than be reactive to something that, that, that's happened to your customer. So I think all of those opportunities will come. And if you've got your data systems and your data management plan, uh, so, you know, to, to me, that would be it. You know, you have a vision for where you want to go as a bank in terms of your data and what services you want to drive. And you start setting up the systems um, to do that. They're very rich, data-rich environments. And, uh, you know, I think what, 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 what will appear to the, to the bank's in terms of their service offerings driven by data will be quite exciting in the next few years. And I think as an extension to that and kind of building on, on what you're saying is, I think if you fix the experience, you're going to fix the data, right? The data yeah. is only going to be as good as, as the experience that people are having using it. And, and we've seen so many stories where with that disaggregated data um, makes it difficult for bankers and lenders and even customers to be able to access and update. And often it just sits in a, in a data warehouse um, and, and goes stale. So um, I think very well put in terms of identifying the efficiencies. But um, Judy, obviously with the penetration of Encino uh, into the US farm credit system, I think you guys are a little bit ahead in terms of now starting to think and understand uh, what opportunities that presents. Maybe if you could share with us, um, you know, from an Encino perspective, as you've got, as, as Rob described, this foundation established, you know, help us understand what are the value drivers that, that uh, banks should look forward to in terms of unlocking uh, with that foundation. Absolutely. Uh, we call it the intelligent enterprise at Encino. And uh, so here on the slide, you see one of them is um, being able to do uh, pricing and profitability, Ray Rock pricing. Uh, that is something that Encino's uh, product management group is working very closely with um, the agricultural banks in the United States to get that right. Uh, we all know the way that ag lending is, is different than a traditional bank. It's cash to accrual accounting, uh, which isn't exactly the same as what you see in a traditional financial institution. So we're working really closely with our banks on that. Um, and then the next one is um, just being able to, you know, you've got all this data. And so being able to have digital assistance and that's more of, you know, we were talking about that safe harbor coming event. Uh, that's a coming feature to Encino, but three and four are very much available today and being used um, by our agriculture banks in the United States. Uh, number three here on cost savings is the concept of auto spread. So um, this, this applies to both your customers within the bank or your people in the bank, as well as your customers outside the bank. So imagine if you will, uh, they go on, apply for a loan. Of course, you're gonna ask for fi some financials. They upload their financials and in the back end at the bank, those financials will automatically be pre-populated into your spreads so that you can spend your time instead of rekeying in all these data points, actually being able to do the analysis um, and, and give some real value back to your potential customer. And then uh, last but not least is what we call portfolio analytics. Uh, Robert was talking about how important getting the data right is. I mean, agriculture lending, uh, I'm sure you probably heard about the frost that happened. You know, we talked about Texas earlier today. It was an enormous, I mean, they had snow in Texas. That's unheard of um, in uh, the U.S. And, you know, those, those banks needed to know right away who are their farmers and what crops are going to be adversely affected by this snow. And of course, um, citrus crops were one of them. And so with these portfolio analytics, you can go in and, and mine your data portfolio. So those are just two examples that we're seeing in the United States right now of our customers using the intelligent enterprise um, to be powerful and to add value. And I think Mark Agriculture is slightly unique in the sense that it's also got uh, 
features around, you know, the environmental footprint, the carbon footprint, for example, which are now coming into, um, you know, the, the regulatory requ compliance requirements as well. So we've seen a lot of focus on regulation of the banking sector and anything where that can be done better, faster, uh, simpler. Um, you, you know, that, that's an important feature as we move into the next decade as well. Yeah, and I think actually, you know, I applaud uh, New Zealand and Australia. You guys, that's an area where you're definitely ahead of the United States. That's coming in the US. We're just not quite as advanced. So that that's that's a great point, Robert. Good to hear. Well, we're, uh, we've run out of time. Um, I want to firstly thank um, Rob and Judy. Re really appreciate your time this morning in terms of sharing your experiences and insights. I think there are so many synergies, uh, you know, as we look at some of the challenges faced in the US um, and some of the things happening here in Australia and New Zealand of how can we learn from those experiences and best practices. Um, I think as a final plug, uh, we just announced our alliance with KPMG just two or three months back. Uh, I think just looking at this conversation, it just shows the power of a partnership where we've got the deep industry expertise of KPMG in terms of advising customers on some of these industry trends and thinking about how to unlock the value combined with the technology of Encino um, and our experts on the product. So uh, really looking forward to uh, more to come. And, um, you know, I think for anyone in the audience, if uh, you want to learn more, please feel free to reach out uh, to either Encino or KPMG. Um, and we'd welcome the conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you for that session. Um, great session, very insightful, working, uh, working in a very interesting sector, uh, obviously having very specialized needs. So coming up next, uh, we have two sessions that will be back to back. Uh, first of all, we have Aaron Milburn, General Manager of Mortgages and Commercial Lending from Pepper Money New Zealand, um, who will be talking to us about innovation in the non-conforming market, a really key market that needs to be serviced in a, in a very appropriate way. And then following on from that, uh, we have James Brown uh, from Fintech New Zealand, who's GM of Fintech New Zealand, who will be moderating a fireside chat uh, with David Cunningham, who's the CEO of the Cooperative Bank, and Tim Code, Head of Product uh, for CoreLogic New Zealand. And in that fireside chat, they'll be discussing digital banking and the evolving trends, evolving trends of 2020 and uh, into permanent behaviours. And I think we've seen a lot of digital adaptation uh, occur, uh, a lot of uh, new adoption. Um, so I think yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what they've seen as uh, permanent, uh, permanent adaptation to those digital innovations. So uh, coming up next, uh, Aaron Milburn. And I'll, after that, we'll see you uh, for the lunch break. Thank you. Hi, Aaron Milburn here, the country head of Pepper New Zealand, and I'm delighted to be with you, albeit virtually, at the New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit for 2021. And what a period of time we've had. What I wanted to talk to you today is not only about innovation in the banking space in the New Zealand market, but specifically around non-conforming lending. I want to take you on a journey of what we have found as Pepper New Zealand as we entered the market post-COVID and the innovation that we're looking to introduce and challenge the industry so that more Kiwi families can avail themselves of home lending now and into the future. So why did we come to New Zealand? Well, we came to New Zealand off the back of one fact, and that was that in 2019, our research showed that 23% of Kiwis that had applied for a home loan had been declined. That's a really big statistic. So let's think about that. If we lined up 10 Kiwi families, effectively, a quarter of them were never given the opportunity for home lending when they could have been because the alternative was never offered. We've got to change that. We've got to use both innovation and education to bring more Kiwi families to be able to be successful and use financial alternatives to achieve their goals. So what were the main reasons for that? Let me, let me talk you through them. In 2019, the main reasons that families in New Zealand were turned down by main banks was a lower deposit. There was unusual income. A lot of self-employed income where main banks were unable uh, to use that income 
to help families achieve their goals. Debt consolidation. There was a number of customers that flagged to us that when they went to their main bank, tried to consolidate debt, be it from life events or just accumulation of debt over a period of time, they were turned down. And finally, poor credit history. And a number of those families, it wasn't due to going to the race course and losing all their money in their pay each week. This was because they had undertaken a life event. One of their family members had become ill. They had taken out credit cards that had to stop working to care for that family member. When that family member had re recovered or was in remission, and that other party had gone back to work, they had that debt that they needed to consolidate to get back on the ladder, and no one was there to support them. Almost 40% of those who were rejected were never made aware of an alternative. So let's think about that. 40% of the families that could have been offered an alternative to get into a better position were never offered the opportunity. Now that is an opportunity for us. That is an opportunity for us as an industry to change. That is an opportunity for us to come together as an industry to try and help those families succeed where currently they are not being offered that option. And again, it's irrelevant whether we talk about Pepper New Zealand or any other lender. I come at this from an industry standpoint where it's up to us to help them. Now, three in 10 of those people waited at least a year to try and get lending. A year. Now, I don't know about you, but the market moves a hell of a lot in a year. And that then further puts pressure on those families that are looking for solutions. And just over one in 10, they never had the courage to come back and try and apply again. Why do I use the word courage? A big part of my job in New Zealand is to talk to those families who were never offered an alternative. And what they say to me is, it took immense amount of courage for us to go and ask for help for our bank. And when we were turned down, we were embarrassed. We didn't know where to turn, and so we did nothing. And that's something we need to change and work together on. So, so what's happened since? What's happening now? What's happening today? Well, the 2021 New Zealand Reef RFI data, not refi data, RFI Council research shows 12% of people currently this year that have applied for a home loan have been turned down that were in that survey group. That's from January to April. 12% have been turned down. And the reasons have changed. The reasons have completely changed. So the number one reason that those families now have been turned down is because the property did not meet the criteria of the lender that they chose. The second is unusual income. And again, self-employed. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone takes the courage to go and be self-employed and follow their dreams and aspirations, they should be supported. And what we're seeing in the RFI research and the data is that they are not when it comes to home lending. The third was an insufficient deposit. And the fourth was they intended to service the mortgage themselves. So the reasons have changed. But what are some of the other findings? What else are we seeing out in the marketplace at the moment in New Zealand? Well, borrowers now are considering up to 3.9 lenders when they look for home lending solutions versus just two and a half six years ago. And you might say, well, that's a fantastic stat. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. What does that actually mean? Well, what it means is that there's far more consumer choice 
in New Zealand than ever before. There is more product. There is more innovation. There are different ways and different lenders like Pepper New Zealand who are entering the market to offer new solutions and technology platforms that simply haven't been available before. So there's more choice. Non-conforming borrowers, and again, let's not confuse non-conforming with credit impaired. If we look at Pepper Money, over 80% of our borrowers are completely clean credit. Non-conforming means non-conforming to the standards of main bank credit policy. And the elasticity of that policy determines the size of the non-conforming market in any jurisdiction that non-conforming is held. So non-conforming borrowers specifically are more likely and more comfortable to look outside of their main banks when they look for home lending. And let's think about those self-employed borrowers again. They are more likely to look at different options when they come to look at their options for home lending. Faster pre-approval and advisor recommendation is the third highest reason or reasons that people will consider more lenders when they're looking for that solution. Rate is largely not the most important determining factor. That's a bit of a myth I think that we need to bust. What we are seeing is customers need reassurance. Certainly in our space, they need the ability to feel that we are going to partner with them to help them with their home lending needs. So let's think about that, let's unpack that. And it's great to have all these statistics, but, but what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna change the game? How are we as lenders in New Zealand going to help more Kiwi families get into homes? Because surely that's why we're all in it, to help more families enter more homes. Well, let me tell you what we're gonna be doing. And let me tell you what we would like to really start to lead in the New Zealand market, and that is product solutions. We are putting a lot of effort into working with different consumer groups in New Zealand to create new products that solve for the needs of the market for today. And still, we still see mortgage products being sold today that we sold to, our, albeit at different rates, for those that you who will know, uh, but the same product, largely. You know, true innovation is still lacking in our industry, not only in New Zealand, but across the Tasman Sea into Australia. Product innovation is lacking. We're going to change that. We are undertaking a global search for new product initiatives and ideas that we are going to bring into the New Zealand market for New Zealand families. We're also going to use those insights and the studies around that to ensure that the target markets that those products are designed for are right. We're gonna look into culture and make sure that we're solving for the needs of the different cultures uh, within New Zealand. We're also gonna look at the design. We're gonna ensure that the products that we are selling today are designed for the needs of the consumers for tomorrow. Consumers now in the New Zealand market are starting to change. And so we need to be, not only my organisation, but all of us as a whole, at the forefront of that innovation and change, and then the delivery. And what do I mean by delivery? Well, how does a customer or a family access that product? Because they don't want to do it in the traditional way. The data and the research shows that digital capability and technology is going to be key as we move forward in our industry in the years to come. Now we overlay that with the new compliance frameworks that are coming into place and digitization has never been more important. In fact, some are call calling it the fourth industrial revolution being digitization. We saw during the COVID pandemic how digitization could be used quickly to cover the gaps when we weren't able to move around and we shouldn't lose the edge and the growth that that gave us. 
If we go backwards from that, I think personally we lose a real edge, uh, and that would be a shame. So what have we done specifically? Well, let me tell you about a couple of things that we brought into the New Zealand market, again to help more Kiwi families. We bought the Pepper Product Selector. What that effectively does is take between 10 and 14 questions and helps an advisor put a customer into the right product first time. It takes literally two minutes to do that and it enables that family to feel that there's a solution available to them. It has been widely regarded by the advisor that use it as a key tool now in their customer journey and conversations. It's about helping people and that's what's at the forefront of our digital change. We also bought the first end-to-end -end submission platform into New Zealand for advisors and we will continue to build out in that. We'll continue to put innovation into the platforms that were first to market in New Zealand as the digitization of the industry continues. But it needs work. We need the valuation industry to change and come on the journey with us. Valuations are taking too long in New Zealand. We need to understand how we work together to simplify that. And the more digitization we do together, the more families we can help because the, seam the journey will become seamless. So what else are we doing? Well, we're going to continue with that product innovation. All of us will be looking at what that means moving forward. The world's changing. The different ways of earning income, such as the gig economy, is going to drive the way we credit assess and look at credit risk moving forward. We're at the forefront of that change. We're also passionate about the education of advisors. In our opinion, the advisor percentage share is way too low in New Zealand and it's not driving enough consumer choice because consumers just don't know what that choice is if they're turned down by their chosen lender. So we're partnering with the advisors, we're partnering with the aggregation groups and we're partnering with industry to ensure that consumers understand what advisors do on a daily basis. How important they are to the fabric of New Zealand finance and home lending. And how advisors can show you a number of options so that you aren't one of the statistics that I spoke about and you miss out and you don't have the courage to come back when you really do have a solution available to you and your family. And then we're going to improve the customer experience. We're going to continue that journey. The statistics show that there's a real wave of emotion as you go through the home loan journey. The elation that someone's able to help you and that offer letter you get from the bank. To the confusion of the process, we live and breathe it on a daily basis, but our consumers don't. They've got the boxes packed, the kids' teddies ready to go, they know what bedroom they're moving into, and the communication breaks down, and nerves set in, and anxiety sets in. And then you move back up into elation when you get the keys. We want, to, we want to smooth that journey. We don't want to see that trough. We want to make sure that customer experience across the board is there and it's paramount that it's first class. And I've got a bit of a challenge for us. I've got a bit of a challenge for us as an industry. And the challenge is to work together. And the challenge is, innovation, in my opinion, doesn't need to come from technology alone. Innovation can come from change of thought. Innovation can come from the way we do things and the processes and challenging the accepted. It's about having a can-do approach, but balanced against the credit risk and the compliance frameworks we have, but above all being real and helping as many customers and New Zealand families as we possibly can. And helping those where they choose to go to their main bank versus an advisor. 
What we need to do as an industry, I believe, is if a customer walks into one of our branches as an industry and they can't get help, then they're referred out potentially to an advisor that can offer a solution that their chosen institution does not. Not to send them out the door with a no and no next steps on how they can avail of that solution. That's unacceptable. I get competition and it's healthy, but what we are all in it at the end of the day to do is help more families. And I challenge anyone with a branch network to link that branch up with an advisor within that locality so that when they cannot help, they refer that on. So for me, the future is super bright in New Zealand. As a proud Kiwi, I want to see us, as an industry, support more and more New Zealand families in the years ahead. Advisor usage will drive that, but it won't drive it alone. We need to partner together and be hand in glove so that digitization across our industry, not just in pockets, makes it seamless for more Kiwi families to avail of home lending in our great country. And so with that, I thank you for listening. I look forward to partnering with you in the future as our industry continues to evolve, grow and become even better in the years ahead. And I wish you a fantastic rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining the session. I hope you're enjoying this conference. Uh, in today's fireside chat, uh, we'll be exploring digital banking. Uh, we'll look at some of the evolving trends of what we've seen emerge through 2020 and what might, or some of them might, become permanent behaviours. Now, we've got a great lineup for you. Uh, our speakers today are Mr. David Cunningham, uh, the CEO of the Cooperative Bank. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, David. Hi, everyone. And we've also got Tom Code, uh, Head of Product from CoreLogic, uh, who also used to be at the Cooperative Bank. Uh, welcome, Tom. Hi there. It's awesome to be here. So just before we kick off, I'd just like to um, start by getting your views uh, around, I suppose, you know, 2020, and it was quite an interesting year for us. Um, and a lot of uh, your customers, I would presume, found themselves actually probably using more digital assets than maybe previously uh, from the years before, uh, especially by the fact that we obviously had a, our newfound friend turn up Mr. COVID, uh, and obviously forces into a situation where, especially things like money, um, we were no longer using or accepting checks and obviously cash, and we went into those sort of digital assets. So, David, I'll just start with you, but Tom, feel free to jump in. Just, I mean, what was the experience like from your own point of view um, as a, you know, as a, as a customer? Uh, and then what was it like, I suppose, for your organization and how you uh, dealt with that? Yeah, sure. Well, as a customer, nothing really changed because I don't think I've carried cash for something like 30 years since FPOS started in New Zealand. And so, you know, I always try and have five ten dollars tucked into the back of a mobile phone in case. But uh, so nothing changed for me personally. And I actually think that was the case for most New Zealanders because we're a pretty tech savvy country. Almost everyone has a mobile phone. You know, we've got customers in their 90s or late 90s using a mobile banking app. I, I remember I was at an at a annual general meeting where customer owned, so I was at our annual general meeting and those sort of things tend to be attended by older customers uh, who come in for the cup of tea or the free beer and cakes and so on and I approached a customer who looked like they were in their 90s and says, oh, which branch do you, you know, go to and belong to and he said oh I don't go I just use the mobile app <laughs> you know just about fell over because it wasn't what I was expecting but you know so whilst I personally just continued to bank the way I've always banked during lockdown uh, and you know used a card if we went to I ever went to the supermarket or whatever um, I think for our customers it was actually largely the same so at the margin a few more people use digital banking but you know for us as a business you know we're strongly growing and so our sign-ups to digital banking during lockdown were actually lower than 
outside because we weren't driven by all the new signups we'd normally get. So, you know, a bit faster um, sign up. A few customers used it to banking, mobile banking for the first time, but really overall New Zealand is so advanced in, in the use of technology that it didn't make a profound difference in my opinion. Probably the one thing it changed most was the use of cash because almost no one used cash for that time. And so I'll, I'll perhaps talk about it a bit later. We changed how we approach cash in our branches um, as a result of lockdown. But yeah, so, you know, more of the same, I suppose, with a few more people, but the trend was really firmly established. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's prob probably much the same for me. Um, I was at the cooperative bank for, for you know, about half, half the lockdown um, and then it kind of finished up towards the end of the year. But, it, it, you know, for me, it was, um, yeah, it was using, you know, mobile apps, banking apps. I've got, you know, bank with a couple of different uh, major banks in New Zealand and, and a couple of minor ones. Um, it didn't really change for me how I approach things. Um, I don't think I've ever really carried cash around. Um, so kind of using banking apps and using, you know, contactless payment methods is just almost second nature. Um, and I, I think, you know, for, for our core logic customers, what we saw was, you know, people wanting to, you know, those, they still wanted the same information about, about their homes, about their properties. And instead of calling or instead of going into, into branches, banks were asking us how they could help do that more digitally. Uh, so we had a lot of interest um, for our, you know, digital mortgage origination processes off, off the back of that. I think um, I think both points uh, you mentioned there, the sort of tech savvy, we are quite lucky that we are a nation of early adopters. And we've, we've seen that with some of the, the sort of the technology products and solutions that obviously have gone to market. I think one of the things that got re really exciting from my point of view is actually seeing new businesses actually pop up during COVID. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to some of them, actually, that, you know, they actually got to market more quickly. Uh, because there was maybe a little bit of an easing of the way that things were getting done. So um, great to hear, obviously, that you both weren't necessarily impacted. And I think to your both points as well, that your customers were already pretty much there. Um, it's interesting, I suppose, you know, we, we talked a little bit um, around financial literacy, and now we talk about things like digital literacy. So I think it is important that we obviously keep our customers, uh, you know, on the journey with us. So a question there, just um, Tom, just pick you just for the moment if that's all right and then jump to you David um how would you as an organization then how would you actually go about future proofing the success you know with digital uh, and capitalize actually on the fact that you know we've accelerated the use of it um certainly through the pandemic but as mentioned uh, even before I think what, what we need to do is make sure that we keep things simple and easy to use I think that um, you know, during the pandemic, there was, you know, some of the opportunities weren't there to, to go in person, but so, so people were using digital because they, they had to potentially. Um, but, you know, in order to kind of future proof that we, we need to make sure that we continue to produce simple, easy to use technologies, right? I have, I have a two and a half year old daughter and, you know, if it, it, some of them are easy enough for her to use. And, you know, if it, it's almost, you know, if it's not toddler proof, then, you know, it's probably not something we, we want to be rolling out to our customers. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, in that vein with young kids too, it's, um, you know, my 10-year-old was sitting in the car and I was taking her to school and my eight-year-old twins, one of them's got this watch. It's not an eye watch. It looks like one, but it only costs $15 that captures pedometers and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and she was busy setting it up. I had no idea what she was doing. And it was just classic how that stuff is so simple. But a lot of that, I think, comes to design as well. There was something I was listening to today that talked about the iPad and, you know, why kids can navigate that so easily. It's because it's kept simple. There's, there's no connectivity to a printer, for example, that would create all sorts of problems and so on. So, you know, keeping it simple, keeping it sort of fit for purpose and, and, and that. And I think that that point of simplicity is key. Like, Another, uh, I think it was a podcast I was listening to today, talked about MySpace. Don't know if you remember that, about 15 years ago, I think. And that was the way uh, people communicated. And along came Facebook. And the commentator was saying something along, along the lines of once they had Facebook, they looked at MySpace and said, oh, my God, this is so complex, cluttered and unusable. You know, I'll ditch it. And, and, and so, you know, you become irrelevant very quickly 
if you don't a move with the times and and and, and b continue to invest. So I think that's a the key theme is you know you've got to continue to invest. And you know a good example of that from a cooperative bank perspective is we launched our first mobile app about 2014. It was sort of leading edge at the time. You know we almost leapfrogged the the, the marketplace by starting with the blank bit of paper, but we totally replaced it last year. So it's only it was only sort of five maximum six years old and so on. And we re rebuilt it from the ground up. So you know that was a you know not an expensive sort of thing to build for for a bank. We do it pretty cheaply, but you know that that was five or six years on. We were replacing something that was perfectly good, perfectly fit for purpose, but um, wasn't modern in the sense of technology and security and all those sort of things and ease of use. So, you know, we involve customers in that process. So I think that inside is, you know, sort of fashion trends or tech trends change. And if you just sit on what you've got, you'll blooming quickly be left behind. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Um, make it simple. I mean, I remember giving a presentation to a room that were, shall I say, um, slightly elder and I asked them, you know, how, how tech savvy or tech adopted did they actually feel? And a lot of them said, oh, no, absolutely not. But then when I sort of simplified the question, I said, OK, how many of you actually um, fly? So most of them put their hand up. OK, so talk me through your journey. So there they were, obviously booking in on the app, you know, arrive at the lounge, order the coffee. And all of a sudden, the penny started to drop. They're like, actually, maybe we are a little bit more tech adopted or tech savvy than we actually thought. And I think that's that easy, simple transition into that that helps that sort of that early adoption, which is great. So, I mean, from a, a from a point of view around, you know, customers and the, you know, dare I say, the demands of your customers. I mean, what what sort of feedback are they giving you around what they're expecting from their sort of their their digital experience? I mean, has has that changed pre or post or during the pandemic? Um, be interesting to just get your views. Mm. Uh I think it's probably accelerated what customers have been asking for, but I don't know if it's actually changed inherently the the overall ask, which is I want a Netflix like Netflix or Spotify experience from every kind of digital point touch point I have. Um, I think that you know with more turning to co to digital during COVID, I think we saw that speed up, but I don't think that's changed necessarily from you know a couple of years before. I think we've had the tech giants who've been leading the way internationally. And I think everyone's, you know, trying to keep up and, and you know, understanding that they've got some of the best experiences and that th those experiences are what's making those companies successful, not necessarily, you know, data or, you know, the technology that's used. Mm. Yeah, look, for me, I think in banking, you know, because most transact, most things people do on the mobile app or internet banking are the really simple stuff, you know, pay a bill, set up an AP, check the balances and so on, you know, look at the home loan details and interest rates, what's my Kiwi savers sort of doing. And I think banks have generally got that pretty good globally and certainly in Australasia and particularly New Zealand. And so I think the expectations of customers are uh, not necessarily changing a lot. They're already in a good place. But from my perspective, um, from a bank, I think we failed quite quite poorly, actually, from a complex transaction perspective. So think um, applying for a loan, for example, with the Consumer Contracts and Credit Finance Act, there's a whole lot of information we've got to gather. And so we go about gathering that by asking the customer to do a whole lot of stuff for us. <laughs> so we ask them to tell, show us prove their income to us. We ask them to provide a bank statement so as we can look at them and make sure they can afford it. And yet all of that information is available, right? And yet we ask the customer to do that. And then to boot, we then ask our staff to get that information and analyze it and do stuff with it. And, you know, at our place, you know, we're not fully automated, we're working on it, but, you know, our customers, staff get highlighters out and go through looking for, you know, things like, you know, gambling sort of um, type of situations that are evident from bank statements and so on. And all of that is available information that can be handled by our computers. And as an industry, we don't do a great job of that. And things like open banking or open data more particularly, where a customer enables the data to be shared with whoever they want, in this case, say us as a bank, to support a credit submission, uh, enables that simplicity, that removal of friction for customers. And so I think because it's an infrequent transaction, customers put up with what is a pretty shitty experience, to be quite quite honest, and most banks are in that zone. And, and you know, the fault lies with the industry for not sharing data, making it easy to share data. 
um, and you know and, and banks and the like to, to build those processes. So I think you know, and some of that's sort of you know we, we haven't got a, a universal sort of approach to open banking in New Zealand and consumer data rights is actually probably an excuse to hold things back until the government legislation tells us what to do. So for me, it's sort of like improving those customer and staff experiences is to remove friction. That's the big opportunity. And I'm not sure if customers expect that because they do it infrequently, but when they do, it should be a beautiful, simple, uh, frictionless experience. And I think banks have got a long way to go in many of those sort of areas. Yeah, I think... Um... You, you bring up some uh, some personal issues there, David. I've uh, gone through that exact experience uh, literally only in the last few months, where all of that information is residing with my 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 bank, and all of the questions and the verification, and and you just sit there pulling your hair out. I really like Tom's uh, example there. Actually, Netflix. Um, you know, I've I've used a, a sort of a similar thing where. In the olden days, you'd sort of sit with the family on a Monday night, you know, waiting for your program to come on, only to be left with a little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, and then you'd have to wait till the following Monday. Well, obviously, Netflix and other uh, devices and things have come along and changed that. Banking, financial services is just the same. Um, it's when you want, um, you know, in, it's not uh, device dependent either. Um, and I think we are seeing an evolution, but I think, you know, I think we, we could be doing more. Question, yeah. and I suppose for you, um, around <laughs> around uh, investment. Uh, you know, I mean, banks sometimes do obviously get criticised, but you we we shouldn't really forget. Actually, you know, they're complex machines. They really are, um, and some have been around for quite considerable time. Bolted on a number of new platforms and systems. And I think we are getting better of being able to glean that data out to then actually do something with it. And obviously, you have people like Tom here obviously help that. But do you think over the period of time, um, historically, and do you think going forward, we are investing enough in this particular space to actually then deliver what our customers want? Yeah, hey, um, you know, from a bank's perspective, there's always different um, asks on your capital expenditure. I mean, at, at Co-op, I guess when we became a registered bank 10 years ago, we really started to invest big time. So we were investing over 50% of our profit back into projects. Some of them were physical, like, you know, we opened small branches. Um, some of them were computer hardware, which we're not really buying any more of that. Now we're moving everything to the cloud and largely will complete that journey in the next year or two. Um, but, but um, you know, investing in customer experience and staff experience has been a big, um, a big, part of what we invest but there's always not just the stuff you'd like to do there's the stuff you have to do which is there's a lot of regulatory stuff so classic example um, is the triple cfa the consumer contracts and credit finance act so some new legislative change came in that was targeted at loan sharks and people charging 400 percent interest rates guess who's spending literally as an industry tens of millions of dollars complying with that legislation that was all about 400 percent interest rates it's the banks and i was looking at our project internally there, there are 32 people in co-op in different ways working on that project to be compliant on the 1st of October, I think it is 32 people. You know, it's not all of their role. It's a small part of some of their roles, a lot more of other people's, but we've only got 330 people. So that's 10% of our staff working on compliance stuff. And so, you know, my point is that you want to invest in the customer and staff facing stuff to make their lives easier um, and deliver great experiences. But there's always sort of a regulatory overhang that that, that demands some of your, 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 your valuable resource. And, you know, you can't avoid that um, in some ways that the regulatory moat that keeps aspiring people out of banking so in some ways I always sort of say celebrate it don't commiserate about it but um, but it is an ask on your resources but you know that investment should always be fairly substantial I think we're seeing all the banks and financial services businesses investing in that space and you know opening up through you know using APIs and so on so even if you've got legacy technology you know the connectivity into that is really sound and really open over time as well. Yeah, and I think I think you know, there's there's always going to be people who'd like you to invest more. Um, I think where yeah, the, where you invest is really important. I think so. Co-op looking at re relaunching their banking app, understanding that that's got a huge impact for their customers, and sp so spending the money there, obviously you know a great move. I think that in Australia, some of the major banks saying actually we don't want to try and invest in upgrading our core systems. Let's build from the ground up because that's going to be a better use of that money so it's not just you know should we invest more but it's how should we invest it and, and you know, how do we keep up with demands that say you know a new platform is out of date three years after it's built 
So you know, how do you future proof new as well as understanding that in a couple of years, it's going to be potentially out of date and there'll be something new and, and you know, how do we use AI that no one really understands properly? We talk about it. It's almost like a buzzword. How do we actually use that to, to keep up with, with, you know, customer demands and, and internal demands, read the true pressures. Um, yeah. But I think that um, it also raises a really interesting trend that we've seen a lot more of um, certainly last year and, and certainly at the beginning of this year as well as partnering. So I think to your point, Tom, it's, um, there's not necessarily the need now to spend, I don't know, you know, half a billion or a billion dollars in revisiting your, your legacy systems. You can actually also partner with smaller, more agile tech companies and ultimately actually deliver a, a much better uh, out customer outcome. I mean, mm -hmm. are you both seen that um, from, you know, both sides of the, both sides of the financial services? Is that something, David, that obviously the co-op is embracing? Yeah, yeah, well, look, when we did have mobile app in the first place, you know, we, we, we'd had an internet banking that was year 2000. We had no mobile app in 2013, and we partnered with Alfero, which is a small Wellington, or at that time, smallish Wellington software house. And that was amazing because we delivered, delivered a lot quickly. We've subsequently, in the last couple of years, brought that stuff to, into house. But that was a great relationship where we didn't have the skills in the early days um, in the frontline, front end development. Um, I think it's a really interesting sort of space in terms of fintechs, you know, you sort of <laughs> fintech NZ, <laughs> um, James, but, you know, I, I sort of look at fintechs and go, I think it's really, really hard place to be because the challenge with any business is to get customers and in financial services, banks have a hell of a lot of customers and it's actually a surprisingly hard business to make money in um, financial services. So look at Monzo in the UK, so a neo bank startup digital only bank uh, last i looked at their annual report they had three million customers so by comparison cop banks has got one hundred and seventy thousand. their balance sheet is about three bit two billion one and a half billion pounds which is the same size as co-op's balance sheet in new zealand dollars uh, and they lost 123 million pounds last year up from a loss of 77 the year before and, you know, a smaller number the year before that, but they've consistently made losses, whereas co-op banks, you know, made 25 million last year pre-tax sort of thing. And so it illustrates that it's not just about customers, how you monetize that customer relationship after you've won the customer is the challenge. And I reckon for fintechs, the big opportunity is to partner with banks and financial services businesses, as opposed to say, I've got a proposition, customers are going to flock to it because you can sort of say, look, all I need is 1% market share, but trust me, getting 1% market share is unbelievably difficult uh, unless something is so new and so unique um, and very very few things are and banking's a low interest sort of category so the opportunity to partner more with um, fintechs I think is the real opportunity for both fintechs and banks because banks aren't don't have brilliant ideas and aren't you know agile in the way that startup businesses are but equally they do have that customer base and if you've got a platform that can integrate via APIs with the ideas provided by fintechs you've sort of got a marriage made in heaven so, you know, and then there's probably a subscription model or something like that. So I think there's, you know, that actually is probably one of the big futures for banking innovation is not to try and innovate yourself, but to leverage others in innovation. Because, you know, we're probably less entre entre entrepreneurs, you know, we're more risk managers and so on at, at, at banks and customer experience managers. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, CoreLogic, we'd, we'd see ourselves as a partner to major banks in New Zealand, but at the same time, we know that, we, we can't specialize in absolutely everything. So we actively partner where we know there are capabilities that will help us you know, to, to grow and, and support our, our customers. And one of the most recent examples is you know, looking partnering with Ambiental to provide flood data for the entirety of New Zealand that last week we were able to send out to the banks to say, these are your customers that potentially were impacted with the flooding. And you know, we can give you addresses, we can give you the, the actual data and you can go and contact them rather than, the, rather than them needing to contact you. Um, but so I, I don't know if I don't think it's just the, the large financial institutions or even the smaller financial institutions that need to be partnering. I think it's the fintechs partnering with each other to help mm. produce you know, combined solutions that are serving customers. Yeah, that's yeah. a great example of an industry wide solution, um, Tom, um, isn't it? In terms of the work core logic's done in that space, because you know, individually, why would the banks, you know, eight of us in the retail market do the same thing eight times sort of thing um, and you know and again in the fintech space you've got the likes of Kogo you know which measures your, car measures your carbon sort of based on your bank account um, uh, data and other entities like that so there's some good examples that are that are that are multi 
provider sort of solutions. And um, yeah, so, you know, it's about finding, you know, the, the good ideas will ripple to the top anyway, it's what I'd observe. Um, and I think banks are increasingly uh, got flexibility in their platforms to, to integrate. So, you know, there's a bright future, I'd sort of say, in that partnering space. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I mean, I think um, you, you, you mentioned the word fric friction there earlier. I think that a number of years ago, there was that sort of friction between large organizations and the techs, because it's like, you know, you've got all the customers, but you've got legacy systems, and we've got this new shiny thing over here. And well, we'll just build it because we've got the, the sort of the, the investment and the resource, whereas, you know, um, you can obviously move more, maybe more quickly. But then they sort of both found their feet and actually the relationship started to blossom. And it's like, well, actually, if we work together, actually, we will deliver a far better outcome for, for both for both parties involved. And, and I think we're seeing much more of that, uh, certainly in the last sort of 18 months. And, you know, it's, it's also about how you engage. You know, I mean, having worked nearly two decades in financial services, you know, working in a bank is quite complicated. It's, you know, it's not just turn up at the door and, you know, open your briefcase and present the big shiny thing and, you know, we buy it and it, away we go the following day. It does take a little bit longer. So as part of our role, we are trying to help educate about the right type of approach, when to approach, how to approach, um, but being very mindful, actually, that there are some layers that you would need to go through before that partnership actually then came to market. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you mentioned things like Kogo. I mean, there's lots of examples now in New Zealand where we're really seeing, you know, great partnerships um, actually solving, you know, big, big, chunky problems. Mm -hmm. um, if we sort of just dive a little bit narrow or just for the moment across financial services, have you seen any particular trends in any particular part of the financial services sector? So um, I don't know, we talked a little bit earlier around like contactless payments. Have you seen more things happening in payments, something happening in insurance? Is, is there any particular thing that sort of jumps out at you that you've spotted? Mm. Tom, Tom or David? I'll, I'll let you go, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, financial services, uh, you know, and payments has changed a hell of a lot in the last few la last few years. I mean, it's sort of been interesting that things like mobile wallets, you know, so on the phone as opposed to the the card that sort of does the same thing, but a brand brand sharing there. <laughs> um, uh, it's sort of a steady progress sort of thing. It's been interesting how, like, we, we don't currently offer mobile payments through the mobile phone and that, and it hasn't been something that we're getting the doors sort of, um, you know, bang down sort of about. So, yeah, it's coming. Um, but, but you know, it's really been tap um, that's been the big change rather than sort of swipe and so on. And, you know, I think with the interchange changes that are coming with the regular regular regulation of interchange sort of rates that will probably support the acceleration but from what i understand something like half of all payments in our tap transactions whereas go back five years you know it was you know five percent or less probably zero actually in new zealand and i think the same is true in australia too so you know it's certainly something that in new zealand australia globally has been a fundamental change and you know it's almost like holding you know i think covid sort of accelerated that too because holding onto your card rather than passing your card to someone else or putting in a machine and pressing you know, pressing buttons and so on. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that the banks all lifted the, the, the payment amount to $200 before you had to sort of touch the, touch the thing, you know, it's like something accelerated, something that was already happening that was accelerated by COVID, that banks facilitated even more by changing transaction limits and so on, you know. Um, and, you know, you get to hold on to your card so you don't leave it in the machine like I occasionally do and have someone say, I thought you were a banker and yet you're leaving your card in the, in the machine, you know. Um, uh, you know, that, that's convenience for the customer. So, you know, that's sort of a big change in payments. I think the other thing is in the open payment space. So, uh, you know, we've seen online FPOS, for example, start to get a little bit of traction. I think most of the banks or sort of several of the big banks now along with Co-op are offering online FPOS for customers, um, which is a really elegant solution. And it's, I guess, a different way of paying from through card, using the card schemes and, and so on. So you think about the likes of Afterpay and, the, and those guys, they're still using a card scheme card to make the payment and so on. So if online FPOS and, and open open payments or open banking, the payments part of that will enable better solutions. So as I yeah, can walk around the shop and point my phone or QR code or something, point my phone out a QR code and I paid for it and I can just pick it up and pick up and walk out. So I think, you know, that, that, that 
removal or reduction of friction in the buying process, both online and, and physically in, in a shop will, will, will change, you know. So, yeah, in fact, there is a fair bit of change, but interestingly, it hasn't all been orientated around the mobile phone for payment because, you know, tapping the phone or tapping the card isn't too much different. Tom? Yeah, I was going to say the um, using QR codes for, for payments are um, not necessarily called logic warehouse as much, but it's it, if I could speculate, I, I can see that becoming a far more popular payment method you know, in, in New Zealand and Australia. I think, you know, in... China especially, it's, it's massively popular and, and that's because, as we touched on earlier, people have access to mobile phones. It's, it's really, really easy to, to hold up your phone and scan the barcode. And then what we've seen during COVID is that everywhere you go, you walk in, you scan your, scan your phone first thing. So um, I, I'm interested to see where that's going. I think open, open banking, open payments is only going to help drive that and accelerate that. Yeah, I think um, that's a, that's a really good insight, Tom, in terms of we're now in New Zealand used to QR codes, you know, ask people 18 months ago, what's a QR code? It would have drawn a blank from most New Zealanders. Now we'd probably all go, yep, <laughs> know what that is. So that, that's a, I hadn't really thought about that, but that's a significant advancement <laughs> in, in how things can be built, actually, um, because of COVID. Yeah, and I think your point, David, as well. I mean, I, I was really impressed, actually, just at the sort of the pace the sort of the you know um, the financial services sector actually moved when they actually did raise the limit, um, and I mean you know thinking about it logically, it just made absolutely perfect sense uh, because you actually allowed then organisations to to remain at sort of that that distance, but actually still operate as well. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see where where it goes. I suppose I I want to you know what what is the the next big thing that we're actually we're going to see in an eighteen months time from now. How are we then going to go? Oh well, it's just like it's just something we just use now. It's you know we we don't even actually have to think about it. And um, we've seen certain organisations, obviously, you know, we have moved to watch um, glasses and things of that nature. Um, I mean, Tom, do you want to speculate a little bit about where you actually think the future might be, what it might look like? Uh, I'm um, very interested to see where we go with you know, digital identity and, and what that's going to mean. Probably broadly past financial services, but. You know, if, you know, if I want to prove who I am, it's my driver's license, but my driver's license has a whole bunch of information that you know, doesn't, more than just proving how old I am. So um, very, very interested to see how, how, we, you know, how we progress forward with that and how you know, the consumer data right in general broadens, broadens how we access data and how customers can access data. And um, I think we don't, we don't really even understand how, how that could be used to, to drive growth and innovation because we haven't really had access to it. And I think, you know, for, for a business like CoreLogic, we would love to, to be able to, you know, end to end help someone buy, buy a home, but we could do that if we knew, knew exactly who they were, how they were banking, we could connect the banks end to end. Like that's, that's kind of where we're starting to, to think. And we're very interested in some of the outputs and outcomes of those, um, of those papers from MB. I think um, biometrics have got, um, a big role, bigger, much bigger role to play going forward. And, you know, it's quite big in China, eh? But I was watching something with Amazon Go, you know, the the, the grocery shops uh, in US, I think, that have been um, up and running for a little while. And and the description of the friction that's that, that we create was really interesting and how you can remove that in biometrics is the solution. So the, the story sort of goes, you used to walk into the Amazon Go store, open your, get your phone out, um, unlock it, tap it on the uh, against the reader and then enter your pin or whatever it was on your phone or your fingerprint or something and then you can go and shop and walk out with the stuff. They said too much friction and so now you walk in, put your hand on the reader, it knows who you are instantly and where you go shop and so on. So it took a set of three steps that were pretty bloody simple <laughs> and turned it into one unbelievably simple one using biometrics and I guess play that forward. Why would you even need the, the fingerprint or handprint, you know, the biometrics, you know, facial recognition, all that sort of thing does that job for you. So it's sort of quite bizarre. You walk into a shop and walk out with uh, with whatever you want and it knows exactly what you bought and, and who you are and which bank account to debit. So, you know, it just re-engineers, biometrics re-engineers what's possible and also creates a secure, more secure world, I think, for us too. Yeah, and I think that goes back to your point, Tom, as well, around AI. I think we're still scratching the surface to some extent. I think there's probably a lot of experimentation going on behind closed doors all over the world 
But I think actually in the sort of like an, an adopted world, um, I think there's definitely still more scope for it. And I think back to your point as well, David, the whole biometric piece. I mean, I, I still come in, um, you know, we came from the UK and had to sell our property over there and all of the information they wanted, they wanted by email. And I'm mm -hmm. like, so I'm going to send you copies of my passport, copies of my bills, copies of my driver's license. Mm, I'm not really sure about this. So I think there's, um, there's definitely other ways that we can be doing that. But just before we wrap up then, I mean, Tom, you've already done it. David, any other, any other thoughts about what you think the evolution of the financial services sector might look like in, I don't know, five years' time, let's say? Well, uh, five years' time. Uh, look, I, I think that there's a huge role for people still in financial services. I think, you know, the neobanks globally haven't really demonstrated that they can make good money unless they're quite a narrow scope like TransferWise, which is now WISE, for example. Um, but in terms of a full for service financial services organisation, I think the role for people is still really important. But the role of technology to remove all the friction and the senseless stuff that we ask our staff or our customers to do um, is where the evolution will sort of take place. So people will still be important, but they'll be adding value through the human interaction rather than processing information and asking customers to provide information. So I think it's that removal of friction. So as the value add from people is truly value adding rather than, you know, process sort of stuff. So, you know, for me, that's where you'll see the big, big changes. People will still matter. Frontline places for us to meet people will matter. Video might be used a bit more in phone and email and things like that, but it's the human piece that will be far more efficient because we use technology far more effectively. Tom, final thoughts? I would just absolutely would echo that. I think that people are always going to be totally relevant. And I think, you know, when you um, when you complain about something, you want to talk to a person, you don't want to talk to a chatbot, and those people actually solve that problem for you. So I think that that's, that, you know, a very, very simple way, to, way of describing it is, you know, how, how I think that'll you know, progress forward. Yeah, I think I think that's a great way to sort of finish the session. I mean, if we reflect back on a few years ago when Game of Thrones was on TV, everybody was like, in a financial services um, uh, context, it was like, you know, AI is coming, you know, Jon Snow, be, be mindful. But the reality is, when you look at all of the research, actually, to your point, David, the technology is actually creating jobs. It's not actually taking them away. It's removing the friction. And ultimately, you know, from a staff or an employee's perspective and then the customer perspective, both actually are getting much more out of that conversation than possibly they were previously. Yeah, so I saw a great, I saw a just got a finish, got to throw no, this no, in. No. A great, great, great thing I heard the other day that if you think technology is going to take jobs away, then ask the doorman or the lift operator what they think. <laughs> okay. That's a good one. I like that one. Um, David, Tom, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on our fireside chat, talking about uh, digitizing and the evolution of banking and financial services. Some great insights and some views about what we are seeing in our sector and what obviously the future might bring. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you on the next session. Thanks very much. Excellent. Uh, what a great uh, panel and, uh, and presentation by Aaron Milburn. So thank you very much, Aaron, uh, James, and David Cunningham, and uh, Tom. Uh, so what we'll be doing is going into the lunch break next. Um, so please go visit our sponsors, CoreLogic, Encino, um, and FinTech New Zealand. Uh, and please also go see the RFI booth and see what we're up to there. Um, and obviously network with the delegates and, and everyone else. So um, now's your chance to take a break, have some food, uh, and we'll be back at 1.15. Um, so we'll be back then and for another action-packed uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Enjoy the break.
Alright everyone, welcome back from the lunch break. Um, hope you had something tasty. Uh, got to uh, cover off a few emails and, and get back to some people. Coming up next, uh, we have three panels. So uh, we're going to be tackling three really key issues that are probably at the front of a lot of people's minds in terms of how uh, financial services will evolve over the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, first one on a banking, next one will be on payments, and then the final one uh, just before the afternoon tea break uh, will be on buy now, pay later. Um, but up next, uh, we have uh, the open banking panel uh, with me uh, moderating it. Um, there's a fireside chat uh, with James Brown from FinTech New Zealand and uh, Jody Bullen, who is head of open banking from ANZ. Um, and then we have obviously the payments panel with Steve Wiggins from uh, Payments New Zealand, Will Miao from Paymark, who's head of online payments there, and Rebecca Fairbrother, she's uh, president and founder of Magnet, uh, which is, um, and they'll, they'll be uh, being moderated by Alex Borman, uh, one of the RFI crew, talking everything payments. And then the last panel, uh, we'll have uh, Todd uh, Weckrow from uh, Zip, who's country manager there, Chris Lamers from uh, Hum Group, who he is the CEO and chief customer growth officer there. And then we'll have Mandy Tomlinson, General Manager for ANZ for Layby. And that'll be moderated by Kate Wilson from RFI. So really three interesting panels. Hope you enjoy them. Um, but coming up next, uh, Fireside Chat. And uh, we'll see you after that. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone today for joining us. Um, we're about to kick off the Fireside Chat on Keeping Banking Open. I have joining us today uh, James Brown from FinTech New Zealand and uh, Jody Bullen from ANZ. And we're here really today to talk about uh, everything to do with uh, what's happening on the horizon with uh, open banking or, or CDR, but also talk about innovation in New Zealand uh, when it comes to financial services. Um, and one thing that's lingering and, and we'll certainly be discussing in this conversation is around uh, what's happening uh, that's going to help the marketplace and that's going to help the participants uh, and the providers as well as consumers. Um, but just to quickly quote uh, from the Ministry consultation on open banking or CDR, their perspective is that it could give individuals and businesses access to a wide range of products and services to reduce search and switch costs, facilitate competition and encourage innovation. Um, and increase productivity to help the, build the digital economy. And I think that that's kind of similar to how a lot of other uh, systems and uh, governments have looked at this um, opportunity uh, in how data is used uh, by uh, institutions and also to benefit uh, consumers. There were four uh, main options put on the table uh, for discussions, and I know that discussions are still open at the moment. Um, the first option was to do nothing let everything sort of sit how it was. Um, the next option was uh, to look at a legislative framework, uh, which would be pursued sector by sector, but not necessarily all. Um, another one was a econ economy-wide uh, data uh, sharing system. Um, and then there was also going to be a fourth option, which was different rules for different sectors. Um, and I think what we're seeing in Australia uh, and also in the UK is a mixture of um, number four and, and number two. Um, and so we're here to discuss what could potentially happen in New Zealand. Um, but uh, starting off with uh, you, James, uh, from FinTech New Zealand, um, you've obviously seen this play out uh, over the last, uh, well, well, 12 to 18 months. Um, you're probably quite up to date with discussions. Where are things at from, from your perspective, James? Yeah, great opening question. And thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, look, I mean, the simple fact is that We've heard it from a number of returning Kiwis that although we are a, a quite a small but agile uh, economy, sometimes, unfortunately, we don't move quite as fast as we possibly should. So we, for about the last 12 to 18 months, have been in deep discussion with the government around what does or what was back then open banking that evolved to open finance um, and as deep discussions in there around open data. Um, so we are about to embark on an independent piece of work uh, supported by government, MB, um, Minister Clark, and the Digital Council to what actually could it look like really for New Zealand. We are conscious that when you consider other jurisdictions around the world, 
Uh, and even when you're actually considering uh, free trade agreements about making sure that the regulatory landscape here in New Zealand is such that it actually helps thrive or innovation to thrive rather than the opposite. Um, so we are sort of, we are, we're laying the foundations, you might be able to say, um, but it's definitely been a hard journey or a harder journey than it really needs to be. And I think when you're open in statement there about a mixture of number four and number two, we, we definitely don't want to see it just being completely regulated, like i.e. the government just making the decision and drawing the line in the sand to some extent what we actually saw take place in the UK many, many years ago. Whereas if you look at what's happened in Australia and obviously their adoption of CDR, customer data rights, um, that I think was a little bit more of a collaborative approach. And what we're trying to do is look at what is, what is New Zealand's opportunity? And we have to take into consideration that we are a smaller marketplace. We could move more quickly, but equally, what is the impact? What is the unintended consequences to our, our Maori and Pacific, uh, to you know, what some people might say the unbanked, uh, to our SME marketplace, because generally that's the big part of our economy. What does it mean for our aging wealthy? So there's lots of things that have to be factored in um, and some people might argue we're not moving quickly enough, but the reality is, I think Jody would probably agree, it's fairly complicated. It's not really as simple as, as just making a decision and rolling these things out. And also, actually, what does it mean for the person on the high street? Um, if you walk into any New Zealand town centre and ask someone about open banking or open finance or open data, uh, you might get a variety of answers. And I, I don't know, Jody, what your views are, but um, certainly from our point of view, that we see this as a positive. Um, we think it will create more competition in the market. We think it will create more transparency in the market. We'll definitely see more new products and solutions into the market. And all of that, as long as we're taking the majority or as many people as we possibly can on the journey, it will be good for every Kiwi. So that's my view that we're a little bit behind the eight ball. We're moving forward. We will get there. And if we take some learnings from other markets around the world, we could arrive at a particular viewpoint more quickly than some of our other jurisdictions um, like the UK or like Australia as well. But being clear that we must make sure the regulatory framework is in place to create and help innovation thrive. Yeah, Jordan, yeah, your view? Yeah, lots of lots of um, notes I've been taking just to make sure I cover the points. There's, a, there's definitely a few bits that I'd like like to comment on. Um, but yeah, firstly, just um, thank you, Judy and on RFI Group for hosting this today. It's a pleasure to be here and um, back in a room with James and yourself, um, if you can call it a room, our virtual room. Um, so yeah, just a bit of background. Um, I'm looking after open banking for ANZ um, as part of that role. I sort of participate across the industry in the industry working groups as we develop standardisation uh, through the API Centre and also sit on the Digital Identity New Zealand Council um, and I'm very interested in digital ID which we might fold into this conversation a little bit as we go. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the, the models you talked about there were really good to open up some conversations and I think, you know, James talked about us being a little bit behind the April and I think that, you know, I think that will be true. Um, equally, there are some advantages in, in sort of Behind being behind a little bit and that we can reflect on what's happened overseas and we can look at the learnings and how they've approached it, what's worked, what hasn't. And I think it's fair to say that we probably don't have an ideal model to copy at the moment. Um, and I think in combination with that, we've got a few different inputs for New Zealand. One of those being, you know, smaller, right, what's a right sized approach for us? Um, and how do we how do we do that in a like that journey in a really inclusive, open way? Um, that does actually result in innovation and, and you know changes. I mean, ultimately, this is all about the consumer. So it's successful when consumers see a difference. So for me, I think you know actually we might not go up and ask a consumer if they know about open banking because that really is just the framework for it to happen. But you know, could we go up in a couple of years and ask customers have they benefited benefited from these types of initiatives? Have they used these types of services? And and that that's got to be the proof point. Um, so yeah, I think really great opportunity, very supportive of a lot of the comments that, that James mentioned, but it is complicated um, and it's, it, it sort of sounds like, if you've heard me on these forums, I think people just think I'm Mr. Complicated Man because I'm always talking about the complexity, but equally I, I guess my philosophy is always, 
that believe in the potential and the opportunity, which I totally do. Um, but we've got to test them for, for some realities, and there are some realities that we've just got to work through together. Um, and that will take a little bit of time, but I think by doing that is where we really are going to make a difference and consumers really will understand um, you know, what this new thing is. And whether it's open data, open finance, open banking, or just some great new propositions that land you know, on customers that they can, can make better decisions, that they're feeling more empowered, that they're, they're more, in, more inclusive, that their day-to-day -day life has been made easier in some way. And, and that's the exciting bit for me because what open banking, open data does is it starts to create opportunities to create things for customers that they wouldn't have otherwise. And that's quite exciting because that's innovation, something that wasn't there, something that's changed, something that we can improve. Um, and the, the, to be able to lay a foundation and, and an ecosystem that could do that is, is quite exciting. But yeah, it will be complicated. There's, there is a lot to work through, but I think we're on the right journey. Um, where that's going to lead, I think, yeah, it's, I think we're, we've got our own destiny in our hands to some degree, and there's a, we've got a window of opportunity now, I think, as a, as a country to really, really, I guess, demonstrate what that can look like. And if we can do that, then I think our, our pathway to consumer data right or open banking will potentially look quite different, but potentially more valuable and, and consumers will really understand what it is. So I think I've covered most of the point. Might just quickly touch on digital ID because it's not mentioned there, but you know that for me is something that I push always push quite hard because you know part of the complexity is actually you know that that we're starting to introduce multiple different parties into exchanging data you know and it, it's hard that's kind of data moving around and so you know part of the risks are we don't actually know you know with certainty who it's going to so there's a lot of mitigations that have to be put around that so so just from a risk perspective digital identity is a good thing. Um, but, but equally from a consumer's perspective, you know, if you want to grow a digital economy, then you know, actually digital ID is a, is a foundation of that. And if we, can, if we can leverage that to build out our open data economy, then I think we'll actually be in a better position than yeah, any jurisdiction that I can point to right now, in my view. Yeah, I, um, I, I would absolutely totally agree with that, um, Jody, as well. And I think the other thing, um, just for some of the viewers, uh, the banks are actually for this. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of chatter uh, over the period of time that you know the banks are a little bit slow to react. The simple fact is that we just have to take into consideration, as Jody mentioned, the complexity actually of doing this, and equally actually the punishment that the regulators can actually um, mm -hmm. bear on the, the you know these large incumbents should things actually go wrong. And the reality is we don't want to see. Uh, situations when people's data is obviously being misplaced or misused inappropriately. So I think there's a lot of different factors that we have to consider when we're making changes of such a significant size. But back to Jody's point, absolutely, this will actually be great for everybody. We just have to look at, you know, what's gone on before, take into consideration, you know, the good and the bad, and then look at what that, what does that actually mean then for, for New Zealand uh, and if we get this right, it really could put us in a very, very strong place. You know, back in, I, I remember back in the day when I first arrived here reading this story that, you know, we, New Zealand was actually the, the first country in the world to create the first refrigerated ship out of Dunedin by a Scots person, um, which was awesome. Uh, but the reality is, you know, geographically challenged as we were back then, you know, we had to come up with some new ideas. The reality is because of digital adoption, and one may argue that COVID helped us accelerate there. The reality is our geographical location in some instances is actually no longer a challenge. We can deploy products and solutions anywhere in the world quite easily. Um, but the reality is we just make sure that we get this right over the next couple of years. And I think it puts us in a really strong position. Yeah, definitely. And that creates more inclusion and it really probably hits home to a, a mission statement for what open finance should be, right? Um, and, and making sure it has the right motivation behind it. Um, and digital ID is, is the beginning of so many parts of the digital economy, not just banking. Um, I think uh, two weeks ago in Australia, FPOS announced that uh, it was doing digital ID uh, so you could buy alcohol online and verify that you were of suitable age to do so. One of those creature comforts when you're in lockdown or, or something like that, but um, certainly probably necessary. Um, but uh, 
moving on in terms of the, the fintech uh, space in New Zealand, um, when you look at uh, the motivations, looking at competition and innovation, making sure that innovation is thriving. Um, what sort of innovations are thriving uh, in, New in New Zealand when it comes to the fintech sector? Are you finding there are new plays in digital ID or are they uh, looking at certain parts of um, the experience cycle? Um, what are some of the key things you're seeing, James? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the overall sector is, is going gangbusters. I did a, a release actually just at the tail end of last week. And you've got to consider that, you know, only a very short period of time ago, fintech was a new buzzy word. Um, and we've come up with loads of other ones since then. But the reality is it's no longer a buzz. It's an actual thing. The sector, the global sector itself is now huge. It really is just incredible, actually, the growth that it's actually experienced in the last few years. And if you look at some of the, the raw data, um, so Greg uh, Shanahan and his team at TIN, they produced the, uh, the investor's guide uh, only, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And if you look in there, fintech is still the fastest growing sector or subsector across the tech stack, which is just great to see. Uh, and I think that long may that continue because the simple fact is, regardless of what you do, you will either pay or receive money in some function, regardless of whether you are a private, uh, public listed organization, whether you're a government agency, there's money moving around all the time. So I think to your question, what are we seeing interesting? Obviously, we've had some great organizations for a number of years now, like Sharesies and Hatch uh, and others who've gone into that particular part of the wealth space within financial services and opened up, um, I suppose, the ability to for, for others to actually participate with a little bit of low risk, which is also quite nice. Because part of this is around education. But we're also seeing the payments. And Jody probably is better placed than I with the work that he does, obviously, in the, in the payments API. We are seeing great organizations being uh, born out of returning Kiwis. So I'm thinking of Shane and his partner who've just come back from Singapore and stood up DOSH. Um, you've got other companies doing some really, really great work. And the fact is, back to Jody's point earlier on, this is going to be good for everybody in New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we are going to be able to provide different options, um, and it will obviously mean that you know other people and other organisations will have to keep pace. Uh, and that's why we're also seeing more collaborative projects coming out. It was a bit of a it's a bit of a hard one because a lot of people I think they, they look at large organisations and it's like why are we why are they not partnering with fintechs or insuretechs or wealthtechs. But again, back to the point we talked earlier just a moment ago, it's hard and it's complicated and there's a lot of, a lot of things you have to go through. What I think we're seeing now, early this year, for the rest of this year, and I definitely think next year as well, is a, an advancement of more of those partnerships across big organizations. And that, again, is the same reason why we talk about open finance to drive better customer outcomes. Um, so it's great to see thriving sector, could do more, a little bit more clarity, dare I say it, from government. Mm. And I've had this conversation with ministers and I've had this conversation at dinner with the PM, um, what they've been able to achieve in other sectors because they've been very clear, that's what we want. We want a big stake in the ground, you know, somewhere down the line for FinTech from the PM's perspective, uh, because I certainly know that um, dare I say it, the opposition are really keen to get behind this particular sector, but I'm sure Jody's got some views on what you're seeing in terms of partnerships and other parts of the fintech sector are actually spinning up. Yeah, it might be a good time to, to jump in. Yeah, I mean, the, the payment side certainly, um, James, I think you're probably better placed to, to um, talk to that, but I'll, I'll touch from, from my experience of what I've seen. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of interest around payments. Um, but equally the data and, and what, what can we do with it? And I think you know, there is a huge amount of opportunity when you start thinking about and even exploring very, you know, on the surface, what sort of opportunities are out there, they're, they're, they're pretty immense. And so the, the real challenge for me is how do you actually execute on some of these, which is I think is, is probably where there's, you know, we're seeing friction. I think that's what the next couple of years gives us the opportunity. How can we reduce some of that friction? How can we work better together? Um, and that that 
isn't going to be necessarily easy. Um, it will be hard. It will require the collaboration across parties. I think what we're seeing is a, you know, James touched on it, but I think we're seeing a, a sort of coming together a little bit of the sort of actually, no, we don't want to work with fintechs when the large incumbents, are, you know, actually they're, they're here to disrupt us. Um, you know, we can do everything on our own. Um, through to the fintechs, is actually, no, we want to do it all on our own and we're happily working in a garage. And, you know, I think actually, so where are the great ideas going to come from? What are they going to look like? And, and for me, those in the short term, those ideas are going to come through collaboration because they're, they're just going to unlock and they're going to enable team people to work together to create propositions that are mutually beneficial for all parties. Um, that will change over time. That will change and we'll see a shift in some of those dynamics. But, but I think that's where the opportunity is. I see, and I think this is not just my view, but I think you just look at sort of, I guess, the commentary and, and where investments are being made and what partnerships are happening. And we won't go into detail. You can just search and see that there's a lot of them happening. You know, actually, what are the types of things that they're looking at? How, how are they going to add value? Um, how are they working together to create these new things? And, and so that's the exciting bit. And, and when that comes together, you can work through some of those challenges. So for me, one of the big challenges is, and I think I agree, James, this, this clarity piece around outcomes, you know, you talked about at the beginning is around switching, competition, innovation, productivity. They're all great, but they're really big. So, so like, what are the things we really want to go after? Like, what are the things we really want to see change? Because for those that have sort of been involved in, you know, building products or bringing new propositions to market is, you know, incremental, show value, you know, earn your worth, build trust, scale, 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 right? And, and so, you know, kind of to the opposite to that, you've got this sort of view, I will build everything and that, that will come. And, and building everything for every scenario, every use case, for every type of different partnership model and everything is going to take time. So I really do think that if we can, if we can be clear on really what are those outcomes, what are the, the true outcomes that we're all going to ha look at and say they're the ones we want to shift the dial on and actually rally around those as, a, as ends at Inc., then I think you're going to see some real momentum and, you know, digital ID would be one of them. How can we, you know, if that's an outcome, how can we help people verify their identity better? Um, how can we help people get better financial advice in this context? Or, you know, there's so many different use cases, but the challenge is trying to do everything for all people at the same time, given that, you know, what you can just look at overseas and the amount of investment and time and energy that's been spent trying to create these ecosystems. And, you know, they are, they're slowly getting there, but it wasn't a sort of big bang, everyone's on and suddenly all these things materialize. It, it does take time. So, I, yeah, James, I just to second that point because I think the clarity there is really important. You know, what are we really going to get get after? You know, and and how can the organisation, how can and that organise itself around that to create these opportunities for New Zealand fintech? Um, I'm going to hone in on that point because I really do feel right now it's a it's a great opportunity for Kiwi innovation um, because we're here, we want to work together to create these new propositions. We can do that in a way where we're evolving standards. You know, they're not yet in a fully open environment like you see in regulatory environments. So that means actually we can work together ahead of, ahead of that to get access to fintechs, for people to work in together to create value. Looking ahead, you think about if we just opened everything up right now, what may happen? Right? That's a, you know, that isn't going to encourage that collaboration. You're going to probably, you potentially might see a whole bunch of overseas competitors coming in, you know, and they may not bring the same values and principles into what we want as an outcome. So I think if you can align some of those things together, I think some real magic will happen. But, you know, we are, we're, we're sort of, yeah, we're slowly running out of time. So I'll, I sort of, you know, I think there's an urgency aspect to that as well. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a great point. I, I use a couple of sort of um, scenarios in my thinking that because of COVID and we were, you could argue we were forced to uh, accept a sort of new digital way of doing things. I mean, I, I remember actually interviewing Steve Yukovic, the CEO for Kiwi Bank, about two or three weeks uh, prior to lockdown level one. And one of the questions that he was asked actually from the audience is like, why, why have you made the announcement that you're no longer going to accept checks? And he was very honest. I mean, he basically said that we are a small organization when you compare us to the sort of the big four. And it costs us millions and millions of dollars for less than 1% of our customers. I mean, who, who would have known that only a few weeks thereafter, actually, you, you know, we were all in a situation. We weren't obviously using checks and we certainly weren't using really cash either. 
So I think the world has changed. And I think back to that point Jody made around regulation. If you had gone back, oh goodness, four years ago and spoke to some of our regulatory bodies and talked about fintech, they'd be very much left with, um, really sorry, you've started to speak a foreign language. I mean, I sometimes get that anyway because obviously my Scottish accent, but that's another, that's another story. But the reality is now you've actually got COFA, which is the Council of Financial Regulators, and the FMA is the sort of the lead voice on everything fintech. So we are, we're seeing, it's a little bit like the chessboard. All the pieces are on the board. Some are still figuring out, you know, what their, um, what their strategy is. And that's totally fine because we don't have all the answers. As Jody mentioned, even other jurisdictions around the world certainly don't. But the reality is we've got that nice momentum. We're on the, we're on the diving board. We've got a little bit of momentum. We haven't quite decided what jump or what dive we're going to do. But the reality is it's there for the taking. And I think that we are seeing more of these collaborative projects, which is great. And we will see more of it. The question is um, making sure that I suppose we are building things that do actually solve problems. And we're not just creating something new and shiny over there that doesn't really solve a problem because that can be a little bit distracting as well. So I think focused attention, clarity of thought. And I think we could really do some really cool stuff, which we've already seen happen anyway. Excellent. And with um, that sort of clarity of thought, it's it's important to obviously understand what are the sort of main pain points customers have uh, throughout their experiences with financial services. Do you feel that it is about solving those experiences that need to be digitized or or have uh, the data enabled to make it uh, cleaner? Or do you think that that's first and then maybe creating solutions where the customer can get a benefit from their data just from a knowledge perspective? Which one do you think uh, tips the scale? Certainly, probably for banks, it's about making sure the experience is good and secure. Um, but then at what point do you think the market will start to expect, hey, I need some more value back other than just it being slick and digital? Great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, look, Jody, I'll jump in just for a couple of comments. Obviously, yeah, go, I, you'll have some great things to add. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to pick on the insurance sector just for a moment because the, the reality is if you look at the sort of the cycle of big organizations, banks tend to move first and then insurance tends to move a little bit slower. If you think about, you know, Julian, I don't know if you've made an insurance claim in the last year or two years or three or four it's years. And, now. <laughs> and, I, and I hope that that continues. Uh, but I'm sitting here at home today and I've made a couple in the last couple of years, uh, and it's not been a great experience. And that's that's from someone that works within, you know, the financial services sector. So I think it's it's to the point. There's a there's a problem there for consumers that the the value of insurance is questioned. We are the second most expensive country in the world for insurance. Also, when you know you tend to call on it when things go wrong, that's not always ideal. But we are seeing a shift. So if you look at companies like AIA in their vitality program, back to Jody's point, we're trying to use data in order to deliver better customer outcomes, whether it's a reduction in premiums, um, people actually live in a more healthy lifestyle. So if you are in the gym and you're making decisions, all of that data is available. So if you can then sort of collate that and bring that back into the system, then you can actually drive better outcomes but there's also the, the trust element. So as an example, if, you know, if I want to uh, open up my data to, let's say, a, a health insurer or life, life insurer, then obviously I've got to be trusting them that actually they're making the right decisions for me. So I'd look at it and think about prevention. So actually, yeah, you can have all of my data if it helps prevent me get ill. And therefore, if it helps prevent me get ill, you actually will not be called upon as much as you might actually if we do it completely the opposite way. So there's going to be this little shift in power and dynamics about how that relationship will actually evolve. But the reality is we're actually seeing it now. And we're seeing, you know, our insure tech uh, ecosystem here in New Zealand is really, really thriving. Um, mm -hmm. Not as big as maybe Australia as an example, but different size of market, um, which is you know, obviously taken into consideration. But the reality is we are seeing some pain points in different parts of the financial services sector 
that new organizations and, and and we shouldn't just say the techs we should actually say in collaboration with big organizations are actually driving great customer outcomes so i think we understand our data better we access our data better we can interpret our data better and then because of all of those learnings we can have actually a far better um conversation with our with our customers um, and that's what we've got to continue towards. And I think we'll definitely see more of that, but Jody's probably got some great examples in there as well. Yeah, I think the point you talked around there on customer value is really important, right? And, and you've got to keep bringing this back to the customer because that's what it's about. And these aren't different customers, right? Not, and the customers aren't different to somebody else's customers. They're the same people with us, right? It's the same person so you know when we come back to thinking about what pain points i think we can all all relate to those pain points you've got insurance james i've had a few others myself not sure insurance related but you know id verification you know actually being able to prove my income and my expenses for for loans um yeah i i i really struggle with inefficiency personally it's like printing off forms or printing out things and sending it off and then people lose it um you know all those sorts of things so so there have we got a perfect system today? Far from it. Is there opportunities to, to innovate? Yes. If it's a big enough customer pain point, then everyone's going to get behind it because you know they're the ones that I think are going to get the traction first to my point earlier on. So because if they are, they're the pain points that all consumers are facing and they need to be solved. And so you know there's certainly a lot of those in the banking sector. You know, we're, we are working on a number of those. Other banks will be doing the same. Um, and there are opportunities there for people to come and help with that for bringing different capabilities and ideas to the table. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this, this sort of leads on and maybe it's a topic we, I think we're going to get to, which is, you know, how do you collaborate? How, how do we show, solve shared problems? Um, and there's a number that we've, that we've looked at lately where we could say, actually, here's a really great proposition because here's the benefit for one party, here's the benefit for the other, and here's the benefit for the customer. So that's something that we can get behind and, and it's got a great story and you know it really warrants investment of time. And I think, you know, going back to focus and parity, you know, with right size and we've got limited resources, we don't have 150 people sitting on, you know, working on OBI or 75 people sitting on OBIE, which is the entity that looks after open banking in the UK. You know, we've got <laughs> well, so we've got but a number a lot less than that working on it at the moment. So, you know, this right size find those opportunities, what are the high value and, and how can we leverage those? And so, yeah, I, I think, it, as I said before, a great exciting opportunity. Customers will, will, will dictate what propositions are successful and what comes first. Because, and, and only if we put the customer first and we listen to the customer's viewpoint in the outcomes that we target. Um, if you don't, then customers won't get value because we wouldn't have got our measurements and our, our sort of direction correct. And we could end up with something that, you know, we could be on the diving board and do a belly flop, right? Or we can get a perfect 10. So, um, you know, that's that's the opportunity we've got right now. So, And I think, Julian, what, what we're seeing, obviously, is, um, is education playing a really sort of big role in how people interact with organizations as well. I mean, I, I use a really easy example. So, like, um, we've all, I'm sure, got our favorite TV programs. But back in the day... Uh, you know, if your TV program was on a Monday evening, let's say at seven o'clock, you'd watch that episode and you'd be sort of left with a little bit of a cliffhanger and you'd have to wait till next Monday at seven o'clock to obviously catch back up. Whereas now you've got other, obviously, vehicles where you can just watch whenever you want. Mm. Um, and, and obviously that's been really, really good. Banking and financial services is really no different when people actually want to do something, they want to do it when they want to do it. Um, we no longer have to put sort of the big top hat and tails on and go down and sort of meet the bank manager because the reality is you take out your phone, you know, by the swipe of a thumb and you're already in your banking app and away you go. But I think also to Jody's point, what are the pain points that we can address or should be able to address relatively well? And Jody, I think uh, what you were alluding to almost sounds very similar to myself. I, uh, my wife and I went for a little bit of a top up mortgage. We wanted to do some renovation on the house. And bear in mind, I, I only bank with one bank, so I'm quite maybe unusual, even in the tech, the tech circles. All of my information is in there. I've been verified. 
numerous times. I've got loans, I've got my mortgage, I've got you name it, it's in there. But I still had to go through the process, still had to give my date of birth, it still has to be verified, check my income, check my outgoings, paper format, all this stuff. And it's like, this is just incredulous. It really is all of the information that you need in order to actually, you know, satisfy my request is there. In fact, I shouldn't even need to actually speak to you. I should just be able to do it in my app. So I think we are, we've moved forward. Uh, we are getting better, but I think that on demand, but equally big organizations have a little bit of what I call the duty of care. They've got to help educate their customers, uh, especially when they are evolving a product or a solution. Um, and the reasons why it will be beneficial because people move at different pace and that's totally fine. Uh, but the reality is, you know, it can't just be uh, generally a product for just a small segment of the market. It has to be much wider than that as well. Mm. well that almost touches on, I think, uh, well, a couple of years ago when open banking, open data was being first spoken about. One of the first counterpoints was banks have enough data. They don't do enough with it already. Um, yeah. But I think we're getting to the point with, innovation and fintech partnerships where banks can do a lot more with the data um, and create those those correct solutions. Just going back, Jody, uh, to collaboration. Um, and I think we can also uh, merge this into, a, I guess, another interesting point is, have you seen some great collaborations in markets globally that you would love to replicate in your market? Um, what do you think would be the ideal, uh, the utopia? Yeah, good question, because there's quite a lot going on. Um, and I think, it, I think it does come back to individual strategy as part of it. But, but, but ultimately, it, you know, it still comes back is what's good for customers? I mean, and how is it going to help them improve their financial well-being and overall well-being? So what are the things that can be done, you know, in that space? So that, that's, a, you know, and that's a big driver, you know, not only for ANZ speaking on behalf of my employer for a minute, um, but equally, New Zealand, it's a big thing that we want to focus on. How do we improve the well-being of our people? And financial well-being is a, is a big driver of that. It's a big driver of your overall health. So you know, what can we do? So I, I, I think there's some great opportunities there. Um, you know, some of that sort of extends through to advice. Um, you know, how do you help budget? How do you help? You know, I've seen examples of some facilitating how do people get access to grants and, and support for that. So those sorts of use cases around financial well-being, I think, are really, really useful. Um, yeah, and anything that can start to make consumers' lives easier in that respect. So, yeah, I, I won't point to any particular ones. There's, there's quite a few, but but I think that for me, it's, it goes back to those principles of what I mentioned before. For me, open banking, open data is about how do we create things that weren't there. So if you can see an opportunity to create something that's better, that's made someone's life easier, that has been made available because partners are working together in a way that they open and collaborative and in a way that they couldn't do it before. And I think the point, the really important part about open services is that this isn't like, okay, one bank develops it with one partner and that's kind of the end of it. This is actually, the, the real value is gonna be when those services become, you know, open services available to all. And so, you know, to, we had a recent um, one we've been working on with Spark called Review Bills, which allows, and big billers to send payment requests into customers, which is great. It sort of helps solve the problem between, you know, the dilemma for billers that they want to be paid on time and have a surety of payment, and customers want more visibility and control. Histor historically, they've been two conflicting things. Yeah. So actually, can we create a proposition which solves both of those people's needs, and can you do it in a collaborative way that helps people make payments and have more control over their bills and and deliver some value out to customers and all parties and you go that's that's really exciting like so where are more of those because mm. that's the stuff that actually millions of customers can use and and so yeah so I won't, there's a few there i mentioned um julian so um but there are many more and you know you only have to do a quick google search to see some of the exciting sort of propositions and um, that are being developed by parties working together yeah I think those kinds of examples are also things that consumers will adopt quickly because there's an instant benefit um, and there's minimal risk. Um, the last thing consumers will jump into is something where, well, social media aside, is somewhere where their data is going to be used to sell them something else or, 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 or go down that path. Um, but it's giving some benefit, some convenience. 
Um, yeah, and, and consent, James, we talked about before the consent piece, right? And and customer education. This is really, really, really important because if you if you can't articulate that in a way that customers understand and they feel informed and they make great decisions, then it undermines the trust of everything. And so that's again where you can work together to really understand how do you create that confidence for the customer, you know, that they they know what they're doing, and that it's not a single customer of one, you know, is a shared customer. So how do you how do you do that? And that's really that is really important as well. Yeah, I think that's. I think you've touched on an absolute um, fantastic area around the sort of the financial health and well-being. Um, it, we we know it is an area where actually it can create some stress. You know, people thinking about their financial situation. You look at some of the research that was done even bef before COVID, uh, but certainly during COVID as well. It can be the number one thing that people really do fret upon. So I think to Jody's point, that sort of uh, that education piece, you know, and how do we, how do we, uh, with these new products and solutions, how do we present them in such a way that people really just get it uh, and they understand why it would actually be good for them? And I think to Jody's point as well, it's not just a, you know an A and Z customer, you know, customer across the broad spectrum, but also actually we're talking about regulation having a role here, about the suitability and I suppose the sustainability of products now. So if you look at insurance, I mean, you could take out insurance, let's say in your, your early 20s, but who's asking the question 25 years down the line, is that product actually still the right product for you? You're now married, you've got a couple of kids, you've got a bigger house, you've got two cars. Um, so I think that's part of what's the, the sort of the, 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 the role of the regulator, but also actually the role of big organizations but equally having the ability then to actually share that information and use the data is making it easier for everybody else. And Kiwis, dare I say it, um, uh, you know, historically they've used property as the sort of like the retirement piece, whereas now actually, and only, in, only really in a few years, we've seen other products and solutions now come to market that are now giving people different choices to make. Um, and I think that's that's fantastic to see, and obviously long may that continue. Um, but the reality is, it's got it's got to be in such a way that you know it, it appeals to the sort of the, the mass. It can't just be uh, isolated at one particular part of the segment. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where we've we've done that pretty well, actually, in New Zealand so far to date. Excellent. Well, um, the fire is dying down. Um, I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground today, um, but look, really appreciate your time, Jody uh, and James. Um, I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out over the next six to 12 months and, and certainly what sort of model uh, New Zealand adopts. Uh, but I think we all look forward to seeing some great innovations and collaborations that, um, that help customers at the end of the day uh, and, uh, and obviously keeps everyone secure in, in, in what they're doing with the data. Um, but look, thank you again for joining us um, and uh, we'll hope to see you next time. Cool. Thanks, Julian. Ju cool. Jordy, nice to see you again. Yeah, thanks, James. Cheers, bye. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining today's panel conversation where we're going to be talking about uh, the payment behaviours and preferences of New Zealand consumers and merchants. Uh, we're going to be taking a forward-looking perspective on this topic to understand how the market will be changing over the coming years. Um, joining me for today's conversation are three industry experts. Uh, so first of all, we have Will Miao, who is Head of Online Payments at Paymark. We have Steve Wiggins, who is Chief Executive of Payment New Zealand. Uh, and we have Rebecca Fairbrother, who is President and Founder of Magnet. So, Thank you very much, Will, Steve and Rebecca for joining us today. Now, I might start the uh, panel conversation just by giving Will and Steve and Re Re Rebecca just the opportunity very briefly to explain a little more about who they are and what they do. So, uh, Will, if it's OK, if we start with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Alex, for having us. So I'm Will Miao and uh, we work at an organisation called Paymark. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we started the FPOS, so Domestic Debit Network here in New Zealand about 30 years ago. That network is going strong and is still one of the most ubiquitous networks of its kind in, um, in the world. So our, my role in particular is really looking at oh, after 30 years, what can we do to actually upgrade our business from actually just running a 30-year-old piece of switching technology to embracing the new 
open banking era and um, getting into the API side of things. And um, as my title suggests, online payments. So I'm excited to be with you. Perfect. Thank you, Will. And uh, Steve, over to you. Yes, yeah, Steve from Payments NZ. Now, we're the self-governing body for the payments industry, and we manage the rules and standards how payments go through the system. So we pump through around $7 trillion a year through our high value uh, clearing system and our retail clearing system. And of course, looking forward, looking at changing payment behaviours and innovation is really important to us. Sure. And thank you, Steve. And Rebecca? So uh, I, I have a regulatory background. I spent a number of years at the Reserve Bank of Australia, although I did uh, grow up in New Zealand and have since moved back. Uh, I am president and founder of Magnet, which is the Merchant Advocacy and Guidance Network. So as the name suggests, I, uh, I represent and advocate for merchants because when I moved back here, I realized how there was essentially no regulation and the merchants are paying much higher fees to accept card payments than they are in, than they do in Australia. And so I saw a need there for merchants to be represented because um, industry is represented with Payments New Zealand and consumers are um, often uh, covered by a, a lot of a consumer uh, protection as a lot of, um, there are a lot of industry, excuse me, a lot of government support for that. Uh, but merchants, yeah, so they're a big part of the payment system, but essentially there wasn't a voice for them to be heard in terms of what was uh, what they needed. So I saw a I saw an opportunity there, and that's that's why I've created Magnet. So yeah, perfect. Well, thank you, Will, Steve, and Rebecca. So um, the, my first question relates to the pandemic's impacts on payments behaviour. Now, across the markets that RFI operates in, we've seen. Uh, the pandemic have sizable impacts on the way in which consumers want to pay and the way in which merchants want to accept payments. So my first question really is to understand a little more about how we've seen that translate into the New Zealand New Zealand market. So, uh, Will, perhaps I might start with you for any comment there. Absolutely. So non-surprisingly, at a very high level, we've seen a big jump in e-commerce transactions, but also for in-store, we've seen a lot more contactless adoption and People do joke, right? Contactless had um, been around for 10 years, but COVID's really the push mm. that the industry has been waiting for to get people on board largely. So on the online side, um, New Zealand Post actually put out a figure, 25% growth that is um, based on 2020. So that largely is attributable to the uh, COVID lockdowns that we've seen here in mm. New Zealand. And um, but interestingly, after the lockdowns lifted because of um, uh, what well, we had a relatively short lockdown here in New Zealand, we still saw some of the figures sticking. So it wasn't at the end of the year as high as it was during lockdown, but certainly was much higher than it was back in uh, compared to 2019 baseline. And as for contactless, our proxy to that is what we call scheme debit. So that's basically debit transactions initiated on a Visa MasterCard um, using contactless technology that has jumped by um, over 10% um, during the lockdowns um, and that has largely stuck as well. So now we have seen that rate being, um, all transactions in store being uh, about half of that is uh, either contactless debit or credit, which could also be contactless as well. Mm. And domestic debit, which is either a Stripe, uh, Mac Stripe or an insert has declined. Mm. Mm. But I must, I think I, one, another thing I wanted to point out is mm. even though we didn't have a lot of in-store transactions during the lockdowns, when the lockdowns lifted, it bounced right back, even without um, overseas tourists coming into New Zealand, we have seen some of the highest figures and we had another record uh, Christmas last year. So that's a mm. really good sign and of Kiwis getting out, supporting local economy, getting back mm. in support. Mm. And, and Steve, it sounded like you were concurring with a lot of what Will said there. But any, yeah, any definitely. Um, yeah, the obvious one is around the contactless increase as well, but also what uh, shot up was the amount of contactless enabled terminals in the market. So uh, just pre-lockdown, there was about 36% of them. Uh, by the end of the year, it was made up 52% of the fleet. Mm. So, so mm. that's really interesting. And also just concurring with Will on the contactless percentage overall transactions, you know, it, did, it shot up to just under 40%. A uh, year before that, it was 27%. So mm. I think the contactless one is really important. And it's obviously one of those trends that are going to continue. The other fun fact for me during lockdown was 
328,000 New Zealanders signed up for internet banking for the first time. Mm. And I think that number is quite extraordinary when you think about that. So that's another big shift in terms of the changing behavior of New Zealanders and how they make payments. So 328,000 citizens now are doing internet banking, which they weren't before lockdown. Quite extraordinary. Mm. Uh, mm. But then if you look at the other trends that are happening, I think overall the, the payment system held up really well uh, during that time. Uh, but we look at other changes that are starting to occur, maybe not in this market, but in others, the things like virtual reality shopping, um, wearables are now coming back into to, uh, to play and starting to see an uptick in that, those things as well as what we're what we're observing at this end. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And and Rebecca, any um, comment from a merchant standpoint? How how has how has the pandemic changed their preferences uh, from an acceptance? Well, in terms of um... I, my interesting the interest I have is in the regulatory changes. So, mm. uh, sorry, not the regulatory changes, the changes in interchange fees uh, by Visa and MasterCard is one interesting thing. So mm. in August, both both schemes changed their fee structure so that um, the interchange fee for, for contactless debit dropped to, to, to 20 basis points and quite quite a significant drop. And I thought that came at the end of when a lot of the banks were reducing their, uh, removing their um, their free debit contactless rates that they had had since COVID came out when ANZ initiated that. And I I wonder if in part that's why the merchants have continued to accept contactless rather than reverting back to previous the ones that weren't actually accepting it, mm -hmm. or if it's a bit more of inertia. So. As I said earlier, I have a regulatory background, uh, so I think it's probably a bit of both. Uh, and from, from my members' perspective, there still is some resistance for accepting contactless, especially if a business has high tran value transactions on average, because they, um, obviously, that if, if, if COVID was the issue as to why they were thinking about getting contactless the reason they didn't did it was that most of their transactions were above two hundred dollars and so therefore would their customers would have to put their pin in anyway and in terms of going forward with mobile payments becoming more and more um uh used i know that um both in the rbnz and rba have reported with their consumer studies that um yeah there's been an increase in the use of mobile payments then i think the customer is, is driving the acceptance of contactless. Um, I also know that Afterpay has just recently announced that it's moving from its QR code system to accept to offering a, a virtual card, which is a prepaid mm -hmm. card. And so any merchant that wants to accept Afterpay has to accept contactless. So one of my members has opted to not take up, not continue because of the cost of, of the contactless for her business. Um, so that's that's my um, take on it. I think I mean I do live in a small town, and I've been building out my med, my um, membership in locally initially, and so that could be skewed. I know um, when I've been to Wellington, there's a lot more contactless available, uh, and yet I've I've heard I don't I haven't spent a lot of time in Auckland, but I've heard that that it's a, not as prevalent in Auckland as it is in Wellington, which is also an interesting um, mm. interesting observation. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounded like there was a collective belief there that some of the change in behaviour that's been seen will stick and perhaps some of it will revert back at least partially to the pre-pandemic state. Is that a fair sense? Yeah, like I, I think so. Although I have looked at the, the statistics that Steve provided in the, um, as part of the merchant um, regulatory consultation, the submission by Payments NZ and the you know that as, as both both Will and Steve said, there's been a big switch in in contactless um, versus contact for both credit and debit, and that's been sustained in terms of the numbers mm. since the pandemic. But I think um, there's going to be some flux back and forth, uh, and I think that that's the key. The one of the key purposes of Magnet is that because it's very confusing to understand whether it's cheaper or whether it's worthwhile accepting, accepting contactless, because there are so many factors, that having a voice for merchants so that those issues can be conveyed to industry. Because 
I think that industry needs to know what merchants want so that then they can be able to provide a better service and vice versa. So we can both, both sides can win. Um, because I think, yeah, I think that we're both, both sides are a little bit in the dark about the preferences for accepting contactless. Mm, perfect, thank you. We, we touched on examples of innovation. So I think Steve touched on uh, mobile payments and QR codes and um, virtual reality payments, et cetera, wearables and the like. So mm. There's obviously examples of innovation that are emerging in the New Zealand market and have emerged, but what's your sort of collective assessment of the state of innovation and perhaps gaps versus other markets? So Steve, you, you, you touched on innovation, so perhaps I'll, I'll start with you. Any, any comments to add there? Yeah, I think the New Zealand market is, has always tended to be innovative in terms of its approach to payments. One area that we have fallen behind in the industry is, is uh, sort of looking at now is the real-time platform in terms mm. of that. So we've still got significant um, amount of funds that are going through either same day or in real-time, but we haven't got that real-time capability 24-7. And so looking across other jurisdictions, uh, obviously they have, and a lot of that is because they're they have sort of leapfrogged into that, whereas our current system is still functioning pretty well. Um, I think everyone agrees with that. So that's what the next, one of the focuses of the industry is, hey, when and how uh, should we uh, deliver this real-time capability? Mm, yeah, and, and Will, and any... any um, yeah, any so I might be a little spicy here. My <laughs> view is, <laughs> I think New Zealand's been leading for a long time, but up until recently we've started to lag in certain areas so Steve touched on a few part yeah. of it is because yeah. we have led so well in the past and we have one of the most ubiquitous domestic debit network at POS and we have one of the highest banked populations in the OECD world so 99% of all eligible Kiwis have a bank account and that's among some of the highest in the OECD world yeah. but also compare with other countries in the 60s even less than 50% that's staggering, right? So for, but for those countries, they've actually gotten an opportunity to then kind of go, well, given that we have a blank slate, how do we actually frog the likes of New Zealand and our infrastructure and actually take a step forward and with mobile wallet and peer-to-peer uh, -peer payment using alternative rails and certainly with open banking and some other jurisdictions as well. So mm -hmm. that has in a way, um, I guess, allowed them to become leaders in certain areas. So here in New Zealand, we see that um, since FPOS, we, the, most of the innovations we've been seeing are mostly scheme dominated. So Visa MasterCard driven technologies like contactless, whereas really for us to take control back, given that we have such a good banking infrastructure and payments infrastructure, thanks to Steve, we really see the next opportunity being open banking. And we'll certainly talk about that a little more next. So Paymark's been mm -hmm. working on open banking technologies with our online FPOS being the first open banking product we launched in the New Zealand market, which is mm -hmm. uh, getting a lot of traction. So that's where we see the opportunities at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Rebecca, you mentioned that you you recently, as I understood, come back from Australia and returned to New Zealand. Perhaps that gives you the opportunity to uh, assess the, the state of innovation in both markets and, and uh, differences and similarities. Indeed. And so, so I was um, working um, in, the, in the policy department with regards to the, N, the NPP, which is, the, is short for New Payments Platform, which Interestingly, they've continued. They're continuing to use that name, which is funny given it launched, you know, a few years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, and so that's that was as soon as um, that question. I saw that question. Um, the fast payments system is le immediately leapt to mind, and so I concur with Steve, and I concur with Will, and I think one of the key things that we need is the open banking and the fast payments to happen in sync because you can't have um you have settlement risk essentially with open banking if you've got instant payments at the point of sale for instance uh and you don't have the the back the backing the infrastructure in the background to actually facilitate those payments going through so um you know those those obligations could accrue and um whereas with so if, for instance, with the Australian real-time system, MPP, there it's real-time um, clearing and settlement. So uh, 
you instantly get those funds into your bank account because your bank has instantly received those funds from the payer's bank, uh, which is is quite um, quite an interesting model. Mm. Compared with other other places around the world, will do the immediate clearing, but not the immediate settlement. Um, so I think we need that here, and I, given that SBI, which is the current uh, retail settlement. Um, process and I think that there's definitely the capability for Payments New Zealand to do a good job of of 24-7 real-time retail payments. Uh, What I will say is that the the process for getting the NPP in place started back in 2010 uh, where the the Reserve Bank conducted a strategic review of innovation which came uh, back with its conclusions in the middle of 2012 and essentially one of those <clears throat> one of the outcomes of that was that the, the industry should build a, a real-time payments infrastructure but that the reserve bank left that to the banks etc to come up with how the, how to build it and to build it while the reserve bank came up with the settlement behind this behind the scenes yet it took a long time for that to actually properly get started because of lots of co- coordination problem between between banks, which is a classic uh, issue in payments because it's a network game, and so the Reserve Bank had to continually use more persuasion to, to to get the banks to work together, and then that took longer than expected, and so the the payments the new payments platform didn't really start going until two thousand and eighteen. Now that's, you know, six years since they were told they should. So that's with regulatory push. So if we don't have that here, I can't see it being built sooner than that. Um, That's my regulatory background, Steve. I, I hope that we can do it sooner than that. But I'm sure you're aware of trying to coordinate different and different commercial entities um, to build something that's that's beneficial to everybody, but the first mover problem um, causes issues. Yeah, no, that, well, that's our world, right? In yeah. terms of getting <clears throat> the network to all come along in the same direction and at the same pace as well. Mm. So we recently put out our payments modernization plan, which was widely consulted across the industry. And it's mm. fair to say that the uh, feedback has been, hey, it's got all the right elements, but it's too long. You need to do this quicker. And yeah. so that signal cert- certainly hit the industry loud and clear in terms of that. Mm. And all I can say is there is a lot of industry activity that is working on the how are we going to do this? And I think from my observation, there's real commitment there. So I think that's one thing. Let's see how that plays out over the next um, probably three to three to four, six months in terms of where we get to with those initial conversations. Second one too, I think this needs to be seen in the broader context of some of the regulatory burden that has been placed on on some of those institutions, it is huge, uh, both Mm -hmm. in terms of either COVID related or capital related or the BS11 legislation, those sort of things. There's a lot of of activity going on within those organizations. Therefore, that comes to another broader industry issue is capacity and capability. Mm -hmm. You know, have we got enough people and capability to actually do the work? And Mm -hmm. that's one thing that um, at times I think for me, you know, the payments experts, they tend to be um, getting on and they some of that capability is starting to get pretty thin. And um, I think that's fair across all of the payment organisations. But we're, we're certainly aware of that. But we also need to give that some consideration in terms of how do we continue that innovation at the right pace and do it safely. Mm-hmm. Thank you. We might um, we might sort of continue on the focus on regulation and talk now about these um, the interchange reforms, the recently announced interchange reforms, and perhaps a perhaps a, a punchy question to start with. And Steve, I know we spoke about this briefly before the session, but what's your sense? Do do consumers win from the reforms? Uh, well, if we look at the f- reform, if you just focus on the interchange, so that's the first one, Campbell Thorak, right? But the reform. Rebecca, correct me if I'm wrong here, is sort of a designation approach to broader retail payments uh, providers. So they're just starting there with with interchange. Um, Will consumers win? 
If you look at other jurisdictions when they've introduced the regulations, I haven't got much evidence to show that that actually gets passed through to the consumer, uh, but it mm. certainly is a benefit to the merchant. Uh, there's certainly no uh, evidence to say that it passes through to uh, better wages for staff, those sorts of things. So does a consumer mm. win? Not sure. Mm. And, and, and Will, a perspective on that? Very similar perspective. Um, it is just the first of the many changes to come in mm. this uh, very complex web, right? So it's only interchange. Interchange is only one part of all the payments that are happening today. So FPOS, I mean, we mentioned it's still going to continue to be free, uh, but open banking is not part of this regulation. And we've asked for clarification on it. And um, the answer is it's going to be captured in other legislation work that um, MBE is currently working on. So then without getting the full picture, it's actually quite hard to see what the end results will be. Um, immediately, we probably will see some short-term benefits for the merchant, uh, whether that will stick or not, whether the it, you know it's a whack-a-mole and the costs come up somewhere else, yeah. we don't know till we see mm. the full picture. Mm. And that's a good segue to you, Rebecca, from a, a merchant's perspective, or to your, Will, Will gave a prediction from a merchant standpoint there, but your, your thoughts? Well, uh, given that there's regulation in Australia for, for interchange fees uh, and merchants, when I was there, I, I don't recall after the, the, I don't really recall anywhere not taking, if, um, sorry, if not taking contactless. Uh, and so the regulation is important to help merchants be able to offer these services. However, I, one major concern I have with the with these merchant fee regulations is the speed at which the, the, the government has implemented it or um, can, done the consult, consultation over. So, for instance, in the Reserve Bank, there was a, a major financial re system review of um, not just the payment system. And out of that came a number of changes, which included instigating uh, a regulator, so the payment system board part of the RBA. And then there was the first regulation that was actually put in place to say, uh, you know, there's a cap on interchange fees didn't happen until around 2002, 2003. And at that point, that's when Visa and MasterCard about a month after those regulations became live, took them, took the RBA to court. So they ultimately lost, but it's a long drawn out expensive process and that's just wasted resources. Uh, so, and, and just going coming back to New Zealand, the, the, the announcement of the, the caps is uh, talking about the interim or transitional uh, period, which is six months after the retail payments bill is what it's being proposed at, at the moment, uh, which would, as you were correct, uh, Steve, is where the, the MB is looking to have a designation approach, which is the same in Australia. Uh, that... Six, so six months after that legislation is finalised, that's when that, that transitional period comes in while the Commerce Commission is building up its, um, you know, putting together the regulator, whatever form that might take, and figuring out how, to, how they're going to regulate. So, and, and MB doesn't see that happening for at least a couple of, you know, 18 months to two years. So there's going to be, I'd say, depending on when that legislation is, is finalised, which I hope that the government takes sufficient time to get that right. I think MB has, you know, in, in, between, in a, between a rock and a hard place that they've been um, tasked with creating these regulations and this um, setting out what, these, this what this legislation should look like in a very short time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's going to be, I would say, at least a year's worth of time where we have those hard caps and like, like I mentioned in Australia, the legal action that I suspect there could be legal action, which isn't great, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, and then there are a few other things that, uh, that, a few other unintended consequences that could arise from having very simple hard caps. I mean, the Reserve Bank of Australia has, they've just finished their third major review of the credit card, regula uh, credit card regulations. And each time they've continued to make changes or observed 
things that have popped up that have essentially the schemes in the banks have done to get around having to reduce their interchange fee revenue. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm a little bit cynical. Uh, and so I, I, I can't see why they wouldn't try and do that here. Um, so th that's my major concern is that this regulation, if it's not done right, could have very bad outcomes for merchants and customers, consumers. And just to pick up your point, Rebecca, around the timing, right? It does seem like this one has, there hasn't been a lot of time to actually come up with this first uh, yeah. tranche of destinations, right? And yeah. whether there will be more time spent in the future to kind of join everything up, we don't know. Because this, to your point, it's really just a cap and um, it yeah. seeks, speaks to align to what Australia has done. Yeah. Um, but New Zealand is very similar to Australia, sure, but different in many ways. For example, the FPOS has been free for merchants here yeah. Uh, yeah. as opposed to charged in Australia. So, you know, there are things we can do differently here, maybe better ways that if we actually don't just look at interchange at its own little designation, designated silo, but actually the whole payments ecosystem, mm -hmm. could there be things like least cost, cost routing of contactless through mm -hmm. all debit transactions down FPOS because it's free, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, that's what we were hoping to see sort of in future drafts of this legislation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one point, another point I'd like to make on the interchange fee mm -hmm. caps, that the government has indicated that they want to cap contact debit transactions at zero, which is what they are right now. But by putting a formal cap on there, that just that just cements the problem that we have where because FPOS doesn't cost anything here, then there's no been no investment in FPOS. So by the government saying it can't, it can't even, you know, that it can't be changed. It's just going to it's it's going to reduce the amount of innovation in that space and and least cost routing um, is a great idea uh, and it's definitely something the Reserve Bank of Australia is pushing for um, continuing to use more persuasion at this point to get the banks mm. over there to continue to um, roll that out um, but you can't have that unless both both networks have access to um, contactless technology um, FPOS in Australia because it's a um, it, it can generate fees, then it has been able to invest in that technology and is also investing in online uh, acceptance as well, which is just impossible here. I know that Paymark is rolling out its online, um, but it's it's um, not across the board yet. It's a it's a slower process. So, mm. yeah, the, the, I do have a lot of concerns with the regulation, and I just hope that this legislation process is going to be done properly. I know I've spoken with um, a number of people at MB and I know they are working really hard and they're very aware of all the issues that I've brought up. So I just hope that the government doesn't pressure them to do this quickly rather than properly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think um, collectively you've all mentioned in passing uh, in the conversation thus far, the, the topic of open banking. So I might move in that direction now. Um, obviously being rolled out in markets around the world uh, on paper, uh, will have um, some quite profound um, impacts on the way in which um, consumers and businesses in engage with financial institutions. But I might give you the opportunity to provide your perspective on how it's likely to play out in the New Zealand market and uh, the impacts that it will have there. So perhaps, uh, Will, I might start with you, if that's okay. Perfect. Thank you. So I think open banking, just a, a myth bust, buster of what the term means, right? Uh, it basically means... Uh, trusted and secure access through to your bank account by a trusted third party that you've consented to and to provide services on your behalf. So there are actually examples of open banking in today's New Zealand economy already, right? So for example, um, maybe not in a censored way, you may have booked a flight with Air New Zealand and booked, paid straight out of your bank account. Uh, that's not technically open banking because you're giving people your password, but the act of trusting someone to act on your behalf through access to your bank account is essentially open banking. That being done properly with actually secure API links sitting underneath that could then actually unleash a whole lot of use cases. And from payments, basically paying online without going through Visa MasterCard schemes or paying in store without, uh, again, even touching a terminal because you can use 
digital ways of identifying yourself like biometry, QR code, or a whole lot of other ways. Um, but it's also more than just payments. We see open banking as a form of actually opening up not just payments, but uh, information identity and exchanges of everything, because banks are actually really good at holding a really good, uh, well, a holistic profile of you, right? Not just your money, but your financial position. So your bank information, like your transaction histories, your credit worthiness, but also your identities or how old you are. So by allowing that access to be uh, accessed by someone else and their data to be exported in use cases, then you're really enabling a lot more use cases. What we can see, you could basically go, well, hey, bank knows how old I am when I'm buying alcohol, when I'm paying for that in the supermarket. I don't need to get a surprise to come and look at my ID by making that payment for my bank account. Bank mm. knows how old I am. That could be sized yet. So that's just an example of how the power of open banking could really be harnessed. Mm -hmm. And Steve, a perspective on, on open banking? Yeah, it's really in an interesting space in New Zealand. I mean, with the help of the likes of Will and Paymark, I mean, we opened uh, the API centre uh, back in 2019, which looked to standardise the APIs for both payment initiation and access to, to data or information. So we've been really good at building the standards and we're up to version 2.1. What we haven't been so good at is the partnering between the API providers and the banks and the third parties as the users. So... So that is the focus on uh, where we're at now in terms of how do we improve that partnering? Do we need accreditation regime to do that? How do we deal with liability, risk and consent, those sorts of things that then doesn't make it hard for the API providers and the third parties to work together. We also have MB's consumer data right, which is there being developed, which obviously going to start with banking, probably move to electricity and then beyond. So mm -hmm. there's this beautiful saying of, it all started with open banking, it moved quickly to open finance, to open data, now everyone talks open life in terms of when you put health and education uh, data in with that. So mm. yes, it is. there are payments elements in there, but there are also significant data elements in there. So how do we use this to drive and build what the government's been looking at is that whole digital economy. So mm. what we're really concentrating on is the work that we do within the API center with the providers and, and the third parties, making sure that the consumer data right doesn't override that and they fit together really nicely. Also, the digital ID trust framework, which is about to sort of roll out. How does that work with those two as well? Because open banking without digital ID is a bit clunky. So mm. therefore, are there common areas there, such as accreditation, that could work across all three? So fortunately, New Zealand's small enough. Uh, we can talk to each other. Uh, we're probably related and um, we actually can can work in terms of how they do actually fit together so that's mm -hmm. certainly my desire is to see a really good collaborative approach to this and mm -hmm. the electricity sector is starting the conversation as well already so we we are down the track we just need to see more solutions in market because there are so many cool use cases mm -hmm. i really like some of the ones that will help in terms of financial budgeting and so mm -hmm. there are good solutions overseas that say because i've seen your data hey your power bill's due on Thursday. I uh, see you don't get paid until next week. We'll pay that for you. And then you repay that over the next three paydays. Mm -hmm. That's a really good example of really making a difference in terms of how people deal with their money and how they run their lives. So, um, yeah, I get excited about uh, certainly the open banking opportunities, open data, and what solutions will occur both um, across the market. So mm. uh, we are getting there uh, and we are looking to how do we, how do we speed this up? Mm. And Rebecca, a perspective on, on open banking and its likely market impact? Uh, well, um, the way I see open banking in, is it's a package of processes and uh, frameworks. And so at what at the API Centre is doing with, with um, at Payments New Zealand, it, my understanding is it's, it's largely about the technical stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. Uh, where you're coming up with the APIs when, in which the, the data recipients um, and then the data holders, um, banks, i.e. banks and fintechs essentially, um, will operate together. Now, open banking, uh, given my experience in Australia, how it works there is it's, there's the ACCC, which is the equivalent of the Commerce Commission. They have responsibility for essentially the framework around that. So, Steve, you identified issues with liability and risk and accreditation. And so those are things that are 
necessary as that framework, but not the technical stuff. And so what I think would be an efficient way of doing it is that the CDR comes up with that side of things to make sure that the participants work within these um, clear uh, frameworks and to set objectives for how the, the standards and the APIs should be created, but let industry come up with those standards because industry knows how to do that best. Yeah. I know that um, with the API Centre, it's a series of bilateral arrangement, uh, bilateral arrangements, and I think there's that, and then there's also um, the fact that it, because there are no um, requ like stipulated requirements by a regulator, that we there are limitations in terms of data recipients being able to get the data that they need and then also having to forge relationships with each and every one of the data holders i.e., each of the banks and I think um, in the UK for instance my understanding is is that that it's an open API that's available on the open banking website and that a, a, a fintech for instance doesn't have to have a relationship with any of the, um, the, the banks involved they can just plug in with an open API I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but yeah, no, there's quite a um, arduous accreditation regime to go through to enable yeah. that to happen, and there's also a lot of aggregators out there that provide mm -hmm. that layer between the fintechs and the banks. So even the likes of Zero goes through that layer as well. So the industry yeah. is is working this year around those. Mm. What would accreditation look like? What would that liability framework look like? And mm. and hoping to shape what comes out with the CDR as well, so yeah. that they fit together really nicely, so we can get solutions to market. So that that's a clear uh, focus for the industry, both third parties and and the providers as well. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think we've we've hit up against time there. So um, I think that's been really fascinating to understand a little more about what's been happening in the New Zealand market and what is likely to happen uh, in the uh, months and years ahead. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, my uh, industry experts uh, on the in the discussion today. So Will, uh, Steve and Rebecca, thank you very much for uh, making the time to chat to me. And um, uh, I wish you all a very enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks. A pleasure, <laughs> Alex. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone and welcome to the panel. We're going to be talking about Buy Now Pay Later. My name's Kate Wilson. I'm Research Director and Deputy GM across Australia and New Zealand at RFI Group and I'm, I'm joined by a really great panel here today. Um, key Buy Now Pay Later providers been, been uh, sitting on this panel and we're going to be talking about the New Zealand market, some of the, the differences in New Zealand compared to the other markets, um, challenges that are facing Buy Now Pay Later more broadly and we're also going to talk a little bit about the future of Buy Now Pay Later. But before we get into it, I'll hand over to my panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Todd, let's start with you. Okay, so yeah, Todd Wackrow. I'm the uh, country manager for New Zealand for Zip. Uh, so quick background, uh, history in uh, digital marketing and tech startups and was an early stage employee for company PartPay, which is a Kiwi startup who launched with uh, several others back in the uh, mid-2017. And then we were acquired by Zip uh, and ASX listed by now pay later in late no, uh, November 2019. And yeah, just uh, been through a couple of roles there in growth and more recently into the country manager role. Great. And Mandy? Hi, um, I'm Mandy Tomlinson. So I'm um, currently the GM of Australasia for Layby. So I've been with the business uh, about 18 months now um, and, and similar to um, Todd, we went through the ASX in the middle of last year, um, so why not add another thing into the mix of COVID? Um, but I, um, my background is I'm a, a born and bred retailer, so I've been in, in the retail game for about sort of 18 years now, um, and worked for a majority of different businesses um, across, you know, the Just Group um, and Overland Footwear in, in particular, um, and sort of became fascinated in the concept of buy now pay later. I was sort of on the ground when it when it was released into the market and, and, and was very interested in, in what it was doing to revenue and, and customer adoption. So came over to the other side um, and are now, um, are now taking care of the revenue and the operations and performance for the Australasia market for Labor. 
And Chris? So Chris Lamas from Hum Group, where um, like everyone else listed in Australia, um, based in Auckland, looking after Australia and New Zealand um, revenue and product. Um, background uh, sounds quite similar in many ways, but um, data and digital um, with a heavy focus on loyalty and retail. Um, been in this organisation, been in HUM for about four years. Um, so before Buy Now Pay Later even really started. Um, and we do a range of products from, from credit cards to commercial leasing um, to Buy Now Pay Later. I'm really looking forward to getting into all the nuances and all the differences between um, Zip, Lay, Buy and HUM. But what I might start off with is just a little bit about the New Zealand market. Um, we're seeing within our own data at RFI Group some really significant growth in terms of uh, buy now, pay later usage. Um, our data actually suggests that, that New Zealand is neck and neck with Australia in terms of buy now, pay later adoption. So I know we always think of Australia as sort of the leading market, but um, I would suggest that New Zealand is, is up there as well. Um, what I would be really keen to get you your thoughts on to begin with is what problem do you think Buy Now Pay Later is solving that traditional providers or traditional products haven't solved? Why has Buy Now Pay Later been such a success story in New Zealand? Um, Chris, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, look, I think there's a bit of a misnomer here that um, it's solving a problem that that younger people are scared of credit. And, and they're actually not scared of, of credit. What they're scared of is interest mm -hmm. um, and the complexity that goes around interest, um, the way that banks have treated that. Um, and all of the fees and pile on that go along with that. They're also scared that are getting approved as a 25 year old with a $5,000 credit card limit. Um, and that if they spend that, they're in a whole lot of trouble. Whereas what Buy Now Pay Later does really clearly is gives them the credit they want without the interest, but also at a level that they can't get into trouble. So it might approve them for $300 or $500. And then we manage that really closely. So it solves that problem around how do they be savvy with their money? Because these are they are far more financially conservative than Gen X or boomers were. Um, they're far more savvy with what they want to do with their money. Um, but they also know that interest can be a debt trap and that's not what they want. I have been that 18 year old with a $5,000 credit card. I completely <laughs> understand that. that I may concern. have been as well, but I don't want to admit that. <laughs> uh, Mandy, I can see you nodding along there. Anything else that you would add? Yeah, look, I think, yeah, I think Chris nailed it. I think, you know, probably the only thing I would add, you know, what was what was also really interesting to see, you know, during, especially during the pandemic, which I know we're going to talk about is, um, you know, with the uncertainty of the economy, you saw also a, a lot of consumers start to use it as a cash flow management tool as well. So, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty in the market and, and different age groups and different demographic of customers have actually come on board. And I think it's it's also for them being about, you know, whilst they, you know, can, can pay for that product up front, it's actually, you know, feels a lot better and a little bit more comfortable to pay it off over a period. Um, you know, and I think the other probably key point is um, for, for merchants and, and, you know, for retailers, um, you know, buy now, pay later, you know, solved a, a pretty big issue, uh, which was the traditional lay by method uh, that was that was out in stores. And as a retailer, I can, uh, can give you some horror stories in regards to it. So I think, you know, for, you know, not only for consumers that had to wait, you know, a, a long period of time to, to get that product once they'd paid it off, but also for retailers who were having to manage that inventory in their back rooms. Um, but also, you know, generally that product was paid off at the end of the season uh, when product was, was discounted and then, you know, had to be refunded and sold back at a discounted price. So I think that erosion of margin as well by now pay later has been able to, you know, fill that gap in regards to helping those consumers manage it, but not in a way that that is difficult for the teams on the floor as well yeah all of our data really points to that idea of customers really like the management the budgeting element of buy now pay later and it's, it's not just solving that that credit need it's actually solving that need to manage my money better and control my money better um todd anything else that you'd add in terms of uh your perspective here no look, i think it's well covered but so it's a question for i think there is a bit of a narrative about these sort of irresponsible millennials coming in and getting into debt but they're actually really really smart and that they just, you know, it is a budgeting tool. It is about smoothing out the spikes in cash flow, but um, they're actually very well planned and, and use the, the tools that we provide in a very smart way. So I think, yeah, it's really just about, it is that budgeting tool and managing peaks and troughs. But I think we've all seen that it, um, it is really kind of responsibly used in general, um, which often is, you know, 
the media doesn't seem to like that angle as much, but I think that, you know, they're very smart about their money and they just see our, our products as a smart way to, to pay. Absolutely. The other point to, to make, and we can't really escape at the moment, the impact of 2020 and the pandemic. I'd be really keen to hear what you what you have seen probably around your, your own customer base in particular through 2020 and the impact that the pandemic has had on um, buy now, pay later usage in New Zealand and I guess um, e-commerce more broadly as well. Um, Todd, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think it, the, as you sort of touched on, the main driver was just this huge shift to e-commerce because there, there was no alternative. So I think we all set, saw a you know massive uplift in, in online shopping and, and for people that in the past may have been holding off that and then they had no choice. So whether that's your, your typical retail or through to grocery, you know, food and beverage, those categories that, that people may have sort of held back on, then all of a sudden they've been forced to do it and then found that, hey, this is actually pretty handy. So I think, uh, you know, for our industry, so, you know, given that we are very strong in e-commerce, I think that saw a lot of new customers introduced to, to buy now, pay later as a payment method. Um, and I think that saw, you know, saw a lot of new customers coming into the market, using the product, and then I think continuing to use it. Um, and the other piece, I suppose, is just, you know, with the, the tighter economic climate, I think more people that, that may have not needed a product like us or thought about it have also opened up and said, oh, actually, you know, budgeting and, and looking after my money's become a little bit more important than it might have been with that uncertainty. So I think a lot of people also there sort of were, you know, opened their eyes possibly to, to products they may not have thought they needed. And I think have, have come in and from, you know, all accounts sort of stayed with, stayed with us all as the pandemic has sort of flattened out a little bit in New Zealand. Yeah, Mandy, you, you made that point before about customers using buy now, pay later because of that budgeting element. How important do you think that has been throughout 2020 um, versus just something like people going online more often? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, Todd nailed that point. I think, you know, what, what we saw in our data it is in regards to the demographics of those customers and, and some of those, even those higher income earning brackets starting to adopt now to, to buy now, pay later. And again, I think it really came down to there being such uncertainty in, in the market. Um, you know, people felt, felt better about having more cash in their wallets for that little bit longer and therefore were managing that, that money in that way. And that was, that was huge, I think. You know, I think we saw something like Kiwis. We, we saw another 302,000 Kiwis um, during COVID shop online for the first time as well. And that, you know, was a huge adoption um, to using, you know, to using Buy Now, Pay Later. But I think probably the other thing that's been, you know, I guess a real positive that's come out of, you know, and I, I don't want to say post COVID because I think Melbourne's probably taught us we're not quite there yet, but, you know, post lockdown, even, even to see the growth in bricks and mortar has been really positive and, and quite encouraging for us, um, you know, and to see customers sort of flock back to support those stores as well has been really exciting. So I think, you know, tighter economic, um, you know, reality, but also the, you know, some discretionary income for, for some customers in regards to, you know, not, not traveling and, and working from home um, and looking at investing that back into local markets. And, and that's where we've also seen a bit of a spike. Chris, I'd actually be keen to hear from a hum perspective, especially since you go up to that larger value point. I'm, I'm imagining that throughout the pandemic, everyone's sitting at home wanting to buy new furniture um, that maybe has had a big impact for hum um, compared to the, the smaller buy now play later providers. It was really interesting. I remember when we all got excited to come back to the office after that first lockdown last March. And I remember walking around some stores and I went into a, um, a sofa store that sells reason, reasonably expensive sofas, you know, like $10,000 sofas. And the waiting list was four months already because everyone had realised their sofa was a bit crap because uh, I'd used it a lot more. But, but people weren't going, going in and buying cheap stuff they're buying quite expensive and I think you know to, to Mandy's point there was that displacement of, of travel um, but the interesting thing has been what's happened since then with with literally tens of billions of dollars of stimulus flowing in you've seen massive reduction in debt levels um, you've seen um, we're all sitting all of the buy now pay laters are sitting at, at lower um, bad debt rates than we've ever had um, customers are not using credit cards in the way they were um, so it's been a massive beneficiary for, for buy now, pay later. And as people um, have tried it and used it, they, they, they love it and they find it easier. And it's just become part of their financial tool set now. Yeah, I think given what we've seen over the last 
12 to 18 months, the, the point that customers actually have more money available to them than they ever have before savings balances are at a, are at a high and they still want to use buy now, pay later, that just proves it's not just about not liking credit. It's there's something else about this payment method that's really working for customers. There, there is, of course, that, that fun use case, which goes, um, my golf clubs didn't cost $1,500. They cost a quarter of that. Um, so, you know, there is some some management of, of expectations with partners, I think, that it does help with. The number one reason wives hold it out hiding purchases from their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so right. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about um, misconceptions around buy now, pay later and, and vulnerable customers as well in just a moment. But before we move on to that topic, I did want to get your opinions around um, the growth that all of you are seeing and, and the multiple markets that you're all in. Um, Todd, I might start with you. It kind of seems like Zip is, is taking over the world at the moment. There's this constant news about Zip going into new uh, markets every day. Um, how difficult is it to go into the, all of these new markets, which are all so different to um, to New Zealand or, or to Australia? Yeah, it's, it's definitely exciting. Hard, hard for me to keep up um, some weeks, but um, I think a lot of it is, is about that um, you know adoption and, and where the different markets are at with the maturity. So I think in New Zealand, um, as you said, I mean, Australia led the way, but I think New Zealand just rapidly caught right up. I think here we're arguably, I'd say, probably the most competitive market um, in, the, in, the, in the world, just about, given all the, the great businesses down here and the, uh, the fairly limited number of customers. But, um, you know, I think those new markets, it's really just still about uh, adoption and, and awareness. So you look at the US and the, the UK for us, it's really just, you know, people are only just coming to terms with, with this product. So I think for them, it's really just about, you know, awareness, education, and getting more people using it. So I think here, very mature, it's probably more about, you know, product innovation and expansion, where I think these new markets, it's really just a, you know, a massive land grab to just get people kind of aware of, of the core service. And we're seeing, you know, Australia, for example, for Zip has, has a number of products. They've got a shorter term account product. They've got a long-term finance. They've got business finance. But in the US, it's just all about a, you know, an instalment, a, a six-week instalment product, very single-minded because it's really about just going going deep with quite a clean single-minded product. And that, so it's really just, yeah, maturity um, piece is, is the differences between the markets. And then, um, Mandy, Chris, I might get your thoughts on, I think New Zealand and Australia and, and the UK are often seen as being very similar markets. And there's sort of an assumption that, what works in, especially in New Zealand and Australia, what works in one will work in the other. Um, to what extent do you agree with that? And what are the specific nuances that exist in New Zealand or the challenges that exist in New Zealand compared to some of those other markets you're in? Yeah, I think to Todd's point, I think, you know, obviously Australia kind of led the way around by now, pay later and New Zealand picked up relatively quickly. So I think we, we understand how the product works. I think, you know, merchants and retailers understand how to, how to drive it and how to talk to it and how to use it. I think, um, you know, the other markets have been more challenging in regards to you're not just educating those businesses about who you are, but also what the product is and how you use it. And, and that, that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, but in terms of New Zealand, and, you know, I think Todd kind of touched on it before, you know, our biggest challenge down here is obviously a relatively small market and a lot of competition here. So I think, you know, it's, it's how do we, you know, as businesses make sure that we continue to innovate and, and you know, offer a program that it provides, you know, loyalty to, to consumers because we are, you know, there, there, there's only a, so many consumers that we have um, in, in New Zealand. Um, and I think as well for, for merchants, it's about them really thinking about their product offering and how do they make sure it's not about, you know, just having five buy now, pay laters on your platform. It's actually really starting to be strategic and thinking about those different product offerings. And it's important to have choice, but how do you make sure that, you know, those are strategic and you're looking at different product offerings for your, for your consumers. So I think for us, it's how we continue to differentiate and, and what is a, a very crowded market at the moment. And just, just picking that up, the, the, the only thing I disagree with is I, I'm finding, a, I think Australia in many ways is more competitive than New Zealand. Um, and I think it's because it's at a it's slight, even though adoption in New Zealand is high, the maturity level of the product in Australia is, is higher. So we're starting to get to that round where retailers are starting to go, hey, should we be paying this much for this product? So there's, there's 
margin pressure, obviously, everyone nods, yes. Um, and, and, you know, you're also seeing customers now at kind of saturation, they've got enough buy now, pay later in their wallet. Um, so I think Mandy made a really good point around that loyalty and differentiation. And we're all playing with what we do on open loop with cards versus closed loop. Um, and so I think Australia is, is more, com more competitive because it's more probably just a little bit mature, but New Zealand, um, there's only 5 million people here. So it's, it's a small market with some pretty big players now. In it, and, and so you do get that competitive escalating. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see the, the trend as retailers stop seeing the incremental growth from having a buy now, pay later on their site that they used to, um, that we stop seeing our growth rates just astronomical growth rates that, that can't continue because everyone will have the product. So how do you then turn that into loyal customers? Um, and, and I think that will um, shake out the tree a little bit. Um, and I think they'll be a real positive thing because there's so many people, like there were 14 buy now, pay later companies entered into the market in Australia last year. Um, none of those are on this, on this call. Um, and, and I don't think they'll be on a call in a few years time because I don't think they'll survive. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I think there has to be, I mean, there is a natural ceiling in terms of adoption. And and to your point, I mean, both Australia and New Zealand are quite small markets. Um, it, it seems like there's a bit of a, a race to crack the US, but a lot more challenges there in terms of just the market itself, how big it is. So it's um, getting people familiar with the product as well. Um, I guess to pick up on some of the, the other points that you've been making going through, what I'd be really keen to get your thoughts on are what the biggest misconceptions about buy now pay later, I was sort of touched on some of them, and, and buy now pay later does obviously get quite a, 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 a I guess a rap, a bad rap in the in the media. Um, there is a lot of myths, I think, around buy now pay later. What do you think is the, the number one biggest misconception um, for, uh, I guess, for your service or, or for buy now pay later more generally? Uh, Chris, do you want to start? Um, sure. Um, look at. It's, it's not dissimilar to taxi drivers complaining about Uber back in the day that um, they weren't following regulation, they weren't doing things well, um, but customers loved it, right? And, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of traditional finance companies that are saying, we don't like buy now, pay later, there's too, many, there's too much arrears. And they quote that um, between, depends on the company, but say between 15 and 25% of customers pay a late fee. Well, on credit cards, 50% of customers pay interest. It's the same thing. Um, so, so already that's a, that's a better outcome. Um, and I think so that's one of the, the biggest preconceptions is that it's, it's got these secret fees that customers are paying when I think it's the most transparent product um, in financial services. Um, and the second one is, is that having more than one buy now, pay later is bad. Um, and because we go up to a higher limit, we actually um, do affordability once you get over $1,000. We look at people's bank statements, obviously with their permission. Um, and what we've found is a direct link between people having more than one buy now, pay later and their likelihood to pay us back. So it's actually an indicator to say they are a better credit risk because they understand the system and they know how to leverage it. Um, and, and it comes back to if you owe um, Zip, Layby and Hum $400, that's 1200 bucks. Most people have a credit card with $5,000 on it. I mean, we just need to be realistic about the numbers here. So those are the two big misconceptions I correct overnight, if I could. <laughs> Mandy, what are your biggest misconceptions? Oh, that's a tough gig to follow. I think, <laughs> um, look, I think Chris now that I think again, uh, probably just touching on the credit piece and, and the, you know, misconception that consumers have credit cards linked to their buy now, pay later accounts as well. You know, I know everyone will agree on the on the call but you know for labor in particular over 85 percent of our underlying cards are debit cards so again talks to that um you know shy away from interest bearing um but probably the other one that you know definitely is is in the market as well is probably around buy now pay later also you know driving people to buy product and things that they don't need um it's probably one that that i'll touch on and and there's no doubt that that buy now pay later, you know, you know, will help drive, you know, performance and and revenue. But I also think, you know, buy now pay later opens consumers and brands that are aspirational, you know, up to those consumers and allows them to, you know, look at product and and be open to brands that they they couldn't before. And I think one of the things you've really seen coming out of COVID is 
is consumers wanting to shop more mindfully and, and more locally. Um, and so, you know, we've seen a real benefit in regards to some of those more aspirational brands with higher price points and, and being able to target new customers. So I'd say that was a, that was a big one too. Yeah, that point about overspending, actually, we're starting to see that come through in our data as well. It wasn't there a couple of years ago. There was this idea of buy now, pay later helps me manage my money, gives me control. And because of the way buy now, pay later gets reported on in the media and the misconceptions around buy now, pay later customers who love buy now, pay later and who use it are now saying, I wouldn't recommend it to a friend because while I can manage it, I don't know if they could and it might they might not use it correctly. Um, so I think there's a, a real mindset shift that's happening even amongst a buy now, pay later customer. Yeah. Um, Todd, any other misconceptions that you would add there? Yeah, look, I mean, similar theme. I think it's probably just the, the buy now, pay later versus the, the credit card thing. You know, credit cards are in people's wallets and, and don't seem to, to get talked about much. But, you know, whilst there's the veil of people who pay them off every month and get the lordy points, you know, they're basically funded by people paying 20% plus compounding interest. And I think when you look at, you know, all our products, they're just designed in a fundamentally different way. You know, even aside from the no interest, we all have low, you know, pretty low default fees, low fee caps. As soon as you miss a payment, you can't keep shopping. You know, you miss a credit card bill. Hey, we'll just keep, we'll keep kind of adding the interest. You know, if you, you miss one payment, you can't shop anymore. You know, we all do hardship plans. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of us, if someone misses a payment and, and call us up, we'll talk to those customers and we'll put them on plans they can afford. So I, I just think our, you know, our products are just designed to, to, to generate kind of revenue in just a fundamentally different way that is as the customer at heart. So I, I think, and again, a lot of those narratives don't, don't tend to come out, but I think when you do actually dig into how these products work, they're not designed to get people in debt traps paying extra fees because if, if they're based on that, we'd never make any money because it's too lean. So I think that's just the, the big one there, which people seem to sort of, you know, struggle to connect with the more traditional finance companies, which really do make money by, you know, they want people to get, behind and late where we're just you know designed very differently i can tell you my pet peeve when whenever i see data about buy now pay later is the lack of comparison to traditional credit so saying x percentage of buy now pay later customers um have fallen behind on payments for what's what percentage of credit card holders are behind on their payments there's this, this sort of or oh, there's this percentage who who seem to be struggling with debt i'm, I'm sure there is a similar percentage on on credit cards and I think there's it's probably just a, a misalignment of what we should be worried about if we're if we're worried about people who are in financial hardship financial stress um, who don't have good financial literacy that is actually a separate problem that doesn't impact on um, or we shouldn't be impacted by the products that they're using it's about solving that problem for those people more specifically um, and I think um, just just on that I think um, one of the things Todd mentioned um, and, and I think we've all said it about, we've compared ourselves to each other's products. We all know each other's products really well. We all been through it. We've all got each other's products, I'm sure. We all know the flows. We know the hardship numbers. The numbers are all really similar, but the basis for where we all come from, and, and this is a, as a whole industry, is, is good customer outcomes. Um, we don't have a, a profit target to protect from every year. And so I think that's a really different mindset and I think over time, when this becomes more established, all of this noise will go away. Um, but the challenge for us is to keep that good customer outcomes to our to the fore. Um, and as an industry, we do work pretty collaboratively to make sure that that customers are looked after. Which brings me on to my next question, which is about um, vulnerable customers. And this obviously is something that's been spoken about a lot at the moment. I don't think I've been to a, a virtual conference lately where there hasn't been this question posed. Um, can you share anything around what you're doing in order to support vulnerable customers um, and just that idea of customers who are maybe stacking credit or struggling with credit more broadly? Um, how is How are your organisations approaching that? Do you want to start again, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. The, look, it, it is something we take really seriously um, uh, across all of our products. Um, and... Um, the first and foremost is to make sure that the, the money you're giving somebody, they can pay back. So we, um, like uh, all the buy now pay laters, well, most of the buy now pay laters in New Zealand do a, do a credit check. Um, and that means that we know what other debts they owe um, and that we're able to make a decision about their, their whole of, of life financial decision. Um, we also do a lot of data analytics in the background that, that even though we're not overtly asking them what they earn, you know, we, we, can, we can do a lot of assessment based on, on analytics 
tactics in the background. Um, uh, so we, we, we lend them a little bit of money, we learn from their behaviour. Um, but people's situations change and, and that's where people get into trouble. So you make a decision at a point of time, their life changes, you know, someone may lose a job, someone might get sick and, and that's what causes about 75% of hardships. Um, so as soon as we see that, um, we, like everyone else, we, we, you can't transact on the card if you miss a payment. But then it's about working with the customer and we have hardship teams working with the customers to get them through this because the ultimate thing we want to do is make sure that they're able to continue their financial life without having black marks on their files. Um, so we work really hard on that. Um, quite often the reality is um, on buy now, pay later, the amount owed is, is very small. Um, so it becomes quite an easy problem to solve. Um, so we, we work really closely with the, with the customers on that. But, so there is the decision up front, but life changes. So then it's about working with the customer. And then it's also saying, what are the at-risk groups? And we're working with um, a lot of budgeting services um, and budgeting advisors to, to try to work out which are the right and the, the wrong customers from their perspective as well, what they're seeing. And we're always looking to make improvements as a result of that feedback. Todd, what are you doing at Zip in order to support vulnerable customers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we're all, and I, and I do, I think, can pretty proudly say with the whole industry, I, I think we, we manage this really well. I, I guess to your point around that responsibility about financial wellness and financial education, I, I think for us, it's a, that's a massive focus that we do take that as a responsibility to help with that. I mean, I think a lot, you look at the core of where our products came from, it was to help you know, customers have better ways to pay that, that are more, you know, with their best interests at heart, as Chris said earlier. And I think for us, I think it, it extends beyond just having a product. And then can we help people learn how to manage their money better? You know, so from product features, you know, for Zip, we own a, a product called Pocketbook in, in Australia, which is essentially a, a budgeting app. And um, as opposed to just being a standalone thing, we're saying, how do we bring that into our product? So I think we as an industry and, and, and companies have that ability to, I think we do take it seriously to actually educate and help people understand their money better, you know, push into that financial wellness, that financial education. So I think that's something that you'll, I know for Zip, it's, it's a massive push now. I think as an industry, we'll push into that to actually say, hey, we can make a real positive impact here. Even things around credit scores, you know, until by now, pay later turn up, I didn't really know how to find my own credit score, or how it was made until I started working here. And so I think even things around that, you can educate people and, and set them up. Whereas, you know, it's a bit of a dark art, some of the stuff and people can get themselves in a lot of trouble early by making it, you know, a few missed bills or they've, they've moved uh, moved houses and, and, and missed the payment. So, yeah, I think for us, it's really about how can we uh, not just offer kind of payment services, but actually improve people's, you know, financial kind of capability and, and awareness around their finances moving forward. Absolutely. Mandy, anything else that you would add? Um, oh, look, I think, you know, they've both nailed it there. Probably, you know, for, for all three of us in, you know, reality, when we sum it up, you know, we're choosing as part of our payment, I guess, our customer flow to add friction into our our, um, you know, customer journey to ensure that we're doing this responsibly, um, you know, and that's a conscious choice that that we've all made um, to do those affordability checks. Um, you know, for, for Lay-By, you know, we, we lift limits based on good spending behavior. You know, we take, you know, Gen Z and millennial customers that are, that are starting with Buy Now, Pay Later, you know, traditionally some of them have never managed any form of credit before. You know, they don't even have a power bill or a phone bill to their name. So it's really important for us that, that you know, as, as the first that they're managing, that we set those responsibilities and help to educate them on how to manage it. Um, and then, you know, lift those limits as, as they prove that, you know, they can manage that and that we can support them. So I think, you know, it's a conscious decision that we're making to add that, that friction in and, and very similar to, um, you know, both the other buy now, pay later is that we have great hardship policies, you know, and we don't determine what hardship is. We, we work with our customer. Every, every customer has a, has a different story in regards to what hardship looks like. So we work on a case by case basis, you you know, around that, I think, you know, through COVID was a, you know, and Chris mentioned it in regards to reviewing limits and, and changing circumstances, 
you know, COVID in particular, the amount of consumers that we had contacting us and asking us to lower their limit, um, you know, and help them through the, those situations, you know, that was a tools down moment for us as a business to sit down and go, okay, this is where our consumers are at. And this is the situation that we're in. So what are we going to do about this? So, you know, we, we do take this extremely seriously and, and you know, we, we're a lifestyle enabler. Um, and so this is about making sure that, that we adjust that to ensure that we're looking after our, our consumers. Yeah, and picking up on that point you made about um, this being the first credit product that, that customers use and the fact that it's really sort of an education piece. Um, what we're seeing in our research at the moment, there's while there's this sort of idea that buy now, play now displaces credit, and I'll, I'll get all of your opinions on this in a moment, but our research actually suggests that because buy now, pay later is the first product that millennials use who traditionally haven't or haven't yet, yet used credit um, and are a bit scared of it, that buy now, pay later actually gives them confidence that they can make repayments and they can manage um, debt, which actually translates into just greater um, appetite for traditional credit as well. So they, it's a, a stepping stone. They feel comfortable um, moving on to a more traditional credit product. Um, what I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on is, is how buy now, pay later and traditional credit really play together. I think that idea of, buy now, pay later, displacing credit, in particular that that for the, the likes of Zip and Lay Buy at that lower end. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that you are taking share away from credit? Do you think that was a trend that was was already happening? What's the relationship between the two? Uh, Mandy, why don't we start with you on that one? Yeah, I think, look, all the trends and the and the stats point to, obviously, the decline in credit cards. So we've already spoken about the, you know, the adoption of debit cards onto buy now, pay later uh, accounts. Look, I think credit cards will always be there. I think, you know, the market and, and consumers are now, you know, more educated and more aware on, on what interest and, and what consequences come from those. They've grown up with mum and dad who've had, you know, student loans and large credit card debt and high mortgage rates. So they're just managing their money differently. Um, so I think, you know, what's been really interesting for us, and I'm sure, um, you know, Chris and Todd have seen it as well, is we're seeing the decline in credit cards across every age group um, and the increase of buy now, pay later across every age group. So there are certainly, you know, all the trends point, you know, in the right direction for us in regards to the adoption of buy now, pay later. But I, I don't think that, you know, credit cards are, are a thing of the past. I think it, it's just they're going to be managed and used in a different way. And, and, you know, that will be interesting to watch how that navigates over the next sort of five years. And Todd, do you think Zip is stealing share away from credit cards? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's no uh, I think there's no doubt in, in that. I think all, all the data is showing sort of people are shifting away. I mean, it's slightly different, probably take to Mandy, but it depends where you think you know traditional credit is. If traditional credit is product based on getting people paying twenty percent plus compounding interest, I think they will they won't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the day everyone starts paying their credit cards back in thirty days and banking the air points is the day the banks stop offering them. Right? That they're just not financially viable product. So um, I think it's definitely the switch, but I, I do think the industry, I think we're having a, you know, a positive change on the industry. You know, banks and some of these traditional finance products are just not going to be able to exist the way that they, they do because they, they don't have the customer's best interests at heart and, and they're designed to make money, uh, you know, in, in an opposite way to that. So I, I think you'll see that, um, you know, the industry will start to be disrupted. I think everyone will, will do better. I think the banks will do better. They're going to have to. But I think you're going to see an evolution of, of products that, you know, traditional credit, as far as what we see today, you know, into the future, I just really doubt there will be products that are constructed the same way because I think, you know, customers are, are proving with their, you know, the way they're flocking to our products and how much they're spending through our products that they are, they're choosing, uh, you know, they're choosing a different path. So I think it'll be really interesting how that does evolve from a broader industry point of view around what kind of credit becomes. Yeah, the, I, I think credit has to evolve as customers start to have different interactions with it. Um, Chris, the I guess you could argue that HUM has, I told just raised the point that what is a traditional credit product, but you could argue that HUM has both traditional credit products yeah. and buy now, pay later. Um, how do you see those two product sets complementing each other? Uh, look, I, I think the, the evolution's obvious to everyone that credit cards uh, will will stay important, but not the way they are now. And um, one of the things that buy now pay later does really well is takes a transaction and puts that into instalment payments. Um, that it's not necessarily good for your morning coffee, 
um, for your lunch um, or your weekly grocery shopping because, you know, it doesn't take long before your grocery shopping kind of looks a bit messy on buy now, pay later. Um, but so we, we actually launched a product um, last year in Australia called Bundle, which actually takes all of those purchases and bundles them into an installment plan. So your weekly spend um, and allows you to set different payment schedules for, for different things. And I think that's what credit cards still do really well is it takes all your everyday spend and allows you to cash flow manage that. And so it doesn't take a rocket science to work out that maybe there's a fusion between buy now, pay later and credit cards coming. Um, there's no doubt, as, as Todd said, that that compounding interest um, is a cause of concern. I'm looking forward to the day that, that that compounding interest is understood on mortgages and we start to actually get a better mortgage model because uh, that's where we all pay the most interest. Um, but the, the, the reality is banks are going to be challenged in their credit card books and credit cards, as you've seen in Australia, will evolve um, to meet this new need. And, and I think that's a great thing for customers. No interest mortgage sounds pretty good as well. It does sound pretty good. Eh? I'm trying to work out how to get me one of them. Chris can find that one, I think. But um, <laughs> love that, love that. Yeah. You can let me know when you find that one. I'm all yeah. in. Yeah, I need to be more than a $10 late fee. <laughs> <laughs> My final couple of questions here, and I'll keep this short because I know we're, we're running out of time, but... I wanted to ask you a little bit about the future of Buy Now, Pay Later. I think speaking to all of you today, we're all in agreement that Buy Now, Pay Later is, is here to stay and credit cards and the rest of the market are going to have to adapt based on what customers, are, what they want and, and how they're using Buy Now, Pay Later versus those um, the traditional, those those products that already have that, that are older, I guess we could say. Um, I guess the other thing that we've seen a lot of lately is obviously Buy Now, Pay Later going into new markets. So expansion uh, geographically, we're seeing new products being launched. We've seen Afterpay starting to launch um, more sort of traditional banking products. We're seeing lots of Buy Now, Pay Later providers launching physical cards. Uh, what I might end with is, is anything that you can share about what you are looking at over, say, the next 12 to 18 months, um, if you can share what you're, what you're working on as a, as a provider, um, but also just what you think that you'll, we'll see more of in the industry, if there's anything else that you think um, we can expect to see from Buy Now, Pay Later in the, the sort of near term, the, over the near future. Um, and Todd, I'll start, I'll start with you. You're obviously, Zip, obviously in lots of different markets, um, launching physical cards. Anything else you can share around what you're up to or, or any uh, predictions for the future of the industry? You can't, I didn't want to be first on this one, giving <laughs> so much away. But uh, no, look, I mean, I think it'd be fair to say that you know, product innovation, I think is going to be massive. I mean, you do look at, especially New Zealand, buy now, pay later kind of has quite, you know, between the guardrails are sort of, you know, six to kind of 10 weeks, same sort of price point. So I think, you know, across our business uh, with markets, you know, Aussie, US, UK, you know, UAE and Europe recently, we've got, you know, long-term finance products, short-term you know, business lending. So I think there'll be a real push around, you know, taking some of those core attributes and customer benefits from buy now, pay later and, and really extending them into new use cases. So, you know, higher ticket items or bigger purchases for customers. I think business lending, we've got Zip Business in Australia, which is a mix of both capital into businesses, but also a buy now, pay later kind of account for businesses. So I think the real push will be, um, you know, it's been a bit of a, that gold rush to go deep and, you know, with kind of retail, but I think you'll see you know, us and I'm sure a lot of, lot of the other players starting to expand our product offerings and what's made them, you know, such loved by, by customers into, to broader kind of verticals and different use cases. Yeah, definitely. I think there's still, while we talk about the, the market being mature, I think there's still a lot that could that could still happen and, and grow and evolve. Um, Mandy, anything you can share around what Laybuy is up to or, or predictions for the industry? Yeah, I think in terms of Laybuy, you, you know, you kind of nailed it um, before, you know, we've obviously launched a, 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 a um, tapless card, you know, um, not that long ago that launched in November. Um, you know, we are, you know, going gangbusters at the moment in the UK and, and we're about to hit the US market. So there's no doubt that there's still a lot of opportunity globally where you'll start to see buy now, pay later, you know, start to, we're not at the maturity. And isn't it funny we say maturity here, we've, we're only really been, been around for five or so years, but, um, you know, there's still a lot of opportunity there. So you'll see those key players, you know, play into those markets. Um, and there's no doubt there'll be more innovation in, in the market and, and, I think for us, you know, Labai in particular, 
we will definitely look at those other product options and we're continuing to listen to our cut consumers. They're telling us what they want and the way that they're spending. But I also think for us, it's really important that we also look after our existing product. I think there'll be a lot of noise over the next sort of 12 months in regards to regulation and what that's going to look like. You know, we we welcome that. You know, we're, we're well along that journey at, at this, this moment. But I think you know, one of the challenges that you have when you're in a really fast growing industry is it's really easy to move really fast and forget about what's behind you. Um, so I think for us in particular, looking after our existing business and, and supporting our, you know, our consumers and our merchants with our existing product is going to be just as important for us. So lots to come, um, but also making sure we continue to, to provide a, a level of service that's, that's excellent. Absolutely. And I think I said physical cards before when I obviously meant virtual cards, but I think that idea of um, the in-store is, is still really an untapped opportunity for Buy Now Play, which we kind of forget about sometimes with all of this oh. speak about going into new markets and launching brand new products. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the good news that's come out of, you know, the media and the announcements around, you know, the regulation of some of those merchant fees, you know, and, and PayWave in particular in New Zealand, we know we're at less than 70% penetration um, of PayWave here, you know, versus 99% in the other markets. So I think, you know, that will be a huge win for, for merchants and, and for consumers um, who want a, a really quick and, and easy transaction. So it's pretty exciting. Absolutely. Chris, final thoughts, uh, what's come up to, what can you predict we'll see happen in the industry coming in the next couple of years? Yeah, look, I think um, buy now, pay later in the business space, um, as has been mentioned, is, is the next frontier. We've launched, launched that product uh, in Australia and New Zealand and seen really quick take up because they're getting such a tough deal at the moment um, from, from the banks, right, who, who want them to, to fill out 50 forms and wait three weeks for something that we can do in four minutes. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a really interesting space. The um, in-store space is... You know, like every payment format should be available everywhere. And, and we've all launched cards recently that allow that to happen. Um, so I think that's a really good step forward. But I think it's going to be um, a really big push into data, customer understanding, relevant offers, loyalty. Um, I think that's going to be a big trend, like it has been for credit cards. The challenge will be doing it on the, the finer margins that exist in, in this product. Um, so you're going to see some really interesting innovation. And then, you know, we've got... You know, we've all knocked the banks a bit, but they're pretty, they're pretty smart, pretty smart banks, right? So they're going to come out fighting. And I think that's going to be going to be really fun to be part of um, as we really change the financial services industry. Um, and that's what I'm excited to see in 12 months that that I don't think there'll be all these startups. There's going to be a whole lot of mature organizations um, doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, we haven't even spoken about the banks or about loyalty programs, um, which are obviously two other really big key, key themes, but there's just so much happening in this space at the moment. We can't cover it all. <laughs> uh, we could literally talk about this all day, but um, I will wrap up there. Um, thank you so much for your time. That was a great panel. And um, for our viewers and listeners, enjoy the rest of the conference. Wow, uh, three fantastic panels there. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in for those last three sessions. Um, what we're going to do now is a quick afternoon tea break. Uh, we'll be getting back onto our uh, normal schedule or as close to it as possible by just having a short afternoon tea break. So we'll be back at 3.27. Uh, please go and visit the sponsor booths and keep networking as you are. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you back here after the afternoon tea break. See you soon.
Hey everyone, welcome back. Hopefully you got your cup of tea or cup of coffee, got your uh, bathroom break in. Uh, this next session is all about getting SMEs back on the recovery train. Uh, and first of all, we've got Kate Wilson, Deputy GM and Research Director, showing us some really important insights on what SMEs are needing uh, from their financial services providers to get them back on track. Um, following that uh, presentation, uh, we'll have Ahmed Khan, who is a GM for, Australia, for Asia for RFI Group, uh, he'll be doing a fireside chat with Adrian Church, uh, General Manager of Prosper, and Huay Manuel, uh, Business Development Manager from Prosper, talking about some of the new opportunities that are out there uh, for businesses uh, when it comes to, to business lending, but also some key trends that they're seeing as well. So on to the next session, which is all about business recovery. Uh, do enjoy. Please participate in the chat um, and enjoy the next session. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for dialing in to this presentation. I'm Kate Wilson, I'm Research Director and Deputy GM across both Australia and New Zealand. And I'm gonna be taking you through some of our latest research into SMEs in New Zealand. Um, this research is literally just out of field. Uh, survey we do twice a year talking to 500 SMEs in New Zealand. Um, and really what I wanted to talk about today is the changes that we're seeing in the market through the pandemic, but in particular, uh, through what I've called the pandemic recovery. So as we start to come out the other side of this, how are SMEs thinking and feeling? Um, what additional support do they need? How is that different to what we would have seen a couple of years ago? And then also importantly, how has the world changed for SMEs? Um, so what are the things that they really are thinking about um, and really need support with? Uh, so what I will start off with is just a bit of an overview in terms of what we're seeing around business sentiment at the moment, how SMEs are feeling in particular about the short term of their business so over the next 12 months, what are the key challenges that they're facing, and then I'll start to look at uh, how that is different compared to what we saw pre-pandemic, how their needs have changed, and then importantly, what are the opportunities that exist in terms of supporting SMEs uh, through this year, um, further into the future, uh, where are the areas where SMEs are really looking for that support and where does that give financial services providers perhaps an opportunity to stand out in terms of meeting uh, the needs or the changing needs uh, of SMEs. What I want to start off with is a, a bit of an overview around what we're seeing in terms of business sentiment. So business sentiment is something we've been tracking in New Zealand for a couple of years now. Um, we look at this both in terms of short term and longer term business sentiment. But for the sake of this presentation, I'll really be focused on what we're seeing in terms of short term sentiment. So what we're looking at here is the extent to which SMEs are not confident about the future of their business over the next 12 months. So you can really see uh, in May 2020, the extent to which we saw the pandemic really impacting quite significantly on business sentiment. Historically, business sentiment has started around 10%, maybe a little bit lower. Um, that basically doubled or almost or more than doubled when we went into the pandemic. So in May 20, uh, May 2020, we saw a jump up to one in five. Um, you could probably argue here as well that there's still a little bit of a, a higher rate of SMA saying they're not confident about the next 12 months. And we see that as well when we start to look at the percentage who are confident. So similarly, in May 2020, we saw quite a significant dip in terms of proportion of businesses confident about the future of their business over the next 12 months. That came back up. So we started to see a return to more positive business sentiment through uh, the back end of 2020 and into 2021. Um, but we're still a little bit lower than what we've seen historically. So both the proportion of SMEs who are highly confident um, is lower than it was pre-pandemic and similarly proportion who are not at all confident, higher than it was pre-pandemic. So I think what that probably tells us is while we are maybe thinking about post-pandemic and thinking about recovery, um, there is still lower sentiment or lower confidence than what we've seen historically in the market. So in terms of thinking about how to support SMEs, just being aware of the fact that SMEs are still a little bit uncertain or a little bit more uncertain compared to they would have been um, pre-pandemic. Um, and I'll go into in a little bit more detail what we're seeing around the types of concerns that SMEs have. But firstly, what are we seeing just in terms of uh, concern around just the pandemic in general? This question we, uh, we started looking at uh, in 2020, uh, trying to understand the key challenges, of the key issues that businesses are facing. Um, this is a verbatim question, so we allow SMEs to give us a range of different types of challenges. And, and this, I think, is quite a telling question in terms of how SMEs are thinking um, and what they really need support with. 
What we're looking at here is the extent to which SMEs are saying something explicitly referring to the pandemic. So any um, anytime COVID, COVID-19, coronavirus uh, was mentioned, that's what we're looking at here. So if you can imagine back in May 2020, uh, and probably if we looked at this in, in the end of March or into April, we would have seen an even higher proportion here. Uh, but in May 2020, the pandemic or the, the coronavirus was really the number one thing that SMEs were concerned about. Almost 40% of SMEs making some reference to the pandemic in terms of the, the number one challenge that their business is facing. That has dropped off, so it's dropped down to 20%. Uh, but we're still seeing that means one in five SMEs whose number one challenge or problem is the direct impacts of the pandemic. And we'll dig into what, what's sort of coming out here in terms of why are they referring to COVID-19. Um, it does in, uh, implicitly relate to those more direct impacts. So having to go into lockdown was a key one that we really saw coming through. Um, having to close my store, having um, less customers, um, those really direct impacts of what we're seeing here as I said, has come down, but there's still quite a, a high degree of sentiment um, around this. And if we start to expand this out and, and look at what else SMEs are, are worried about, what the other challenges that they're facing, um, there's what I would probably uh, term pandemic adjacent concerns coming through here. So they're not necessarily specifically related to, to COVID-19 or, or the pandemic, but I think they're, they're indirectly related to the pandemic and, and more so the longer term challenges that are, that are going to arise. Um, so if we put aside the, that 20% of SMEs who said the, the pandemic in general and lockdowns, um, sorry, the pandemic specifically and things like lockdowns and vaccinations, um, what else is it that, that SMEs are really concerned about? Things like the economy. So the fact that the economy has taken a hit. Loss of customers is another key one that really comes through. Um, the other one, I think that's a, an important one, especially in the New Zealand market. We see this in Australia a little bit, but probably not to the same extent. Um, but the, the skills shortage, so having a skill shortage, having a shortage of labour, the fact that borders are still closed, so not having that migration coming in, um, and technology, which I'm, I'm going to come back to as, as we go on, but the fact that the world has really changed, the resources that were available to SMEs in the past aren't there to the same extent, and at the same time, they're having to change and adapt and pivot. Um, so we're living in, in quite a different world. SMEs are, are very aware of that and are looking for that support, for that help around these types of things. These are the number one things that they're really worried about and concerned about at the moment. If we start to think about uh, how SMEs are adapting to, uh, to the new normal, what they're trying to do and what does um, what are the things that SMEs are looking at in terms of that post-pandemic, that recovery piece, uh, we are starting to see again some positive signs here in terms of what SMEs are looking to do in the next 12 months. So as I, as I said before, we have seen confidence increase, perhaps not quite back to pre-pandemic levels. We are seeing increased confidence in the market. Um, we are also starting to see an increase in SMEs who are looking to do things that I would say are related to, to growth. Um, so in particular, we're seeing quite significant increases in SMEs saying that they're looking to develop new products or services. Um, going back to that challenge around skill shortage, we're seeing SMEs increasingly saying they want to recruit new employees. Um, and then there's also a range of sort of other um, other things SMEs are trying to do in relation to technology. So adding sales channels, investing in emerging technology, investing in equipment and, and machinery. Um, so looking at a, a more growth focused mindset, um, this is, I, is what I would probably expect to change as we go through the next 12 months, assuming that SMEs continue to become more confident. If we look at an SME who is more confident about the future, they are typically more likely to be intending to do all of these things, and in particular, that developing new products and services. Um, so again, the confidence really connected to ideas around growth. Um, SMEs are starting to think, what do I need to do over the next 12 months? Um, how do I need to adapt my business? Where I think that creates an opportunity for financial services providers is around supporting SMEs with those needs. Um, what, we, what we can sort of consistently see in our data is the fact that SMEs have a bit of a pain point around the extent to which they believe that their uh, primary business bank is committed to their long-term growth. So if you haven't uh, been in an RFI presentation before you, or if you have been in an RFI presentation before, you'll be very familiar with these slides. If you haven't, um, I'll just talk you through how to read this one. But what we're looking at here is the extent to which SMEs uh, uh, agree or are satisfied with each of these statements on the right. We've plotted that along the vertical axis. So looking at average satisfaction with each of those, those attributes. 
And then along the horizontal, we've correlated that with overall satisfaction. So the idea here being anything on the far right hand side of this chart is something that's important for SMEs. It's important to, uh, to them in terms of driving their overall satisfaction. There are important elements to be considering um, and investing in and making sure they're right. Anything on the left hand side, um, less connected to driving satisfaction. Doesn't mean these things aren't important for other um, reasons. And for example, online and mobile banking capabilities, you can see they aren't as highly correlated with satisfaction, but they are very important in terms of driving um, acquisitions so or driving uh, drivers of choice. Uh, but if we're just focused on, on, on satisfaction, what are the pain points for SMEs? And I think you probably argue that all of these things we could maybe turn pain points given that we're not seeing anything above an eight out of 10 in terms of average satisfaction. But looking at sort of those, those key points, what are the things that are most important to driving satisfaction um, and where are SMEs less satisfied at the moment? Number one is around range of products to meet the business's needs. Um, I won't spend too much time in this presentation talking about access to lending. I think there's other, uh, other parts of the, the agenda today that, that really go into that in more detail. Um, but it is one of the things that we are seeing at the moment as SMEs are looking to grow and adapt and, and to recover, that access to finance does, of course, become more important. Um, this also, I think, just talks to the, the range of business, uh, of business banking products actually meeting the business's needs in terms of being sort of more flexible, uh, more adaptive to, to the SME's specific needs rather than just having a lot of different products. Uh, the one I really want to focus on here, though, is, is number 15, which is, again, highly correlated with satisfaction in an area where SMEs are less satisfied compared to these other elements. And that's commitment to the business's long term growth. So if we're thinking about the fact that SMEs are starting to become more confident about their future, they're starting to look at diversifying and looking at growth, um, but they don't necessarily see their primary business bank as being able to demonstrate commitment on that front. So they're, they're thinking about their primary business bank as, as not necessarily believing in or helping them um, to achieve that longer term growth. So that's something I think um, financial services providers should really be considering. How can you make sure that SMEs, that your current SME customers feel like you were there for them, feel like you're providing them with the tools and the services that they need to grow? And then likewise, from a, an acquisition standpoint, um, how can you demonstrate that to, to the market in order to bring um, business customers in? The other thing that's changed uh, quite a bit over the next, oh, sorry, over the last 12 months, uh, the last 18 months, um, is how SMEs are interacting with their providers. So I think um, channel strategy, the importance of digital has also changed quite a lot. We know that, of course, over the last uh, 18 months, we've seen really significant shifts around how um, SMEs and consumers are interacting with their banks. That rise of digital um, has really accelerated through the pandemic. And in New Zealand, we already do see quite a high rate of digital adoption, both for consumer and business. So I think digital has always been there in terms of an important element. Um, but we can expect that we're living in a new digital world. This is going to be more important going forward as well. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out is that this is something that isn't just important in terms of uh, how SMEs are interacting with their providers, um, but it's also something that SMEs are increasingly asking for. Um, so this is looking at what SMEs are, are asking for in terms of help managing the pandemic. Um, and increasingly over the last 12 months, we've seen SMEs saying, make it easier for me to, to complete tasks without visiting a branch. Um, you could probably argue that as we come out of the pandemic, this sort of channel related element, it becomes more important compared to just that sort of initial support or more direct support. Um, so now that I feel like I'm more in control and I don't need that direct support or I don't need um, uh, things like reduction in fees, um, I'm starting to think more about what do I want longer term. Uh, but make it easy for me to complete tasks without visiting a branch and make it easy for me to do things without going in and talking to a real person using digital services. Um, and to a lesser extent, also what we see in there is one in four SMEs saying, provide more support with using online or digital, uh, online or mobile banking services for the first time. So not just making it easier for me to do this um, digitally, but also support me in starting to do these things digitally. We're also increasingly seeing digital become a key driver of um, primary business bank switching. There's, there's two key points um, to point out here. One is that uh, despite the fact that SMEs are pretty happy with the way their, their businesses, sorry, the way their business bank has supported them through the pandemic, 
Um, they're pretty happy with their business bank in general. We haven't necessarily seen satisfaction changing too significantly over time, um, but we have seen switching intent going up. Uh, so the proportion of SMEs who are highly likely to switch their primary business bank in the next 12 months has gone up pretty consistently over the last couple of years. And if we look at the right-hand side of this slide, um, we're actually seeing better pricing and fees decline as a driver of switching, which is um, an interesting one. Generally, what we'd see and, and what we would probably always expect to see with a question like this is pricing and fees is a key driver of switching. So belief that I'm going to get better prices elsewhere or just a belief that I'm not getting a competitive price where I am at the moment, um, both a push and a pull factor in terms of switching. Um, but it has dropped off a little bit, which means there's something else happening in the market, which is driving up that increase in switching intent. Going back to what I mentioned before on that pain point around business growth, potentially there's something there just around SMEs not feeling like they're getting the support um, that they need. But if we're looking at these key drivers of business, uh, business bank switching, um, key push factors, uh, better online and mobile banking has also increased over time is now the, the second most important driver of switching. So in addition to SMEs saying, I want you to make it easier for me to do these things online, SMEs are also saying to a greater extent that they were in the past, I'm going to switch because I think I can get a better digital banking service elsewhere. Um, digital, as I said before, not as core to driving satisfaction, um, but as we can see here, very important in terms of both a retention piece, but also I think in terms of acquisition um, and, and the digi digital also becoming more hygiene over time. So something that SMEs are expecting, but also as you can see here, potentially differentiating on when they're looking at different providers as well. The other uh, final point I wanted to make are just around how SME needs are changing. So we've seen going through those previous slides, um, SMEs are still facing key challenges in terms of coming out of the other side of the pandemic, key challenges related to recovery and are looking for support um, in and longer term in terms of business growth as well. Um, they're looking for really good digital. They're, they're, they're choosing um, to switch based on digital to a greater extent, as well as asking for uh, the ability to do more things via digital services, digital banking services. The other thing that we're, that we're really seeing changing through the pandemic is the extent to which uh, customers are going online. So that um, shift to digital that I mentioned before isn't just happening for banking, of course, consumers shopping online to a greater extent. Um, also, I think expecting businesses to be online where they need them, when they need them. Um, so that pivot to online isn't something that just needs to be taken into consideration in terms of how you service SMEs, but also potentially in supporting SMEs to service their own customers online. Um, so talk through just a, a few slides here around what we're seeing both on the consumer side of things um, and on the merchant side of things as well. Um, so looking more specifically at, at a merchant um, SME here. First key change that we've seen is around uh, just payment behavior more broadly. And I'll talk about where e-commerce fits into this in just a moment. But if we just look at how customer consu or consumer uh, payment behavior has been changing over time, um, there's a couple of key things that we're, we're seeing change. One is the, the light blue line here, which is debit card usage or scheme debit card usage, which has been going up very consistently over time as more customers have, um, have access to debit cards as well. Um, the other thing that's really driving up that increase in scheme debit card usage is contactless. We saw really significant shifts in our data in terms of contactless card usage over the last, uh, or actually just between the, the six months between May 2020 and um, November 2020. Um, we saw the, the rate at which consumers uh, were using contactless cards, so frequency of usage, but also just a proportion of consumers who've ever used a contactless cards really jumping quite significantly. Um, and those numbers have held as well. So consumers are continuing to use contactless cards at a, a more frequent, a more frequently than they were uh, pre-pandemic. So that customer behavior is really here to stay and something that, that merchants are going to be thinking about in terms of an, an in-store piece. Um, but the other thing that we're seeing changing and again, uh, arguably a longer term change is declining cash usage. So consumers shifting away from cash, um, we saw a really significant drop in cash usage in our May 2020 data. So as we went into the pandemic, cash usage dropping off really, really significantly. Um, and you can see it hasn't really recovered either. So cash usage continues to be down. Um, some of that is customers going from using cash to using something like contactless cards because of greater acceptance perception around hygiene of using contactless and, and some of that messaging that we saw back in the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, some of it will also be because of the shift 
to e-commerce. So you're doing more things online, obviously not being able to, to pay for online purchases with cash. So some of that is a, a change in, um, in customer behavior in terms of where they're shopping as well. I think importantly, we also saw that same data point being reflected in our merchant research. So when we looked at what merchants were reporting in terms of where their customers were paying or how their customers were paying, um, we similarly saw a shift to both debit and, and credit um, away from FPOS, away from cash, and also a shift towards PayPal. And some of that will again be a reflection of the fact that customers were going online to a greater extent. So helping to boost up things like PayPal because more of these, these sales were online. Um, but also again, that shift away from cash and towards uh, those scheme, um, scheme debit cards and, and other sort of more um, and other um, payment methods. If we look more specifically at e-commerce, uh, we've seen the proportion of consumers who uh, make purchases online regularly or, or, or relatively frequently, um, that has been increasing over time um, and is very high when we look at that, uh, I was going to say younger customer group, but actually if you go all the way up to a 55 year old, um, so 55 and under, we're seeing the majority of consumers now saying that they use, uh, that they make purchases online at least once a week, lower amongst that 55 plus age group. Um, but it is, it is still increasing at a, at a uh, perhaps a, a bit of a slower um, rate. Um, but if we're looking at that under 55 group, um, over 60% now saying that they make purchases online in a typical month. Um, this is just domestic. We also do capture international, but just to focus on domestic here. Um, again, we can, can we can expect that this trend will continue. Um, this trend predates the pandemic, but the pandemic definitely helped to accelerate this shift towards e-commerce. Um, and similarly, when we start to look at that from a merchant perspective, we're seeing a significantly high proportion of merchants say that they accept card payments online. Um, the majority of merchants who do accept card payments online think it's going to be a bigger focus for them over the next 12 months. And if you look at SMEs who don't currently accept um, card payments online, we're seeing quite a high proportion intending to begin accepting card payments online in the next 12 months. Um, so a pivot towards an online store. And a lot of this is really being driven by the idea of customer demand. Customers are, are online, customers want to pay online, customers want to shop online. Um, so I need to be there as a merchant in order to capture those customers, to retain the customers that I already have, but also in terms of bringing in new customers. Um, so again, a, a bit of a step change in terms of how uh, customers or consumers are behaving, but also that impact on, on SMEs and on merchants. The other point I just wanted to, to end with here, just around um, that shift towards e-commerce. So we're seeing SMEs increasingly moving towards uh, e-commerce. We're seeing um, those who aren't online wanting to go online. There is a perception amongst SMEs who don't or merchants who don't accept car payments online um, that starting up an online store would be difficult, would be time consuming both in terms of the setup of the online store, but also in terms of the, the setup of the, the card um, acceptance facilities. Um, that is one of the key barriers that is stopping an SME who wants to start accepting card payments online from actually making that step. Um, it's too difficult, it's too time consuming. I would just need help with this or I need someone to help me with this. Um, when you go through to those who have already made this change to those who have got an e-commerce facility, Generally, they found the process of setting it up pretty easy, um, but also a lot of them, when we asked them why they considered it to be easy, said that they were, they got some form of help. So I had an expert helping me. I had an advisor. Um, I talked to someone who gave me uh, what I needed. Um, there was someone available to talk me through it. Um, so that's the experience that, that merchants are having when they actually do go through that process. But I think, again, going back to the point around supporting SMEs, supporting their longer term growth, um, I think we can expect or we really know that, that there's going to be a greater focus on e-commerce, there's going to be a greater focus on, um, on online stores, being able to position yourself or, or financial services providers more broadly, has been able to help uh, SMEs and merchants go online, set up e-commerce facilities um, to go through that pivot um, that I think uh, positions you well in terms of helping them with that, that longer term growth piece. Couple of uh, final um, points here, a couple of key takeaways to leave you with. We are seeing confidence return for SMEs. Um, we're not out of the woods just yet. There is still uh, lower confidence than we've seen pre-pandemic. Um, the other point here is that the direct impacts of the pandemic in terms of things like lockdowns are still a concern for SMEs, um, but also a lot of the other concerns that SMEs have at the moment are um, what I would call pandemic adjacent. So they're things like 
How am I going to pivot? How am I going to go to a more online world? How am I going to find the staff that I need? Um, how am I going to deal with a, a lack of customers or, or, or less um, a, a less favourable economy? Um, so maybe no, not as much need as, as what we would have seen in the past around directly talking to SMEs about the impacts of the pandemic and giving them that, that direct support, but SMEs still do need support and guidance around those other areas. Um, and I think more varied areas as well. So in some ways harder to, to deal with and harder to manage in terms of the varied types of support um, and varied concerns that SMEs have at the moment. Um, a positive, I think, is that SMEs are looking to grow and to diversify. I think that's something we can expect to become um, more, more prevalent in the market as uh, business confidence increases. We're seeing that in other markets as well, in market like Australia, going through sort of a similar point in time, being more um, post-pandemic than what we're seeing in other markets. Um, again, we see that coming through. SMEs are looking to grow. Um, they are looking for, for funding for that. But I think um, more broadly, there is a need to position financial services providers as able to help SMEs to achieve growth. Um, that's a key pain point that exists for SMEs at the moment. And then finally, the, finally, I think there is a need to support SMEs when it comes to digital. So there's, there's two points to this. One is um, making sure that SMEs have access to good digital business banking services, um, something that SMEs are asking for, uh, something that is, is increasingly driving switching. Um, but the other point here, I think, and, and maybe thinking more on the, on the merchant side of things here, but helping SMEs to pivot to a more digital world. So helping them to set up an online store, um, helping them to create a website, helping them to accept card payments online, um, all of those elements becoming more important in the current environment. And again, I think goes back to that idea of helping SMEs grow, helping SMEs to survive and thrive in this new uh, post-pandemic world. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, hopefully you've, you've put them in the chat, but otherwise do feel free to reach out to me directly as well. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, my name is John Lennox. I'm the manager of Sofa Doctor in Auckland. We're a mobile upholstery company we do work for most of the major retailers doing furniture repairs and servicing. Everything from upholstery to leather recolouring and leather restoration. The whole purpose of our company is to basically cover every square inch of New Zealand. We approached a financial advisor that we trust and we've used in the past and he strongly suggested we use Prosper. The reason why we didn't up using a bank and went to Prosper in the first place was based on time. Uh, for any small business owner, it's all about time management. We did approach a bank. Um, they wanted a business plan. Um, we approached Prosper. They were able to basically sort everything within 24 hours and that's what us small business owners need. We originally got our first loan to expand our company into Hamilton. We wanted to expand as quickly as we could and this gave us the facility to basically move forward. We were so happy with Prosper during the first process, we ended up using them again. This time was due to COVID. Uh, we were unsure of how COVID was going to affect our company moving forward. Um, we wanted to make sure we had enough cash flow. We were uncertain of how the market was going to react and how our business was going to react. The financial backing from Prosper gave our business peace of mind and gave our staff peace of mind so we could move forward during an incredibly difficult situation. It enabled our company to continue on the way we would have been if COVID never hit at all. The uncertainty of 2020 was pretty heavy for most small business owners. Luckily enough for us, through the support from Prosper, we've actually been able to employ more staff and cover more areas. Hello everyone, my name is Ahmed Khan. I'm the General Manager for RFI Group out of the Asia office. I've got the Prosper team here uh, speaking to them about the SME landscape in New Zealand. We'll be talking about all things related to the economic environment, what this means for SMEs and getting into what Prosper has been doing in the market, a very exciting topic to go through. Uh, I'll let the team introduce themselves and then before uh, and then after that, we'll kick off with the, the questions. Yeah, thanks Over for that. Guys. Thanks for that. Thanks, RFI, for having us at this event. I'm Adrian Bigby. I'm from Prosper. I'm the Managing Director for Prosper and have been here for two and a half years. Hi, I'm Huya and I'm Adrian's BDM, so I've been with the business also for two years. 
Okay, thank you both. Uh, great to speak to you both today. I'm very excited to get your thoughts on you know, what's happening in the market and also the specific topic areas around SMEs and, and their behaviours and kind of what we expect to see going forward you know, in a post-COVID environment. So I wanted to kick things off by firstly talking about the overarching story, which is the impact of COVID on SMEs. You know, what's, what do you see going forward in terms of the recovery and what are the key things that are going to need support on going forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And the pandemic, so it's been, it's been a crazy time when we sit back and think about it. It's been quite surreal. Uh, we were very fortunate as a business to help all of our customers through this time. Um, we, have, we were in a, a good position from a um, business cash position ourselves to be able to help them. So every customer of ours was sitting on the couch, the same as ours. So in the, in the peak of the pandemic, we had a good seven, eight weeks that we couldn't work, but neither could our customers. And that's our core business. So we don't do mortgages, we don't do investment, we just do small business lending, that's what we do. So every single one of our customers through this time that couldn't pay, that needed deferrals, that needed their terms pushed out and everything, we, we, were, unable to, we were able to do, which was awesome. Um, and that was really exciting to be able to come through that. And what we've seen after going through that is our customers have come back online very fast. So small businesses have, have managed to get back to business. The um, COVID experience in New Zealand has been unique compared to the rest of the world, as we know, and they were managed to get back to business. And really since October last year, we have been in a position to continue to help customers lend. We didn't stop lending through the pandemic. We did continue to lend, but really it was the confidence and businesses weren't looking for lending because they were just looking at surviving during that time. But what we've seen is they, since October, they've come back online and they've come back online very fast. So what they're looking for for support is, um, well, they're looking for funding from us. We can see month on month growth and what they're doing. Um, and it's not just for cash flow, it's for growth opportunities. And we'll talk about some scenarios later on. But interestingly, we also do a regular survey. We do a pulse survey with, our, with small businesses, not just our customers. We do a, a nationwide one. And we do it, we've just done one with YouGov that was just published at the end of May. And in that, so the, the, um, during COVID, we had, a, I'm just reading some stats now, we had 45% of our small businesses or these small businesses sought advice from other, other businesses and other sources. So they were always looking for support. So that's what they were looking for. And then during that time, what they really found was that community support. So I think we have all been focused on shopping local and being local and, and um, doing that and really making it very New Zealand. And we really saw that come out in our survey and from the, the feedback that we've had from our customers. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's really a, a positive story at the moment in many ways. I know that in 2020, things were in the doldrums in many ways, but it's, uh, it is exciting to see things starting to pick up and uh, you know, move forward a bit in terms of um, the economic environment and, and SMEs as well. I guess as a follow-up to that question, in terms of the, the various sectors that you see out there, where do you kind of see more growth at the moment? And you mentioned that you know, growth has been picking up since the uh, back end of last year, but are there any kind of major differentials across industries that you're seeing in terms of activity? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all seeing it when we look at all the economist updates and lender updates that are happening in the, in the economy. Um, but absolutely, there's some ones that have come on, online very fast, much more than others. So, and they're really in the, um, the fast industries are the, the construction, so builders, people that are actually been sitting at home looking at their house and wanting to put in a spa pool or have something else or a new office or something at home. So we're seeing those come online very fast. Um, again, Huya will talk to some scenarios, but then the ones that are probably lagging are the tourism industry. So we have seen some of those have been a bit slower about, about coming back to us for lending. Um, but again, they are coming back in. So we are seeing them now. We look at, so the way that we lend, we look at real-time data. So we can actually look at the performance and the behaviours of businesses and see what they're doing. Um, and we, we can, when we're looking at those businesses, we can actually see what they're doing. So Huya, do you want to talk about some of the deals that we're seeing? Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually, I looked at our, our latest settlements, actually, and I went through and um, just looked at some of the different um, businesses that are coming in based on our settlements. Uh, so I'm just going to yell out some of those industries. So we've got um, people in audiovisual, a film props maker, a takeaway pizza store, an interior designer, um, a large plumbing supplier, a small cafe in the suburbs, um, a commercial installation business, um, an IT business that work in education, we had an HR business come into us for funding also. 
Um, our windscreen guy, like your local windscreen guy, has come in um, to purchase um, materials and, and pay his suppliers. Uh, we've had a huge transport logistics business, so that, that business has over 100 um, trucks in its fleet. Um, a seafood exporter, carpenter, a scaffolding business, and a locksmith that owns four different stores. So that's just a range of some of our settlements that I've, I've looked at and gone down. So we're seeing um, loads of business come in for funding. Um, and, you know, talking to hospitality where some other lenders might find or think that it's high risk, we, we don't really look at our business like that. We look at every business individually and um, we talk to it later. I suppose we'll, we'll end up talking to it. But... Um, our um, credit decision engine and our API, um, it, you know, our technology and all that helps us use real-time data uh, to be able to look at each business individually and not kind of um, limit them because of a particular industry that um, everyone might think is, is a high risk or, or not, um, not a safe one to lend to. Cool. I mean, that topic of, uh, around um, the use of data and really... You know, non-conventional data and, and on-the-ground understanding of businesses, I think, is really important. And, and that's where I think Prosper's got a lot of advantages versus, you know, some of the bigger banks because you're on the ground floor, you're looking at different sets of data, you're speaking to customers more directly. And it seems like you've got more kind of intimate relationships with customers, which I think is, is really critical in terms of the current period where SMEs are, are moving on from a period of struggle towards... I guess, uh, a recovery uh, in their activity. I mean, related to that, and, and I wanted to I guess, look forward and, and think about business behaviour. We know that from some of our RFI statistics, we are seeing changes in the way SMEs are behaving, especially with regard to digital behaviours. A lot of them are using digital tools a lot more often. Uh, they're reliant not just on that from banks, but also from non-banks as well, like really keen to use data, digital tools in order to do their business in a quicker and easier manner. So I wanted to get your both of your thoughts on that. You know, what sorts of behaviours are you seeing shifting in the post-pandemic world for, for businesses? And, and which one of those do you think will kind of continue on? Which ones were, were more temporary in nature in your view? Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think the digital adoption is, it's not a new thing. So this was already happening pre-pandemic. So people are, you know, it's how we how we look at anything that we look to buy. So whether people were before buying online or just researching and then going and buying it at a store or, you know, then going to the bank. But I think most of the work that we do today as a, as a society, we do online. So I think that was already happening. But what I think the pandemic had is really speed that up. So where, where it might have been happening before it, I don't know the percentages, but say 40%, we might be at 80% today where people are more and more confident about, um, about buying online, shopping online, lending online, and that trust factor. So there's a lot of trust in you know, our business. So we, we're a digital online lender, but we've done over $2 billion worth of lending. So that's with Australia and New Zealand together. So that's a lot of lending and a lot of small businesses when our average loan size is only about 30, 35,000. So we've touched a lot of business and, and have worked with them. And the way that we lend, we, we do it all digitally. So we, we access the, we look at the client's um, bank account. We have a digital credit decision or engine that will make that decision. We do the AML online. So everything is done online, which enables us to make really quick decisions and, and um, go back to the client really fast. So I think that adoption and just look at our own behavior. You know, how many people went when we were all on our cash the supermarket, we did it all online and you see couriers a lot more nowadays delivering wine and food and everything that we do we do it online so it's extraordinary so I think yeah. it's just sped it up I think it's sped up those requirements yeah I'll, I'll add to that too and I mean when we look at um, our data so you know Auckland's had four level three lockdowns there was the original one and then three snap lockdowns later um, so when we look at the business that we've been able to help through that time in terms of um, assessing the, the business um, and their sales with a, you know, and working out whether we can lend to them. Um, there's been four level three lockdowns. Um, when they come back online, we could see looking back over the 12 months, um, for the first level three lockdown business, we're trading at about 50% capacity. And then when we look at the three snap lockdowns, we can see that that business has been able to figure out how to get their product out to more people regardless of 
the level of lockdown, and we can see that they were trading at 85 to 90 percent capacity in the second, third, and fourth um, SNAP lockdowns. So whether they invested in their business and partnered with other business to get their products out there, um, you know, to more people, or they went online and organised click and collects, or they renovated their business so they could have a little window shop at the front. Um, to serve customers without having people enter their store, you know, whatever it was. It's, it's amazing. And we can see that in that data. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting to look at those case studies of specific examples of how businesses adapted. I know we, we talk about sort of broad trends in the market in terms of, you know, e-commerce and, and more businesses kind of trying to go direct to customers throughout that, uh, through that e-commerce model. But um, yeah, interesting, really interesting to get your thoughts on that. Um, and I guess, I guess in, in terms of thinking through this, in terms of Prosper more specifically, everyone's had to adapt and, and you know, drive through this period where, of lots of changes into, in, in terms of the uh, economic environment. Before the pandemic, from a, from a lender's perspective, and especially one that lends online and, and to, to SMEs, there's a lot of talk about whether you know, a business like Prosper would be able to, to deliver and, and sustain through a period of an economic downturn. I think that was a real test of your business model. And it seems like you've kind of thrived and, and, and managed to go through that period really well. So I wanted to explore, like, what are the key reasons behind that? What do you think was behind your ability and capabilities in terms of getting through this uh, quite a, a tough period over the last couple of years? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. I'll go first, Hilia. Um, yeah. Whether there was questions whether we could survive or get through it, I don't know. I don't know. that. <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> I think a lot of us, I mean, that was a scary period. So going through the actual lockdown, I think there was a lot of businesses that were, um, you know, including our customers that didn't know the future. So I think it was a scary period for everyone. But thankfully, as a business, Prosper was in a position that we, we had a good cash position to be able to get through it. We worked with, and I'll, I'll let who you talk about more of the um, internal and the internal perspective on how we got through it. But we were in a position that we could financially afford to work with every customer. So when you when you put a customer on deferral or interest only or whatever you do to their payments, that has a capital implication to the business. So we were in a strong position to be able to get through that and work with every single customer, and we did. So the the feedback that we've had from customers is just extraordinary. Um, and then coming out of that, so Prosper Prosper was founded, we started because of the, the lack of um, ability for people in small businesses to get lending. So that was a pre-pandemic need and it's a post-pandemic need. So we, our customers are still looking for lending and traditional lenders in these kind of periods, I've been through the GFC as well, but traditional lenders going through a cycle tend to get quite at risk averse and they just batten down the hatches and we all know what's happening in the housing market. So that's just gone crazy and people are focused on that. Traditional lenders are focused on that, as are a lot of advisors. So these small businesses are looking for funding to be able to grow, survive, you know, triple their businesses in some cases. You just mentioned the um, digitization as we discussed that. So it made me think of one of our customers that we had. And this was really just coming out of the pandemic, coming out of the lockdown. So it would have been October, November. This is a, um, a retail provider in one of the tourist towns. So a very, very one of our big tourist towns. And they were, you know, there's no tourists, but they were really struggling. So they came to us, they invested $100,000 to go online, and now they're global. So they're selling their goods online globally because they pivoted, kind of a better word. I know we all hate that after this <laughs> last year, but they managed to do that. So that need hasn't gone away. That need was there pre-pandemic, and that need is, is um, much more, more so now, post-pandemic. So, Hedy, do you want to talk about what we did as a business internally? Yeah, definitely. I, I really, um, I mean, you touched on it. We had the, the cash, the, the great cash position to be able to actually help every single customer uh, that come into us that needed to defer their payments or, um, you know, uh, reduce their payments for a certain amount of time. Um, but for me in sales, it was really interesting because, um, you know, obviously for a time being, we weren't doing any sales, but we were trained and we picked up the phone and we talked to every single customer that we had. So that was amazing too. So we got trained in, in that space and also found out about our policy with regard to being able to help our customers when they get into a position where they might need to reduce their payments or defer their payments. Um, and our policy in that sense was already excellent um, 
excellent beforehand. So it was great to be able to talk to business owners to be able to let them know how we could help them. And our whole business did it. Um, from my perspective as well, uh, when I look at our executive team and I talk about Adrian and also our, our founders um, and everyone in our executive, they were picking up the phone and they were talking directly to our partners and also to customers, which was brilliant. Um, and they all, um, in terms of our HR team and, and again, the executive, um, they communicated to all of us, us, the whole staff. We had weekly updates. We could ask the CEO um, and our managers anything. Um, and they just kept us in the loop with all the decisions that the business was making. Um, so I think that gave us confidence within the business that, um, that we were really being looked after and, and kept us all um, connected as well, which helped, um, I suppose, staff morale through the whole period when we didn't know or no one knew what was going to happen or, or how we were going to come out of it. So I think those things are brilliant from a um, business perspective. Yeah. Yeah, no, really interesting to hear those, um, I guess, uh, internal developments. And, and yeah, I can see why, you know, being positive through that period and the companies that have come out stronger were the ones that remained positive and, and really invested in their staff and in their customers as well and, uh, and looking positive now and as things recover. I guess on the topic of uh, recovery again, but then and, and, and forward looking as well, I'm trying to be, you know, look, look towards the future in terms of innovation, in terms of um, lending and online lending particularly. I think that you, you raised the point earlier about, you know, there's still a lot of aversion to lending to small businesses amongst the, the traditional lenders. And, you know, I was looking at some reserve bank statistics around proportion of businesses that have been rejected for credit or, or feel like they can't get access to financing. They're still very high and maybe even increased during the, the pandemic period. Um, and of course, we know that businesses are looking for things like quick turnaround times and a, a really seamless experience when it comes to, to online lending. I wanted to get your thoughts on that topic around you know, where do you think the innovation is going to come from in terms of SME lending? Uh, is it around the application experience? Is it around turnaround times? Is it around the, the channel experience customers have? What, what do you think is, is going to turn out? Um, I think the innovation, I think that's where our business came from. So, you know, you talk about the, the high decline rates and it, and it is just a fact. It's, it's just not the, the traditional bank's core business and, and their core expertise. So our founder story, so where we actually came from, so we're nine years old in Australia, so two and a half years old in New Zealand. Um, and our co-founders are still in the business. So our CEO, Greg, and um, our CFO, uh, Chief Revenue Officer, actually, um, Bo. So both co-founders, they were both business owners. They were both trying to find funding for their business. Um, at that time, they were they were early 30s. Um, and we've actually got some stats from our from our survey talking about you know, younger, younger, younger business owners that may not have security, may not have houses trying to get business, business lending. And we know that's tough. We hear it all the time. Um, so the younger businesses, if they haven't got a security or they haven't got a house to put up or a second mortgage or a caveat, it's difficult to get unsecured lending. And that's essentially what we do. So they were looking for funding, um, couldn't find it. So one of them was importing clothing from overseas and selling it in Australia. And the other one was an equipment and looking for funding and they just couldn't, they'd struggled and they just went, there's got to be a better way to do this. So they got together and they got together with some investors and set up Prosper. And as I said, we've now done over $2 billion with the lending. So we're all online, we're all digital, we're all real time. So essentially we can have a business that can come into us and they're time poor, as you've said. So they can come into us and within 10 minutes, we can tell them whether we can lend to them or not. We can tell them how much we can lend them. And then within 24 hours, we can draw that down. So we do digital documents, we send that to them and within 24 hours, but often same day. So then the feedback that we have from customers is like, oh my goodness, like they're just flabbergasted with what, what they can see. Um, I come out of mortgages, Hui and I were both in mortgages before, prior to that I was in insurance and I've never seen tools. And that's, that's really why I came over to Prosper due to our technology and ability to make these decisions and to help these customers. So our innovation as a business is why we're here, but also future innovation is really about listening to those customers. Because we're a fintech, we're quite nimble and we can move based on customers' needs. So in, in New Zealand, we have a small business loan. We, we were um, fortunate enough to get access to the government guarantee scheme, which has enabled us to be able to reach more lenders. So we've, as I said, we've had that month-on-month -month growth, but a lot of that has also been under the government guarantee scheme. 
And it's helped us to identify a whole segment of business that we weren't reaching before. So this is the larger loan sizes. We lend from, from 5,000 up to 300,000 in New Zealand. And then 70% of those customers come back again for more funding because they, they have a great experience and we work with them on their businesses. Um, so that innovation for us is really around evolving our business based on their needs. Um, we, we as business are looking at line of credit and other tool, other products that we can bring here, which is really what they're looking for. I think in some of your research that we've done with RFI, it's about flexibility. It's about you know people being able to own their own their own destiny when it comes to managing their accounts and their lending. So that's what they're looking for. So that's what we do. Yeah, interesting point around the customer expectations around this. I think the what we see from our research is we, we know that businesses and SMEs are very the owners are very busy and the, the staff are always busy. And they don't really want to be thinking about banking and, and finance all the time. It just needs to be a, almost like a seamless process in terms of how you get access to financing, how you do your banking. So, yeah, I think you're really in the right direction in terms of uh, making things quicker, making things more seamless and part of their sort of everyday workings and, and making it so that they don't even need to dedicate much time to think of uh, think about financing and, and banking. Uh, and you, you kind of touched on this in terms of uh, the use of data. We were talking about this earlier in terms of how Prosper especially utilises customer data in order to, to tap into segments of businesses that uh, perhaps not reached by traditional institutions. So I wanted to explore that topic a bit more uh, and get your thoughts on the, how do you look at data, uh, what sort of customer data you tend to look at, uh, and then when it comes to your credit decisioning as well, I guess you can kind of link the two together. How do you, um, how do you look at that the whole model and, and what sets you apart there? It'd be interesting to, to get a perspective on that. Yeah. Who do you, do you want to talk about the, um, the credit decision engine on that and what the yeah. process is? Yeah. And I mean, Adrian touched on it before. We come from um, mortgages and also I suppose most, um, well, anyone that's not a fintech, you know, still have very, quite manual processes in terms of assessing. Uh, when we talk about us, we've lent $2 billion and it's tens of thousands of business customers. Um, we've got all that data. So we've got the range of data for all these businesses that come in to apply for lending. We provide the funding and then we get their um, payment performance um, information. All of that data stores into the credit decision engine. So. It's all real time. It's updated per day, per every settlement, per every payment that comes back in. So that wealth of data is what helps us decide um, who we lend to and who we can lend to um, within our credit decision engine. So um, it takes into account 450 different data points. Um, it's very quick in terms of it can populate a decision, a risk-based decision, for a business that we um, that we're doing a, an application for, it populates the um, the decision in, in basically fifteen seconds. Um, and in terms of our, um, you know, coming out of this side and looking at our book performance, it makes the right decision. So um, I was touching on Adrian and I coming from mortgages, going, and I, and it was me as a skeptic, going, oh, how does this credit decision engine know? You know, how does it know? But it's all data. It's non-biased. It's doesn't matter if it's had a, you know, it's not dependent on whether it's had a bad night or a bad day or had sleep or no sleep or, you know, or anything like that. It's all data driven. Um, and then we've got credit managers who come over the top and do sanity checks and that we can work through and, um, and, and just double check um, that credit decision engine, I suppose, and, and tweak a few things. But instead of a credit manager sitting there for maybe two hours doing an assessment, this populates an answer in 15 seconds, risk rating and pricing, and then our credit um, managers really only have to spend 10, 15 minutes on it to um, just do that sanity check and get the offer out to the customer. So um, so it's scalable. We can get 10 applications in state or 100 applications in state, and we can decision them within 24 hours um, all the time. Amazing. No, that's, and, and that's that, very, sorry, go on. Sorry, and that enables us to help more customers. So we have a risk-based pricing model and that really enables us to say yes more often. So we have a very high approval rate. So our approval rate sits up in the early 70s and really when, when we've got an approval with a customer, over 85% of the time, they, they convert to settlement. So they're very high percentages because we actually know what businesses want and what they need. 
Um, and then we, we will only lend to them what they can afford, and that, which is why we look at that individual business. Yeah, that's a, a couple of very interesting points which I want to go into a bit more. And I think we, we, we were talking about this before around, I guess, the balance between that human touch versus technology and, and doing things online. Obviously, you being an online only lender, um, that's your primary channel of acquisition and interaction. But then I heard some of you talking about speaking to real customers and, and having a real person behind the scenes making some of the decisions as well. How do you see that kind of developing going forward? I mean, there's lots of talk about AI and AI being, you know, taking over all that jobs and that sort of conversation. I still think there's a big place for the human touch. Um, what's your perspective on that topic in terms of how you, I mean, it, with regard to your business model, but also in general, oh, no. the balance between human and, and data and, and online? I agree, absolutely. And I mean, I, I don't talk from Australia and New Zealand point of view, but we love people. You know what we do and what how we do business, how we talk to people, we we interact with people and we love that. It's interesting that you you ask that one. So I've just come back from Sydney. I've just been over there on a um, on a leadership strategy course or, or session, and we were talking about this exactly. So we, yeah, we're online, but for, for we do have a person that still talks to the customer. We still talk them through the contract. We still talk them through what we can you know afford to lend them and what they can borrow. Um, but we are, we're increasingly looking at tools, and again, you're talking about innovation, but what, to be able to do a straight through process, so without take, with taking that person out, but there'll always be a need for that person. And for us, that's not taking people out, that's, get, that's actually giving us more scale. Um, and we really see that as in the, you know, maybe you've got someone that just wants to borrow 10,000 or 25,000, so it won't be the 300,000 customer that wants to talk to someone and that they have a lot, a lot more high touch um, process. It'll be the, the smaller customer that maybe that's all they're looking for over a short term. Our loan terms only go out to 24 months in New Zealand We've, and on average it's about 12 months. So if you've got someone looking for 10,000 or 20,000 of a six month term or a 12 month term, they're probably happy to go through straight online. Um, particularly existing customers. As I said, 70% of our customers do come back for more lending. We nurture them and we work with them. So maybe they've already been in the business for 12 months and they need a top up and they'll be happy to go through online. So we're working through that now. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I just want to add a couple of things to that too. Yeah. Um, so in terms of scalability, um, in terms of AI versus human contact, um, I mean, every lender that's going to see this knows that timeframes have blown out in, in every business. So, so we don't get that because of the technology. Um, and so what happens is instead of us having to plug gaps in the front because the, the process is delayed, we've got other people in the back. So there's a whole range of IT engineers that have to keep our CDE running and, and build the new technology and keep all that going. So instead of filling gaps, we're actually employing a whole lot of people on the other side. And also in our marketing, our marketing second to none. Um, and, um, you know, I, I so we, we just employ people in different areas and every single one of our customers can actually get a dedicated um, relationship manager. So no customer is going to ring and say they can't get in touch with Prosper to find out what's happening. You know, they need relief or anything like that because they've got relationship managers. So that's a whole team of people that we employ that maybe we wouldn't have the resource to do. So if we're plugging holes in the front without the seamless technology. Um, and just one other thing about Prosper, which is quite amazing. Um, so generally phone sales, people don't like their staff to stay on the phone too long because it means you're not talking to enough people. But um, we just had an award for someone the other day and it was the number of hours that that person spent on the phone talking to customers. So it was, it was unreal. So it's like that encouragement to spend the time and get to know the customers and go through the bits and just, so they have their, um, that, that's a measure for our, for our salespeople to spend that time on the phone and actually get to know that customer properly, yeah, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point. I think it, it comes back to the, the I guess, the, broad, the broader point here, which is businesses and, and customers still need that human touch and they need just to know that there's a person behind the, the, the screen. And I mean, we've seen this in, in our broader research as well, as much as you kind of push for digital, um, there's always an underlying need for a relationship manager, advice and, and flexibility in the conversations, which I think you, you miss out if you've got a, 
a very straight through kind of process without the, the channel flexibility. Uh, just a, a point on that and, and, a, and a question for you guys on that is, um, you know, how do you think through those customer relationships? Like what do you typically see your customers wanting to talk about when it comes to, to lending and then when it's a, a more of a uh, in-person conversation? Like what are the kind of key concern areas and what, what do you tend to uh, advise on, uh, advise on and, and I'm just curious and interested in, in the types of conversations you are having. Yeah, I'll say two things to that and then Hilia can expand on it. But that, that's funny. So it was, it was different when we launched in New Zealand. So I said we're nine years old in Australia, two and a half years old here. So when we launched in New Zealand, we leverage, we leverage head office and, and the agents and, and their process over there. Um, and the key difference between Australia and New Zealand is the New Zealand customers wanted to have a chat. So the calls were longer. So the, the, you know, they couldn't get through as many deals because they wanted to have a chat and they wanted to talk about, and, and we, we want to build that rapport. So I said earlier, people love people and that's how we work. Um, so they want to talk about the rugby and, you know, so all of our Australians had to upskill <laughs> on rugby <laughs> to be able to contribute to that conversation. Um, so that's, that's key, I think. It's just building that relationship and building a rapport, so a personal, personal part of it. And then when it comes to lending, we really focus on, so as I said, our average loan size is 35, it's actually higher coming out of COVID. So we're probably in the 50,000. Um, but we really focus on the customer's needs. What do they need the funds for? So it's that use of funds and to the, the ability to repay. So we, we, we go through the monthly repayments. We look at their cash flow. We actually know what they can repay. And that's what we focus on. So they can afford to repay that amount. This is what they want the funds for. And then what are they going to do with it? And as I said, we do it very quickly. So then we work with the customer and we work with them. They get a dedicated account manager and it's the same person through the life of the loan. Um, and then they have that person that will work with them on their repayments, on their future, what else they're doing. So that's really the conversation that we're having. Got anything else to add to that, Hilary? Um, uh, a couple of things really, just that, you know, every business owner, their business is their baby, you know, it's their baby and it's their passion. So really when they're talking about their business, um, they're just, giving us every facet of, of what it is that drives them, I suppose, and what they're coming to us for. And um, sometimes they they feel, um, you know, you, you hear them and they, they just, they, sometimes they feel bad because they're in this position, but, you know, I don't know. They're, they're just amazing. They just talk about their business and they really um, want us to understand what they're coming to us for. Um, and, and yeah, it's, the conversations are amazing. Um, and, and also on the other side, I, I mean, I'll say this, but it's, it's a bit cheeky. So we just got, a, we get the customer feedback after they've come in to um, do an application and, and they've settled and the feedback's phenomenal. So anyone can go and check it out on Trustpilot New Zealand Prosper. Um, and it's, you know, it's huge, the amount of customers that come back and give us feedback. So one that we got today was... Um, uh, this, this is the exact words. Prosper had no obligation to help us, uh, but their willingness to help was truly appreciated. Fantastic service. I work for a large bank, often within their business banking division, and we could learn from your customer service model. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I mean, but that, that's just one. So if we think about even Adrian and I, we were kind of, we're kind of dealing with a, an outside outside group trying to email and, and just the response back is slow. I mean, pick up the phone and try and ring your communications provider. Communications provide, oh, I shouldn't go, but you know, they're kind of the customer service and the communication is poor. So people are used to that, I think. We were talking about how people are used to that type of service in different places, but which is why they're so blown away when they come to us and, and actually get the help they need and, and easily and quickly. And I think it talks to Adrian going back to our founders um, as well as quick, fast access to funds, part of, part of their thing was about making it actually a great experience for the business owners as well because, um, yeah, you'd be hard-pressed to find um, good service as a business owner, I think. Yeah, no, that's, that's um, uh, a very, very important point. And it's, again, great to hear the, the direct feedback from the customers. And I think this is what uh, we... We tend to miss, and I've certainly learned from this conversation that you're doing so much to, to be at the forefront in terms of the, the customer experience. You're not just an online lender, you're, you're supporting through other channels as well. And I think that, that holistic kind of channel engagement is, is really, really important. important. And 
obviously relates back to the, the point about you getting a lot of return customers as well and, and your scores on Trustpilot, they're sort of indicative of that as well. So yeah, really, really interesting and, and great to hear. I'm going to change tack with one of our final questions now. Um, the, the summit here today, there's lots of conversation about sustainability and I think you know, me being based in Singapore and in Asia, I've seen this with some of the, the banks in the region and financial services providers. There's lots of focus on sustainability at the moment, green financing, you know, what sort of uh, carbon footprint do the businesses have? Lots of, there's lots of talk about it, but, you know, in terms of action as well, we're starting to see that happening as well. So I wanted to get your perspective around sustainability in financial services and more generally and, and what you're doing at the moment or how you think about that topic area as Prosper. Taking that one, how are you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we, we looked at it and um, we thought we'd just bring it back to a, as simple as always um, with regard to our customers. So even looking at our actual process, so we pick up the phone, we call our customer, we talk to them over the phone, everything's recorded, so that's, that's all online. Uh, we send them a link and we get their business bank, um, you know, bank statement information, so that comes through. Uh, we submit that to the credit decision engine, we get the offer, and then we'll call the customer and if they're happy to go ahead um, with the application or with, with the offer that we've provided, we then email out the documents um, so that they can sign up on their computer or their phone. So in terms of being green and paperless, um, that extends in our business. So everything's online. Uh, we provide our partners with dashboards and things like that and, and marketing tools all online, um, all paperless and also um, our customer experience is also quite paperless. So uh, in terms of that carbon footprint, ours would be very, very low as a business um, internally and also for our customers. So we, we struggle to answer it really. I mean, we, we <laughs> lead to small businesses, which are 97% being the backbone of the New Zealand economy. Um, but then we're like, we don't, we don't do big corporates. So like we don't lend to petrol companies and... <laughs> other big corporates we lend to small businesses and we're completely digital and completely um you know it's seamless as we said the carbon footprint is very low um it's all done it's all done digitally yeah that's that's very um i mean it's really good to see that um you know fundamentally your business model is is geared towards sustainability and it, um, I recall this uh, this point about um, we, we did this study of customers in um, in the Asian markets and it was for one of the, the, the major banks and they were, they're very focused on sustainability and, and really promoted externally. But then one of their customers was talking about the fact that if you go online and you need to get physical statements, they send you like a 40-page printout with <laughs> mostly blank pages. So a bank that's talking about, I won't name which bank this is, obviously, <laughs> a bank that's talking about sustainability, but then their back end doesn't reflect that. So it's, it's really good to, to kind of hear you talk about that, that end to end, the way you do your business every day being focused on digital. And that's, I think that's critical towards uh, what we mean by sustainability. Yeah, that's right. And no, no trees are killed here. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we're... Uh, we're just about around time for this conversation. Look, it's been fantastic. I've learned a lot from this conversation. It's really exciting to, to hear about what Prosper is doing. I wish you all the best of success and, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and we're very excited about the future. Excellent. Well, that was another great session covering off some of the most important things for, uh, for business customers. Um, and hoping that they, given that they employ a, a large amount of uh, Kiwis, um, hoping they can recover and start prospering um, in, I guess, a, a post-COVID world, uh, aided by some great financial services. So for the last session of the day, uh, we're having a, another fireside chat uh, on financial literacy and education in Asia Pacific, uh, moderated by Anna Shaw, and Anna's Head of Client Insights for RFI Group. Uh, joined by two special guests, Dr. Pushpa Wood, uh, who is Director of Financial Education and uh, the Research Centre there as well at Massey University in New Zealand. And then we have uh, Audrey Tan, who's a Dreams Architect and Co-Founder at Play Moolah. Uh, and straight after that, we'll have our closing international keynote on, uh, I guess, looking again at a different perspective on how the future is green 
uh, and looking at sustainability uh, from a great speaker, Megan Tenety uh, from NASDAQ, and she is the senior lead ESG advisor there. So looking forward to these last two sessions, and I'll see you at the end. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us for today's panel discussion on financial literacy and capability and education in the Asia Pacific region. So my name's Anna Shaw and I'll be moderating this panel discussion today and I'm Head of Client Insights for RFI Group and with me on this panel uh, we've actually got representation from Singapore and New Zealand which I think is going to make a really great global perspective um, but with me I have Dr Pushpa Wood who is the Director at the Financial Education and Research Centre at Massey University in New Zealand and Audrey Jo Tan who is the co-founder and Chief Dreams Architect of Play Mauler, which is based in Singapore. So Pushpa I might start with you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work and what you do. Oh. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa and namaste. Um, greetings from what we call the land of white clouds, New Zealand. Um, the New Zealand Finet Centre is, is quite unique in itself. It's, it's one of the, if not the only centre where you see all inclusive financial capability work. So we have research evaluation consultancy, uh, as well as we do uh, online and face-to-face -face teaching and training. And then we do uh, resource development in a collaboration with various organizations as and when the need arises. So we've done considerable amount of work, for example, developing resource for people with learning disabilities. Uh, developing resources for youth at risk, um, to just name name the few. Uh, recently, actually last week, we've launched our first ever microcredit uh, for specifically targeting workforce engaged in financial capability, whether delivering or or whether supporting. It's Pushpa and Audrey. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Pushpa and Anna. I'm Audrey Joy, and um, our vision at Play Moolah is really building positive financial emotional resilience for a flourishing life. And so with the mission of the organization, we enable children, parents, families, uh, young people who are entering the workforce, um, as well as working with uh, corporates to bring this uh, vision of a flourishing life. And that when we learn about money, um, it's in the context of finding out something that makes sense for the family, that lives and decision making within families and within society can be purposeful and meaningful. And um, so for us as organization, we've worked with uh, educators, with educational institutions, as well as, as financial institutions. And we work directly with uh, families and community organizations as well. So very thrilled to be here today to learn from all of you. Thanks, Audrey. And I think both Pushpa and Audrey have really interesting, are doing really interesting things both in Singapore and New Zealand. And I think uh, I'm really hoping that there's gonna be quite a, a different perspective and different conversation um, compared to some of the other sessions that we'll have as part of the conference today. So it's a topic I'm particularly excited about as well, financial literacy, financial inclusion. And I think to start off the conversation today, we were speaking a little bit offline about the difference between financial literacy and financial capability. And Pushpa, this was an area you mentioned that in New Zealand, the, the terminology is less so financial literacy. And, and these days it's more so around financial capability. Are you able to talk us through uh, the differences there a little bit and the strategy behind financial capability being that focus? Um, I'll give you a layperson's view <laughs> in terms of literacy and capability. Yes, that's true. In New Zealand, we are now more and more using the term financial capability uh, and also venturing into the term financial well-being. Now, to me, financial well-being is the outcome of financial literacy and financial capability. Right? So if, if you have got financial literacy and capability, you are likely to move towards financial well-being. That's my my vision and my understanding. Uh, the way I differentiate between literacy and capability is that literacy provides you knowledge. It provides you skill set. Uh, so it's a it's a collection of skill set for any particular subject area that you actually are looking at. So in this case, it's the skill set that is that helps you to make financial decisions, uh, whether they are your financial decisions related to your work or whether 
their financial decisions related to your personal life. Capability goes deeper than that. Capability provides you with the sense of confidence and the sense of purpose and ability to actually make those decisions that are not only going to impact on your life now, but also in the long term, right? And leading to that financial well-being, that sense of security that you need. It also takes into account your background, your psychological uh, factors that play, your cultural um, background that plays uh, a role in how you make financial decisions. So it takes your uh, takes you deeper than just understanding managing your finances is why you make certain decisions and how you make certain decisions and how can you change your behavior towards money your attitude towards money that's in a nutshell <laughs> no that's a great summary and I think I mean it'd be good to know Audrey in Singapore is is it financial literacy that you're focusing on or is it also similar where it's more of a will a well-being and capability uh, focus yeah, so our work has really culminated in what we call financial emotional resilience. And we define it really as the ability to change, adapt, and to modify your emotions, as well as your daily practices and actions in the context of your financial decisions. The reason why we've come to this um, space is re recognizing and realizing that with money, our emotions play such a big component. And actually, you know, very similar with financial capability, financial emotional resilience is an outcome. So having then learned the skills of emotional regulation of mindful decision-making, um, we also have a pathway that we take the learner through the process. We realize that um, at the very heart of it, the, the context is that we're teaching the person and not so much teaching the subject. And so when we put the person at the center of the education and the learning, then it's about figuring out, okay, what is this young person feeling when it comes to money? What are the emotions that are associated with it? And how do we actually regulate, moderate, and alter that in the context of decision-making? So for us, when we look at you know, financial well-being, we see it very holistically. Um, also with another dimension in permaculture that we've learned called the eight forms of capital. So it's not just financial, intellectual, social capital, but we're looking at also experiential capital which is the wisdom you've gained through life, right? Um, cultural capital, spiritual capital, living capital. And when we see it holistically as well, and even your emotional capital, you begin to rethink money in this context that financial, social, intellectual is not the, the end all and be all of the measure of wealth and success. So it's to reframe, you know, how our financial emotional resilience can help us to go one step further in the flourishing life that we define for ourselves. I think it's important to, to remember that we cannot really teach people about money in isolation. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the one of the biggest challenge we have been having in past is that we've been teaching money in isolation as a separate subject. Uh, in, in literacy term, we call it, we, we have been using bolted on approach rather than built in approach. And, and, and to me, the built in approach from all different parameters of your life is, is really, really important. And we, we still, internationally, we still do not know enough about the impact of culture on people's financial decision making. And that's a piece of work separately we've been doing for the last three, four years, trying to understand the impact of culture um, on that. I think that's such an important distinction as well when thinking about the fact that financial resilience and capability and how you think about money doesn't occur in isolation. There's all these other factors that actually play a part. And I like this idea, Audrey, that if you can keep people at the center and then you're thinking about what do people specifically need rather than here is the strategy, let's apply it and see what happens because everyone is so different. And you mentioned young people as well being quite important as a focus. And I think something that is you know, money, the, if, even the way you think about it, there's that culture um, point that you make push, but as well as the fact that, you know, what are you being taught by parents or in school or how do you feel about money? Why is that? And it's such a complex area that doesn't really have a one size fits all solution. Never has been. Uh, and I don't think it ever will be. 
yeah exactly it would continue to change we continue to exactly exactly yeah. every individual even through the and that's why the some of the countries use life stage approach uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to money so, so so your needs change according to the what stage of life you're in so it's, it's quite a complex area when you talk about money the, the influencing factors are hitting you from all around Absolutely. Yeah. And the life stage, as you mentioned, is also quite key because what you're thinking about in terms of money when you're maybe 20 to 30 is one thing, but when you start having kids or you're thinking about aging parents or whatever it might be, suddenly there's all these different needs and uh, different perspectives as well. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what capability provides you, the ability to actually measure your needs as you move forward. Yeah, I really like that idea. I think it'd be good to understand a little bit more about the work you are both doing um, in your respective markets and how you're really targeting and addressing financial capability. Uh, Pushbar, I might start with you on, on that topic. For, for uh, the Finite Centre, majority of our work has been with different sectors as and when the need needs have arisen. Um, for example, few, about five, six years ago, we were approached by um, at-risk youth uh, groups, the youth services, and they said, we do, we, we are supposed to provide them budgeting advice, that was the term was used, but it is, um, we are externally sourcing it because we do not have the ability uh, or, or capability to actually teach them in-house. So could you, would you be able to prepare some resources for us and train us? And uh, uh, like as Audrey said, for, for me, it wasn't important who was going to teach them, how they were going to teach them, what was more important important for me to understand was what is it that the young people that's supposed to be our target audience, what do they actually want to know? Uh, what are their needs and how would they like to learn best? Uh, and, and what will be their ideal um, situation? And based on some of those focus groups, we then developed a, a tailored resource uh, for them. So we do, some of the work we do is we, we work with other organizations, we try and understand their needs and then work with them rather than work for them. So most of the resources we've developed are all jointly shared. Uh, so they use with, with their groups and whenever we need to use it, we use with our groups. So we've developed specific resources for, for Maori audience, for example. Um, We've done some overseas consultancy work, same thing as working with the organization, developed resources, trained them, and then walk out because then it is their responsibility. So we always go in, in any consultancy work, we go in with the exit strategy, um, yeah, always. Um, the other work we're doing and which last few years has become my focus personally, is to actually lift the standard of people who are delivering financial capability or who are supporting financial capability. So whether they're budget advisors or financial advisors or, or, or whatever sector of financial capability they're coming from. Uh, as a result, we developed the, national, uh, the competency framework uh, and now we are in the process of developing a self-assessment tool. So mm -hmm. anybody who is in the financial capability sector or want to enter the financial capability sector, they will be able to assist themselves to say, where are they sitting on that capability framework and therefore develop their own pathway to, to, to move forward in the, in the, in the workforce, uh, but also creating a pathway of progression for them. Because one of the challenge we found in our budgeting services, majority of our financial or budget advisors are 50 plus, um, retired some of them. Um, majority were, it's changing now, but were European middle class. Uh, but their target audience was Maori, Pacifica, refugees, mm -hmm. migrants, uh, wow. ethnic communities. So it was quite an interesting kind of a mismatch in, in, mm -hmm. in some ways. So we were looking at what are the, and I've been sort of puzzling over it, what can we do to A, attract young people and B, to retain them? Because young people have a high mobility in, the, in their career path. And hence, we've now developed the, the what we call the work, workforce development plan 
and that's what at the moment I've been working with in collaboration with FinCap and our Ministry of Social Development. So to, to attract young people, we need to actually create a learning pathway for them, but also a working pathway for them as well. So that's another exciting piece of work we are doing right as we, as we speak. Yeah, I'll sounds... stop here and I can always come back in if there's anything else particularly. I think, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to talk more about what you're doing in this space. But I think this focus on young people is, is really interesting and really targeted. And I think, Audrey, this probably relates a little bit with your work as well, because I know you do have a focus on young people and you're currently in a very busy week at the moment, even doing a, um, a, a run of programs as well. So could you talk us through a little bit about your strategy and the focus as well? Yeah, thank you. And yeah, Dr. Pushpa, you spoke about so many things that, you know, has really littered up light bulbs in my mind. And the first is um, in relation to young people, we actually have as a, as a group of educators develop a pathway for young people. Um, we take them through a four stage process, um, the pathway of a flourishing life. Um, the first is inspiring true stories. So um, getting a younger person to hear the stories of the community and people within the space. The second is narrative. So looking at our Mola narratives, right? What are the narratives and the stories we've grown up with with money? And I think Dr. Bushra mentioned this very accurately about the cultural influences and going very specifically into this area, one of the things that we've done in our programs is really getting young people to uncover the narratives, the stories that they've been told by their family, their grandparents, their ancestors, you know, the people that have gone before them. And sometimes, you know, when it comes to narratives, we see the lack of role modeling or role modeling within our families where we see families fighting about money and that's the imprint that we have in our minds and so we get young people actually to go through their process of uncovering the old narratives to rewrite some of these scripts to have more enabling uh, beliefs as opposed to having like say limiting beliefs and then we go through the process of what we call Mula goals so this is where the technical aspects of money come in right budgeting habits of mind learning about moderation learning about how to invest as well and then finally with Mula wealth being this is a new program that we've also launched with young people in that we see if a young person needs to go through specific therapy or counseling based on the money traumas that they've had before, or even in their own family context, this is where a young person has the full pathway and the opportunity to go through that if they so decide to. So in a sense, we see that, you know, this pathway gives a young person opportunities to come in at different times. And what we've done also is that we've really co-created this with young people, listening very closely on the ground, because I think one of the biggest gaps we find here in Singapore in this time is really what we call like money anxiety. And I think in 2019, there was a study that was done by BlackRock. Here in Singapore, they cited that more than 53% of Singaporeans saw money as a big source of stress and more so even for the millennial generation. And so with this stress with money and you know, emotional regulation and even like anxiety around money, we realized that there is a lot of work that needs to be done there to address some of these gaps. I think the situation about money anxiety is very similar in, in New Zealand as well, and I suspect would be similar in Australia too. Um, I think the other challenge uh, we have, those of us who are in, in, in the financial capability area, is the invisibility of money. Uh, and that has been a biggest challenge when it comes to dealing with school as children. There are children now in the school and primary schools who have not seen beyond $10 note in, in New Zealand, for example. Um, their their, their uh, perception of money is a plastic card and a machine. Um, those are the two links that they, they have. So their attachment to money is very different to my generation uh, or even uh, your generation. So, they, so we're talking about at the moment three generations in circulation uh, mm -hmm. in, in the world who are actually perceiving money in three different ways and have a relationship with money in a three different ways. Um, and hence what our attempt has been at, at, at the Finite Centre is 
trying to equip and prepare the workforce that is working with these young people is how will they actually work with this young generation coming up? Because there is nothing worse than a 50 year old trying to tell a 10 year old how to manage their money. The, the, the association is not there. And yet we do find that majority of the workforce that is teaching about money is not necessarily young. Mm -hmm. And hence mm -hmm. our focus on trying to attract the young workforce by providing them that development framework would be really quite, quite a useful tool. We do have a very good and well-structured schools program in schools, which is our uh, Commission for Financial Capability actually uh, has been working really hard for the last four, few years. But the jury is still out at the moment because it is still new. We still do not know. Long, it hasn't been long enough to know whether it is making the impact where it needs to be. Mm. All right. I mean, the reality is when you offer any program, there will be hardly, the program has to be absolutely, absolutely pathetic for somebody to not learn something. Right? So they will learn something, but whether that something is the one that they needed to learn, wanted to learn, and is going to be useful for them in their future is the key thing. A really interesting point as well about where the message is coming from and who's doing the teaching because you're right if it's if it's a 10 year old especially you know their experience of money is extremely different to someone who's 50 because even the way they were paying for things or their parents are paying for things or the way that the family household budgeted money would be very different and exactly. I guess the hard thing would be getting young people into the into those positions to actually be teaching who are a little bit more aligned with the, the younger generations who can actually sort of better understand how to tailor that messaging uh, for a really young child compared to someone who's 30 or 50 or, you know, older than that. Exactly. And I think hence lies the, the challenge. If I have my wish, I would actually set up bunny clubs in every primary and every secondary school. Uh, and I will actually start to really work through with these young people to become champions in their own right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's very, very um, pertinent as well, because we found that um, what has worked for us in Singapore with Play Mula is actually working with the Entrepreneurship and Investing Club the junior colleges and in the schools and we realized that the resonance of these young people have a sense of like agency you know they're into entrepreneurship and into financial education and investing so we had an opportunity to work with a group of students as well and their vision was to go in to teach their own peers and I think that's exactly the model that we're seeing yeah yeah that's true must be really exciting seeing all that come together as well and just seeing people who are excited about the prospect of teaching and learning and investing and finding new ways of managing their money as well. I think we also, other thing we need to do is to, uh, that's my, in my view, in, in observation of number of years is we really need to change our discourse as well. We need to mm -hmm. change our language um, because with young people, we, if, if we can avoid the terminology teaching and start using term sharing experiences uh, is, is more uh, palatable uh, rather than, than I'm going to teach you something about, about money. Uh, the second thing is the term retirement turns young people off. <laughs> I mean, the young people's horizon is very small, you know, 10, 15, even 18 year old doesn't really want you to tell them all about, you know, what's waiting ahead and at the age of 65. What they do want to know is how can I take charge of my life? right at every stage how can i take charge of my life when i get out of high school how can i take charge of my life when i'm in employment how can i take charge of my life at different stages and if that's the kind of discussion we start to have and within that then of course the retirement comes and emergency saving comes and all sorts of topics come in there but it's just trying to find that right language which is understandable by people rather than being sort of caught up with the with the jargon that is being used internationally. I really like that idea about um, 
taking charge. And I think that sort of resonates as well with what you were saying about financial capability rather than literacy, because financial literacy is one thing, you know, you understand to an extent, you know, your financial products or how you can manage money, but being capable and having the capability to actually be, you know, empowered in your decision making and actually be thinking about the future. Because I think particularly in Australia, we have superannuation, which is compulsory, yet we see young people really don't appreciate it. They don't like it. There was opportunity last year with the pandemic to actually withdraw up to 10,000 from your super, uh, superannuation. And so many people did it and they did things like paying off debts, but some people even withdrew money for gambling. You know, it was just this disconnect between the impact of withdrawing that money because it's too hard to see yourself at 60 or 65 or 70. And I think that disconnect is something that really needs to be addressed here as well. And I imagine that's similar in other markets as well, where while it may be people don't enjoy thinking about the future, there's a lot of benefit to actually just thinking, how can I set myself up for the future? And how can I take charge? Like you said, push by, I like that idea of taking charge. Yeah, that's why one of the courses we developed a couple of years ago, an online short course for all our first year students, when they enter university, it sits on their um, registration, you know, their enrollment page, and it's making your money work for you. All right, and that's the title of the of the course. Uh, and that sits there whole year for them to, to move in and out of of that. But the other interesting thing we've noticed through our longitudinal study, which we started in 2012, that till now it still remains, parents still remain the first port of call for young people for financial advice. So, right, any money related issues, they go to parents first. Yet we are not putting internationally and collectively, we're not putting enough effort in actually educating or making parents a financially capable themselves and b how they can then pass on that information to their children because i very strongly believe that any education including about money begins first at home it starts at the dining table it gets reconfirmed in school and it gets reconfirmed again in your tertiary environment gets reconfirmed and added in. So as you move through your stages, you keep picking up new things. And Audrey, does that tie in with your work a little bit, thinking about the role of parents in educating kids, but also in teaching kids as well? Very much. Um, and see, that, that was really one of the big reasons for starting Play Mula almost a, a decade ago recognizing as young people at that time entering the workforce that we were not taught a lot about money. Mm. That was the key thing, right? And we were, we were stuck in the middle of the global financial crisis with all these jargons about debt and the GFC, etc. And realizing that, yeah, actually, even when I went through school, I didn't learn very much. Actually, I probably didn't learn anything about money. And, you know, I went in with a thesis thinking that we were educating children and young people, but very quickly realizing through our work that Actually, the heart of it is educating, passing on the knowledge and the learnings to, to parents. And there's a saying, right? You can't give what you don't have. And oftentimes, a lot of our previous generation, they themselves haven't learned about money. So in my own context, my parents taught me to save. And in Singapore, we save and we have like multiple saving accounts, right? But that, it stops there. It doesn't go to like, you know, in-depth budgeting, it doesn't go into investing. So as a young person, I realized that there was a lot of agency and self-directed learning that needed to happen. And then realizing that actually many of us young people actually had went through the same thing, that our parents didn't have necessarily the skills or the role modeling for that matter to, to show us these good like role modeling around money. So a big part of our work today is really also about learning together with the parents. And a lot of times, you know, we have parents who come with us through the webinars, the talks, and we try to think of the interventions that we are developing from a family standpoint. So if we're educating the children and, you know, the youth, we're thinking, okay, what would be then meaningful to trigger money conversations among parents and children as well? So I think, I think you know, there's a lot 
in there that needs to be done. And I really like what Dr. Pushpa is saying also about, you know, capability for the educators. I think that's also a very big part that we're seeing because in Singapore as well. So it's, I, I think the model that we have in the work that we're doing, you know, collectively, realizing also that, you know, as a, as a person who's training parents, for instance, some of the parents are educators too in the schools teaching younger children, right? So the role of an educator is also a parent, right? Or like a grandparent taking on different roles in, in the world, in society. And so I realized that there's also a very cyclical approach in this work that we're doing. That actually we're teaching the same person, but just perhaps in different roles. Different roles. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. In some of my pro bono community work I do, I run the workshops, one of the most popular one is, how do I say no to my teenager without feeling guilty? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I have a lot of fun when I work with parents of, of teenagers, you know. Um, the other piece of work mm -hmm. I always enjoy is, is writing about, you know, how to teach your children about money. So zero to five, six to 10, all of those kind of things. So it's, and it, when, when it comes down to, if you take away all of the layers, at bottom line is a common sense. In, in, in that common sense, I still remember in childhood being taught, if you don't have it, you can't spend it. That was just one simple rule. The second mm. rule I was taught by, by my grandparents, if you have one piece of bread, make sure you put half away for tomorrow, unless you're 100% mm. sure there will be another piece tomorrow. So if you're uncertain, you must save that. So most Asian countries, they are, are very, I guess they teach their children about saving for tomorrow, but not necessarily budgeting skills, not necessarily investing. Um, it's becoming popular. And investing seems to be, you know, once you once you have your own money, once you start to earn your own money, that's where investing comes into, into four. But now I notice in country like India, for example, I go there every year, there's a heavy focus on, on, on investing and children in schools are learning about investments. Um, so the, the, the things are changing uh, gradually, but whether they're changing for better or for worse, we don't know yet. <laughs> Something we've spoken about was the, the gaps in financial literacy. And we've mentioned that there's a real need to be educating parents. And I think something else that relates to this that I'd be interested to learn a bit more from both of you about is RFI group data does show that women are less likely than men to be indicating high levels of understanding when it comes to banking and finances. So thinking about this, when we're talking about financial literacy or capability might be the better way of wording it. What do you both think can be done to actually improve that financial capability for women in sort of all of our markets? Uh, Pushpa, I might start with you. <laughs> I was hoping you'll start with Audrey this time. Um, women, I think there are two issues there. One is women are known to underestimate their knowledge and their ability, in, not only in financial um, field, but in almost every field. Right. Whereas men are known to overestimate, uh, and that that comes with sense of confidence, right? So, so at the heart of it is lack of confidence among women about their own ability to manage money. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's 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 my understanding. Uh, and yes, because of that reason, there is a gap. There are some cultural factors that also play the role. If you haven't been ever given an opportunity in your life to manage money, you naturally you're going to learn less about money. If you're not in dealing with the financial products and services on day-to-day -day basis, your knowledge base will be will be lower. Uh, so yes, women do um, lack. Uh, and statistically, uh, in reality, it may be slightly different. Uh, but to me, the key thing that needs to happen when it comes to women is A, is to try and understand what are their fears uh, and what are their hesitations and what are the barriers that are actually preventing them from taking an active part in saving and investing. Um, and we have a number of um, those kind of programs here 
where uh, the investing for women, for example, is becoming now quite quite a popular topic for running workshops and that. But I think the key thing is, A, we need to understand the barriers, and B, then we need to remove those barriers, and C, we need to put some programs in place that are in consultation with women, not for women, right? Because mm -hmm. majority of the understanding at the moment, the programs are developed for women by investors, right? Or by bankers or yeah. by regulators, right? Um, and it would be really quite nice to turn it around and, and let women actually start to work and decide what they want to learn, how they want to learn, where they want to learn, and then bring in the experts to actually get to do a going over, I would say, the quality assurance role. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And Dr. Pushpa is spot on when it comes to getting our users to co-design the intervention or the outcome. And we've seen that a lot in our work as well. And I mean, talking a little bit about one of the factors that we found, it really goes back also to the history of money and then money narratives that women grow up with. Oftentimes in our work, what we've seen with women also is that they haven't had very strong role modeling and money had always been a source of big conflict within the family. And so there is a tendency to avoid. And once you avoid looking at your bank account, having the money conversation, leaving it to the husband to do it instead, we realize that's where that sense of dissonance happen emotionally, mentally, and even physically when it comes to a woman's relationship with money. And so as we were, we were um, thinking about this and doing this work, um, I was speaking with my teammate and uh, Jerry, who is an educator on our team, you know, she said something really beautiful. She said that perhaps what's needed is also to find ways in which we can use language that we as women understand and that we as women have and women are compassionate and we care about the sustainability of the community the environment and businesses and oftentimes we're looking at sustainable businesses that actually impact the community the family the children you know the wider community as well so I feel also that there is a great opportunity to take a community approach because I think what we found in our work also is that um when we bring women in to start investing together as a community and have those community conversations in a safe space, we realize that women actually start investing. And we've seen that with some of the work that we've done as well. And building the confidence through small steps, you know, like daily small practices. So Asian countries, and especially in Southeast Asia, there are some fantastic examples of how small communities and small women's group actually save and invest in their own ways. And in Western world, when we develop uh, the program even for women, our focus is women in the workforce um, mm. on, on a good income, right? Mm. Have, have, the, have the resources to actually save. Uh, we forget that there is a high percentage of women who are not necessarily in employment, but mm -hmm. are dealing with money, are managing money on day-to-day -day basis. And therefore, uh, the programs need to have that balance between the two. Uh, and that I find it is still not there yet. Um, I mean, the, the work has been going on, but it is, it's, it's not there yet. Uh, and that's where the biggest uh, worry I have is when we are developing for, um, we identified the gap, women are not investing, let's develop a program for women uh, and teach them all about investment, the rules and regulations of investment and take away their risk, fear, uh, right? It's, it's, so, so the focus is on that area rather than being seeing where are they actually coming from? what is their own understanding of investment mm. and investment does not necessarily mean money mm. right and in, in, in the bank account investment for one family can mean all the resources pulled together and the sole uh, young person the son or the daughter has to go through the higher education so all the resources pulled together to send that person that child to achieve the best possible outcomes and that is the biggest investment for them mm -hmm. right same as in pacific community it's not it's not the cash that is seen as investment so we need to understand how different cultures actually perceive money uh, not 
not the Western lenses of yeah, money. Absolutely. Definitely. And I think, as you mentioned, that the really key, I think something that's really important as part of this is actually consulting with the groups that it's impacted. So speaking to um, different different communities and women and migrants and people with different cultures to understand you know where are they learning about money who do they speak to about money how does culture play a role is it a sharing culture is it a individual culture how does that all work and and how can that also maybe be a barrier or how can it be something that can actually just be worked with to get the the outcome that we're looking for but I think it's definitely something as you mentioned push for it's not going to get easier because times change people change the generations will change the way we use money changes as well so I think that's it's going to be a continuous uh, process but I think the work you're both doing also is really helping in this space and I think there's collectively so much knowledge even just with you two here today and then if you imagine other organizations as well I think it's it's really exciting thinking about the future and I think that ties in with my my final question for for this session which is really looking at what are the goals that you have for the next 12 months or even longer term to really help with financial capability in your markets um, Audrey I might start with you on this one sure so for us, um, the three key segments that we are very um, kind of devoted also, the first is uh, working with families. So this work actually continues because we're working already today with a lot of educational institutions, but to supplement the learning above and beyond what happens in the school, we're working very closely with kids and parents. So our goal is really to work in a in the sense of designing more interventions such that the families can actually come together. So that's the first. The second for us is in terms of the goals um, in reaching out to young people, we envisage also working out very closely with uh, corporates and organizations that actually have graduating students as well as the young jobbers to prepare them actually for the next stage in their life. So these are the two key things. And I think thirdly as well, we're also seeing that as part of a flourishing life, um, there's also the opportunities for a flourishing company. So the vision that I've seen is, you know, if you have flourishing individuals, flourishing families that goes into flourishing organizations, that's where we have a system that we've developed in place to essentially manage the emotional regulations and the stresses around money to increase productivity and to reduce the money anxieties in the workplace. So that's something that we're also seeing as part of our vision of a flourishing life um, to do more of in the next 12 months. Thanks so much. And Pushpa? Um, well, our vision, uh, and especially my personal vision, is that every child, when they leave their high school, they know what money is, what it is used for, how it is used, and how best they can take charge of that money. Um, I would love to see literacy, numeracy, and financial literacy as the basic human right. Every child has a right to know that. Um, going beyond that, then, then my vision is that everybody who wants to learn about money has access to resources that are accessible to them culturally, socially, educationally, in every form and shape. Uh, they are taught by professional people who know what they're talking about. Um, and above all, they have the ability and access to information and knowledge that is going to help them to take charge of their life at every stage. So it's a big vision, but it will happen. Absolutely, especially with amazing women like both of you in charge and help and you providing these and educating so many families and individuals. I think it's a really exciting space and I know I'll be keeping an eye on both of the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I know this would have been really interesting and a little bit different um, for our listeners and for anyone who's watching this session today. So I can't thank you both enough. Thank you very much. Thank it you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fushpa. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Anna. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Kennedy. I am a lead advisor on NASDAQ's ESG advisory team. I'd like to thank the team at New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit for inviting me to speak today about all things ESG. In our conversation today, we're really going to focus around why ESG, why now? The impact that COVID-19 has had on both the environmental and social pillars of ESG, and ultimately how ESG impacts overall corporate performance over time and how companies can really harness the power of ESG to create value over time. So before we really begin, I think it's important for us to work together to define what we think about ESG. Now, E stands for environmental, S for social, and G for governance, and it means different things for different companies. And so while in our estimation, there's over 130 different ESG-related topics, every company needs to think about ESG in its own unique way and think about the levers of impact it from both the environmental, social, and governance perspective. And so what that means is if you are a large industrials company, clearly carbon emissions, waste and pollution are really material for your business. If you're more related to services, human capital, diversity, equity, and inclusion really have a material impact on your business. And some of the emerging issues around uh, governance are starting to become important regardless of what sector that you're functioning in. And namely, we're thinking about executive compensation and tying executive compensation to ESG objectives. Another emerging topic around ESG is really around board diversity, and it's not just racial or ethnic diversity or gender diversity. We're talking about a diversity of thought of leaders who can really take your company from where you are today to where you need to be in the future. Now, I'm American, as you can tell from my accent, and so we're seeing all these different global changes happening uh, within ESG, and in particular in the United States over the last six months to a year, we've seen large shifts in policy and regulations that are pushing a lot of the global ESG investors forward. One is this regulatory disclosure change that's happened within the United States um, that's really focused on human capital management. And while it doesn't seem to be something that impactful or important, what it's really highlighting are regulatory agencies' recognition that ESG and human capital is a material risk to an organization's business. Another overarching sort of policy shift and regulatory shift is actually happening within the EU. Uh, and so the EU's ESG taxon taxonomy, excuse me, is set to uh, come into effect in early 2022. It's really focused around the environmental pillar in particular climate change and how companies are investing in climate transition. And so it's going to be putting a lot of pressure on companies from the investor perspective to not only be able to disclose and articulate what their ESG policies and practices are, but how they're tackling this climate transition that we're all facing um, within the, the, the greater overall ESG universe. And so it's important to think about ESG from both its risks and opportunity factors. And there's quite a few emerging risks that are starting to become important. As you probably know, data privacy and data security has really become a sector agnostic risk, meaning it's a risk, risk to every single business, whether you're from infrastructure, banking, uh, uh, technology, um, data privacy and data security are really going to be some of the preeminent ESG risks in the next, next decade. And as we've seen in just the last few months, there's been a few breaches, um, ransomware attacks. And so every company is really going to have to strategize around how they're tackling the data privacy and data security issue. Climate risk is also emerging as a major ESG topic. And I think climate change is something that companies have been thinking about and talking about for decades. But climate risk is something different. It's not what is your emissions and how are you impacting climate change? It's really how is climate change impacting my business? And so that's anywhere from understanding where your supply chain is and seeing if there's any risks to your supply chain due to climate change or if you have a large real estate footprint, understanding where your buildings are and how exposed they are to climate risks. 
ethical risks and human capital management are also emerging topics. And so ethics isn't just, do you have a code of conduct? It's how do you work within different taxes and systems depending on where you operate? Or how do you interact with government agencies? Do you participate in political lobbying? Human capital management is starting to become one of the preeminent sort of ESG topics and risks to companies' business because if you're unable to retain top talent, you will not be profitable in the long term. And so understanding how companies are managing their human capital is becoming really summarily important within the ESG space. But the other side of a risk is really an opportunity, right? And so many companies are tackling ESG by developing products and services to help in climate transition and using their excellent human capital management practices to position themselves to recruit, recruit and retain top talent going into the future. Now, I work at NASDAQ, and so our perspective is always really climate uh, excuse me, capital markets focused. And so when we're thinking about these huge number of assets that are moving into these ES, the ESG space to the tune of $10 trillion over the last few years, you can understand that companies who are not tackling ESG from a strategic perspective are really leaving money on, uh, on the table. Uh, and they're definitely excluding themselves from being at the table in conversation um, from a global perspective. Now, what's really interesting about ESG is that investors are taking different approaches to engaging with companies around ESG. And so one is actually looking at a uh, what we consider to be inclusion. So it's really looking at a company's management holistically, including their management of ESG factors, and using that as a way to estimate the organization's risk um, under their overall evaluation or valuation process. Another way and a really important way, and we've seen some really interesting moves over the last couple of weeks is actual engagement with management and with boards around ESG topics. And so they are not, uh, investors are not only uh, choosing to invest or divest uh, because of ESG, but they're starting to engage with management in order to move these objectives along. And I think there's no greater example than what happened last week with Exxon, um, uh, where investors really work together to say, we don't like your climate change strategy and we're going to uh, uh, vote against your board members and install new board members um, in order for you guys to start to change your strategy that falls more in line with international and global expectations around climate change. And lastly, a lot of investors are using it as sort of a red flag, green flag. And so companies who are not really doing an excellent job at managing their ESG risks and opportunities are just not going to be invested in. If they're not meeting a sort of minimum threshold of management, they just won't invest in them. And so regardless of what type of investor you may be interacting with, um, they are using ESG uh, as a means of evaluating or engaging with companies in the long term. One of the things that's really, I think, affected all of our lives over the last year has really been COVID-19. And it's impacted businesses in many different ways. From the social pillar, there's a couple really unique pieces that have been highlighted uh, in the ESG space, namely human health and safety, work-life balance, and cybersecurity. Starting to think about human health and safety, I can think about all of our countries, no matter where we're from during lockdown, really started to see the emergence of these essential workers, of, of people who, regardless of what's happening from a lockdown perspective, have to go to work because it allows us all to live and to function. And so whether that's healthcare workers or grocery store workers, human health and safety started to become so important for companies to start to think about and tackle, both from a holistic perspective, but also so in a, sort of in an emergency preparedness perspective. COVID-19 also put a lot of workers back into their homes. And with these sort of di dispersed workforce, many people had to start to take care of their elder family members and or their children at home during the workday. And so companies had to be limber and start to figure out how they can have a work-life balance where they can have a productive workforce, um, but also allow people who work for them to really take care of the things that are most important to them. And this emerging topic that is not going away, and I'll probably talk about a couple of times today, is really cybersecurity. And companies had to pivot really quickly 
to a more dispersed disperse workforce. And so that meant making sure that they had uh, to adapt their systems to be able to safely support their workers outside of the network of their office. Um, and so cyber security has really started to emerge as one of the key risks, especially as we may continue to have and see dis dispersed workforces in the future. Now there's also some very obvious environmental impacts in a positive way of COVID-19. And so lockdowns really decreased travel, both from a corporate travel standpoint, uh, it reduced industrial activities and it really put a lot less pressure on areas whose economy, uh, at least environmental pressure on areas who, whose economy is really focused around tourism. And so we, what we saw is a reduced fossil fuel consumption which means that the global GHG emissions decreased. We saw reduced resource consumption, so pollution decreased, water quality at the same time increased. With some of those reduced industrial activities, once again, we saw this air quality dramatically improving. So you would see sort of pictures and videos of cities that normally have a lot of smog um, sort of open up and have more fresh air. And so we saw um, sort of the impact, uh, the environmental impact in real time of some of these reduced activities. And also the reduced, reduced pressure in particular on some of these tourist rec uh, destinations we started to see some ecological restoration. And I think one of the examples that stood out to me was Venice. Um, and once there were no tourists in Venice that there was more um, fish uh, that came out and sort of returned to their normal ecosystem. And so what it highlighted is not only the importance of environmental uh, management, uh, but that if we as a collective society can tackle climate change and climate transition, think about biodiversity as we build our businesses, that we actually can uh, reverse course on climate change. And so the impetus and the focus really has become well, we can do it. It's not something we can't do. We've done it. We've seen the positive impact. So how do we as a comp as, as um, companies within this global ecosystem really tackle our ESG um, risks and opportunities? So why does this all matter? matter. ESG is not only something that's nice to have or doing good, some of those CSR initiatives um, that I think ESG, people used to think of ESG as. It's a way to build a more sustainable business for the future. It improves brand reputation, right? Um, and so it really builds trust with customers, especially millennial and Gen Z customers who are looking for companies who are, who are responsible both from a social and uh, an environmental standpoint. It increases operational efficiencies and the, really this is around money savings. And so while you may need to invest uh, to transition energy in some way now in the short term, in the long term, you'll find some cost savings. You bolster your license to operate. The global regulatory system is really moving quite rapidly. And so companies, in order to uh, sort of get ahead of what the expectations are going to be into the future, really need to understand and tackle their material ESG topics in order to start to be able to operate within the international ecosystem. Another area that's really important is just for our companies to be able to attract a skilled workforce. Um, there, as this emergence around work-life balance, human health and safety, um, and, and just the importance of making sure that you're taking care of people that work for you, it's really either helping or hurting a company's ability to retain top talent. Um, and especially as our economies move from production-based economies to more service-based economies, uh, the focus really is that one of your main assets is your human capital. And the last thing is something that we were talking about before is not just from the investor perspective, really gaining access to capital, but we're seeing more and more companies getting more favorable loan terms just by having uh, excellent ESG uh, uh, practices and policies. And so what does this all mean? ESG and a company's ability to incorporate ESG into overall work strategy is just a reflection of good management. 
It's a mental move away from short-termism and quarterly earnings and into this idea of long-termism and taking care of our workforce, stewarding our environment so that we can function uh, in the long term. And so I would really like to, to thank everyone for your time today. It's been a real pleasure to share my perspective um, and hope that you took away to, uh, from this conversation today this idea that ESG is not um, some sort of altruistic uh, uh, thing that it's a nice to have for companies. It's really an imperative that companies start to integrate ESG into their overall organizational strategy. So I thank you so much and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Fantastic. Well, that closes off the last session uh, for the New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit for 2021. Um, we've cycled through quite a few um, key issues today, um, getting key updates from some great industry experts, um, some refreshing and um, interesting perspectives on, on topics that probably don't cross our minds that often, I guess, especially in our day-to-day -day roles, um, working at the product or marketing or strategy, it's just great to get a very uh, new and interesting perspective on some of the key things that we need to look out for uh, currently, uh, but also in the future. A big thank you to our sponsors, Encino, Fintech New Zealand and CoreLogic. Uh, they've been a great partner again uh, for our conference. Um, thank you very much to everyone who attended and a big thank you to the events media marketing team of RFI who are sitting here in the room with me. Uh, it's been fun bringing you this conference um, and we look forward to bringing it to you in a physical sense when we can hopefully fly over there and, uh, and see you all again. So. Uh, once again, thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's been great. Um, from Julian Wilson at RFI Group, we, uh, we wish you all the best and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.